Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Houston Methodist Adult Congenital Heart Symposium 2020. My name is Huey Lin. I'm the director of the Adult Congenital Heart Program here at Houston Methodist. And with me is Dr. McGillivray, Chief of Cardiac Surgery and Thoracic Transplant, as well as the Surgical Director of the Adult Congenital Heart Program here. It is truly our pleasure to have you here for our sixth annual symposium. I just have a few things to get us kicked off. Um, the first thing is 90%. So 90% is now the number that we are saying um, that is one of the most important things to know about congenital heart disease. What that number means is that a child born today with congenital heart disease has more than 90% likelihood of surviving to adulthood. And what that means is that we're going to see a lot of adults in the coming year with congenital heart disease. In fact, we're seeing them already. Unfortunately, 90% is also the number that reflects how many adult congenital heart patients are not getting subspecialty care in adult congenital heart disease. And so that's why we are here today, and that's why you're here with us. Community. Today, we're wrapping up the end of the Houston Methodist Congenital Heart Awareness Week. Yesterday, we had a phenomenal conversation with three of the many, many members who support the congenital heart disease community. What that means is that we need not just the help of the medical community, but all the people who surround our patients to really take care of these people. Why? Well, it turns out that if you think about 1% of the population being born with congenital heart disease and more than 90% of them surviving to adulthood, that means every single one of us knows someone. They are our coworkers, they are our friends, and in fact, some of them are family members and we may not actually even know about that. And so what that means is when we have people like our team from yesterday who give selflessly in their free time to help to take care of patients with congenital heart disease and help them at every single level, that's what we want to do as well. And that's what we want to help get everybody together to do and to be part of this community. Because the reality is that these patients and these family members need to be treated just like our family because the reality is they probably are our family. And so the key to this is awareness. This program, as well as many other programs that are out there, are here to help us to communicate to the public the importance of this disease and the huge number of patients who need to be in care. And so we ask you today to be our ambassadors to go out and talk to the people around you, those loved ones around you who may actually have congenital heart disease, and to help them to understand that it's okay to talk about it, that's okay to get back into care. And the key element of this is education. And that's what we're going to do today during the symposium. Our goal is to help not only cardiologists, but also primary care physicians, nurses, physicians assistants, sonographers, x-ray techs, you, patients, family members, and friends to learn about congenital heart disease because people like myself and Dr. McGillivray, Dr. Cedars, and our nurse coordinator can't be the only ones taking care of adults with congenital heart disease. We need your help to make that happen as well. So without further ado, Let's go ahead and get started with our first session. Enjoy this day, continue the conversation, and help be part of our community. Continue the conversation with me and many of our colleagues here today on Twitter, Facebook, etc. This is my handle on Twitter. So we'll start with one of the lesions that we often consider to be quote unquote simple. But as we'll talk about today, it's not quite that simple. And that is bicuspid aortic valve and coarctation of the aorta. And as always, we're going to start off with a case to talk about what this actually means. So <clears throat> beginning with this case, this was a 64-year-old woman um, who presented with a history of bicuspid aortic valve and coarctation. And we'll talk about what that means in just a minute. She had previously undergone surgery, and that surgery consisted of having a bypass with a Dacron graft. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. She presented with occasional hemoptysis, that is coughing up of blood, as well as chest pain and high blood pressure. So when she got a CT scan, this is what it looked like. So this is a very complicated and 
um, very detailed image, and I'll walk through what we're looking at. So first of all, this is her aorta, and it continues downstream. Well, you can see very specifically that it narrows very tightly at the site of a coarctation, and that's exactly what a coarctation is. It's a narrowing of the aorta that really reduces the blood flow from the upper extremity down to the lower extremity. And what she had done is she had actually had a graft from the artery that supplied her left shoulder, the subclavian artery, down to the lower part of the aorta in order to bypass the coarctation. And what had occurred is she developed this enlargement, which is called a pseudoaneurysm. So to differentiate from an aneurysm, a pseudoaneurysm does not have a complete wall. And so it was actually a contained bleed into the chest. And so this is a very dangerous situation. And we think that this was contributing to her symptoms. In addition to that, she also had a bicuspid aortic valve, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Fortunately, in this situation, her valve was not involved. So we talked in a lot of detail with our team and the patient about what our next steps were going to be. And we decided that we were going to take a hybrid approach, which means that we're going to try to use stenting as well as surgical approach to optimize her care and to really minimize her risk. So what that meant was we used the following devices. Here we see a balloon expandable covered stent, which means it's a stent with a fabric covering on it. And then we use this, which is a self-expanding endovascular stent graft, which we'll talk about more this afternoon in the virtual hands-on session. And then finally, we use this plug. And the idea of this was we were going to open up the coarctation and then cover the aneurysm and pseudoaneurysm to really reduce the likelihood that it could continue to bleed or even rupture. And so finally, after this very long procedure, we got this result. And what you can see here now is we've completely excluded or covered over that pseudoaneurysm. We've actually been able to open up the coarctation so it no longer narrows the aorta. And then we've reduced the likelihood that that pseudoaneurysm is going to bleed or rupture because we've covered the ability for blood flow to go into it. And what was quite remarkable is that her blood pressure improved dramatically. It's not normal, and that's something we'll talk a little bit about during the session. Her chest pain resolved, and she no longer had any further hemoptysis. So with this, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our panel today with us. So uh, with us virtually is Dr. Ari Cedars. He's coming to us from Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. Hi, Ari. Good morning. Hey, Huey. Good morning. So um, I think that we're going to start off by talking briefly about um, the genetics of bicuspid aortic valve and coarctation of the aorta with um, Ashley Reef, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Good morning, Ashley. Hi, Ashley. Good morning. Hey, <laughs> so Ashley is our um, adult congenital heart nurse coordinator here at Houston Methodist. So let's go ahead and get started on this. Oop. So for... Um, Coarctation of the aorta, we know that about 5%, 5 to 8% of those with heart defects have a coarctation. And um, interestingly, it's very uh, closely connected with having bicuspid aortic valve. Uh, about 50 to 85% of coarctation patients have uh, bicuspid valve. Um, and then from a genetic standpoint, um, we also think about 9% of patients have, that have a bicuspid aortic valve have a family member with bicuspid aortic valve. Um, so it's, it's inherited as an autosomal dominant condition. Um, so this is something that if a patient's diagnosed with it, we want to make sure that as they're following up um, and their family um, is following up, that they want to also have aortic imaging um, to rule out uh, a bicuspid aortic valve or, in fact, a coarctation. Um, which kind of leads into the family planning standpoint. Um, so uh, coartation patients are usually repaired in childhood, uh, but there is a high li rather high likelihood of recurrence in adulthood, re, re coartation So any patient that has a coartation should be seen prior to getting pregnant uh, by an ACHD specialist. Um, and they can have normal pregnancies. It, it can go without without any complications. But the reason they want to see that, that specialist is that they want to basically have their entire aorta imaged 
um, just to rule out any kind of recoarctation or an aneurysm. Um, and um, about 50 to 20 percent of women with a coarctation have actually developed hypertension during pregnancy or um, increased um, hypertension. So we really encourage our patients to keep a blood pressure log um, and um, they really do want to have more frequent follow-ups with their ACHD specialist. Um, some even suggest a monthly echo just to ensure that um, everything um, continues to go well with uh, the aortic root, um, particularly in those bicuspid aortic valve patients. Um, you know, the, as far as treating hypertension in pregnancy, beta blockers really are the best choice because um, ACE and um, ARBs are, you know, not are contraindicated in pregnancy. So um, in addition to that, they um, should really deliver in a hospital that has CT surgery available. Um, somebody like Dr. McGillivray can be there uh, just in case on standby. Um, and they may actually need a C-section. Um, we actually have a, a pregnancy team that meets and um, we discuss, you know, if Valsalva would be too risky, then is it better to deliver the patient um, by C-section? And that would be for severe aortic regurge or significant aortic enlargement during pregnancy, um, which is fairly common um, more in the third trimester. Um, and uh, the risk of, for that patient of having a child with a heart defect is about 3 to 10 percent. So let me stop you there for a second, Ashley. So maybe you want to tell yeah. us what Valsalva is, because I think that that's kind of important. And what is the okay. relevance in, in pregnancy? So as um, when you have a vaginal delivery, um, when your patient's having a vaginal delivery and they're bearing down, um, that, that's considered um, Valsalva. So that increases the uh, pressure in the aorta. And that's where um, the risk is of rupture, uh, particularly if they have a aortic enlargement. Great. And let me pause for a second here. We have a, a large number of participants on Zoom watching us. Um, and then the other way that you can ask your comments and questions is um, if you want to get on pollev.com, um, you can enter in Debakey uh, and respond to the activity, send in your comments and your questions. Or if you just want to use your phone, you can text D-E-B-A-K-E-Y to 37607 and send us your questions, comments, or other thoughts. So, Dr. Cedars, um, yeah, this seems no, like thank a... you very much, Ashley. That was great. Um, you know what I just realized is we haven't really introduced exactly what a bicuspid valve or coarctation of the aorta are specifically. So, you know, briefly to go over those for for individuals who may be watching this and may not know what those two lesions are. Normally, your aortic valve has three leaflets. In certain individuals, there are only two yep, leaflets. Now, as you can imagine, if there are two instead of three, the opening when the valve opens is somewhat changed in its normal shape, and it may not be quite as wide open as it otherwise would be. So that's what a bicuspid aortic valve is, and as Ashley referred to, that's pretty common. About 1% of the total population has a bicuspid aortic valve. Coarctation of the aorta is what we used, is a term we used to describe a people who are born with a narrowing of their aorta between the large blood vessel that feeds blood to the left arm comes off of the aorta and then the rest of the aorta which goes then down to the abdomen to deliver blood to the the intestines and the liver and the kidneys and the legs. It's the narrowing in the area that you could see quite easily um, in the case that Huey just presented that, that, which had been bypassed. These lesions frequently go together. In fact, it's um, uh, in about, I, I think, I think the, the, the number is between 50 and 70% of individuals with coarctation of the aorta will also have a bicuspid valve. And the reason for that is because this is kind of an area of low flow in, in, in fetal life. And if you somehow, if you in, in any way restrict flow out the left ventricular outflow tract, during uh, embryologic development, that can lead to, to a narrowed area right in that, that region there. So I've been tasked not only with explaining that stuff, but also with saying, uh, explaining to you what things can go along with 
bicuspid aortic valve and coarctation of the aorta. And if I think we can get my first slide up there, um, there are a few things that you might not expect that go along with bicuspid aortic valve and coarctation of the aorta. The first is that surprisingly, although they seem quite distant in the geography of the human body, the blood vessels of the brain can develop aneurysms. And the, the reason for this is probably, we think, that when there's a coarctation, there is elevated blood pressure upstream of the narrowed segment of the aorta, which leads to increased shear wall stress at branch points in the blood vessels of the brain and predisposes individuals with coarctation of the aorta as well as bicuspid valve to little aneurysms in the brain. These can be obviously a risk for bleeds in the brain, which are always bad news. In addition, people with bicuspid aortic valve and with coarctation of the aorta have a propensity to develop enlargement of the aorta. They have aortic wall fragility. Now, there is kind of this ongoing perpetual debate as to whether or not it's hemodynamic factors or genetic factors which are responsible for this enlargement of the aorta. And the answer is yes. <laughs> yes to both. It's likely that there are hemodynamic factors related to the valve orifice size and the velocity and direction with which the blood comes out of the heart and strikes the wall of the aorta, which lead to enlargement of the ascending aorta. But also, we know that genetic aortopathies commonly track along with bicuspid aortic valve. Finally, we know that vascular fragility extends throughout the body. We saw a, a very remarkable case that, that, Huey, that Huey presented. And actually, I didn't know that he was going to present that case before. This is a case of nearly the same thing um, in an individual from Spain. Uh, this individual, however, had gone, undergone a previous patch repair of their coarctation of the aorta, developed a pseudoaneurysm in the area of the aorta just adjacent to the repair, and that that had formed a fistula, a fistulous connection, which is just kind of a small abnormal vascular channel between that pseudoaneurysm and one of the, uh, the lungs. And the patient, similar to that uh, patient Huey presented, came in spitting up blood. Not a good scene. So for these reasons, if you're born with coarctation of the aorta or a bicuspid valve, it's super important that you have regular imaging of your aorta, both to look for problems at the repair site as well as to look at for problems in the aorta itself um, where there was no repair just due to the propensity to get enlarged. We also recommend that individuals over the age of uh, have uh, intracranial imaging to look for very aneurysms um, once at least um, once they get past the age of 20 or 30. And going to my next slide, um, I will briefly touch on valvular heart disease in, uh, in bicuspid aortic valve. As I had alluded to, individuals who have a bicuspid valve obviously are going to have a, a, a valve hole, which is smaller than individuals with three leaflets to their valve. As a result of the abnormal valve opening, there's increased turbulence of blood flow as it exits the heart when the heart contracts. <clears throat> that turbulent blood flow leads to damage yeah. of the surface of the valve, and that damage can manifest itself in one of two ways. What two problems can a valve have? They either can become narrowed or they can become leaky. Now, there's quite a bit of data on narrowing of the aortic valve. And individuals with bicuspid valve who have an, a genetic underlying predisposition to the development of valve stenosis will end up developing stenosis of the valve, we believe, approximately 10 to 15 years earlier than the otherwise would have. Individuals who have no predisposition to valve stenosis may never develop. Similarly, and I was saved on this because there's a manuscript that just came out this past weekend from the Mayo Clinic where they looked at tricuspid versus bicuspid aortic valves in individuals with aortic valve insufficiency or leakiness of the aortic valve. And it seems that just as is the case with stenosis of the bicuspid valve, leakiness of the bicuspid valve in predisposed individuals develops 20 to 30 years prior to the time when it would have developed in somebody with a trilethal valve. And this, again, is the result of this turbulent flow out, out of the valve because of the abnormal shape of the valve orifice, the valve hole. So that's my presentation. I think we're going to move on next to 
with to Dr. McGillivray, who's going to discuss with us what it is we do about these things when you develop such problems. Thanks very much, Ari and Ashley. Uh, so far, a great, uh, great discussion about uh, bicuspid aortic valve and coarctation, and, and we have spent most of our time talking about coarctation. And I'll pick up where uh, where we left off. If I can get my slides up. And I like your answer, Ari, about the answer is yes. It's uh, nature or nurture, and the answer is it's yes. It's both. Uh, and, you know, in my career, I've gone back and forth like a, like a tennis match as to what was more important, and I, I agree with you. I think they're uh, both equally important. So I think one of the things that's come up that's really important for us to discuss is really sort of the role of um, pregnancy in the setting of patients with an aortopathy, coarctation, and um, aortic stenosis. I guess, um, Ashley and Ari, when you, when you approach these types of patients, um, what are sort of the warning signs or concerns that you have when you have a patient who has a history of that? I guess we'll start with Ari. Oh, okay. So, I mean, I think in individuals with, uh, with bicuspid valve or uh, coarctation of the aorta, the first thing is to, def is, as Ashley alluded to, you don't want to have an oops pregnancy. This should be a planned event for a number of reasons. Number one, we want to make sure that whatever your underlying anatomy is, however your valve is functioning, whatever your aorta looks like, it is safe for pregnancy before you take that next step. Also, as alluded to by Ashley, people with a bicuspid valve, or not, with a coarctation of the aorta have a predisposition to developing pregnancy-related hypertension, but they also may be hypertensive prior to becoming pregnant. Many antihypertensives are teratogenic. They can cause birth defects in children. And so it's important to make sure that if you have high blood pressure, you're on medicines that are safe during pregnancy. The things that we're going to be looking for in determining a woman's candidacy for pregnancy are the status of her valve, individuals who have narrowing of the aortic valve are at an increased risk for having bad things happen during pregnancy. And we're also going to look at the status of the aorta itself especially if it's large, because individuals who have a large aorta ha during pregnancy have a greater probability of having something bad happen with their aorta, either a tear in the wall of the aorta or a rupture of the aorta, particularly during that valsalva, that pressing out of the, um, during, during delivery. Um, and so these are the two things that, that, that I usually am looking for when I'm doing pre-pregnancy counseling in patients, is their anatomy and what medicines they're on. So, um, so, Ashley, while we're on the subject then, uh, as far as medicines, I guess when we see our patients, um, what is your sort of discussion like with them about pregnancy and how to sort of avoid pregnancy or plan pregnancy a little bit better when feasible? Well, again, I think, you know, as Dr. Cedar said, it needs to be planned, definitely, um, especially with um, coartation. So we, we talk um, when I do early education with any uh, woman of childbearing age or even our, um, you know, our women that maybe are a little bit older and feel that maybe they're past that age but could still potentially have a, a, an oops pregnancy, um, we do talk um, about safe contraception um, choices. Uh, you know, do we want to use something that's estrogen-containing Potentially not, um, or you know uh, how. What's going to happen? Um, you know how long, how far down the road are they planning to have to get pregnant? Um, if it's something relatively soon, and maybe we're at a position with their aortic valve where they're teetering on that edge, they're going to be close to needing some sort of intervention. Um, then we're definitely going to partner with uh, CV surgery and determine what's a good plan. Um, that might be a patient that we talk about in surgical conference, but it's definitely a patient that we're going to start to think about discussing in our pregnancy conference. Um, we would refer them to maternal fetal medicine uh, because we need to work closely with their maternal fetal medicine physician to really plan out basically their entire pregnancy. How often are they going to get imaging? Um, how are they going to be delivered? Where are they going to deliver? Um, we have patients that we would love to have deliver um, at, at Methodist, 
but maybe they want to deliver someplace else. And are we able to take their desires into account and safely deliver them elsewhere um, along with their uh, OBGYN and their MFM doctor? So let me jump um, in then, there. Um, sure. Because I think um, you, know, you brought up some really important points that I want to make sure that we have a chance to cover. And that is the surgical backup and then the surgical management. So either preemptive management or uh, unfortunately sometimes postemptive management. So Dr. McGillivray, can you talk to us a little bit about um, surgical management of bicuspid disease as well as coarctation? Sure, Huey. Uh, I'll sort of get my slides up there to, uh, to discuss it. We, we talked already uh, both very nicely from Ashley and Ari about uh, some of the details about coarctation of the aorta. And I just want to speak a little bit about the pathogenesis of it. Uh, I, I didn't put a slide up about the embryology of the aortic arches. I mean, that's enough to either make everybody fall asleep or maybe throw up. So, but, uh, but it's important in that you know, when we're developing as, a, as an embryo, we have six aortic arches. Uh, and, and they, while we're, de while we're developing, they either involute and they convolute. Uh, and that tissue in the arches that go away, uh, that tissue's not normal. And so one of the theories behind the development of a coarctation is that ductal tissue the, 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 the ductus arteriosus migrates into the aorta and that when the ductus uh, fibrosis into the ligamentum arteriosus that you have the coarctation develop in the aorta uh, from the same mechanism. And as Dr. Cedars pointed out, that uh, the, the theory that flow is important for normal cardiac development because oftentimes there's something upstream that decreases the amount of flow out into the ascending aorta and into the aortic arch, you have low flow, which also contributes to the hypoplasia with a small size of the aortic arch. Uh, and, and all of those need to be taken into consideration in how you're uh, managing them. Now, if you look at, uh, I don't know if I can, I have my special magic wand. Uh, where do I go to? Uh, I guess not. So, so if you're, if you're uh, a, a neonate or an infant, this is, what, this is an aortogram of a coarctation. And it's a very simple, discrete narrowing. And it looks like the arch above it and the aorta below it look relatively normal. And, and certainly the traditional surgical approach to that has been to cut the narrow part out and to sew the two ends back together, and, and that works very well. Uh, although, as Ashley pointed out, that there is a reasonably high incidence that you can get a re-narrowing either early on in the first year or even later on after that. And, and some of that may have to do with some residual ductal tissue, or it could just be how the suture line uh, heals. As we get older, if the, if the coarctation is diagnosed old, when we get older, it becomes a little bit more complicated. Now I'll go back to that last slide because what happens if you look at the picture uh, that these collaterals develop to, to deliver blood flow around that coarctation and they develop from the blood vessels above the coarctation including the arteries that are underneath the ribs, the arteries that are along the mediastinum uh, that go around the coarctation. And those blood vessels are big and they're fragile and they're very easily damaged, particularly with surgery. And it's very hard to cut the coarctation out and sew it back together in an older child and certainly in a young adult. So there have been a number of different operations over the years that have been developed to try to fix that. One is to put some kind of flap, a subclavian flap. Is one up in the, in the upper corner. You, uh, magic wand isn't so magic. Uh, that you use the subclavian artery, you divide it at the, uh, where it goes up by the clavicle, the collarbone, and fold that down to patch and enlarge it. Uh, and and that, that works pretty well. Uh, and, you know, 
in the with the concept of a patch as a patch. Uh, there was a reasonable amount of time uh, in the 70s and in the 80s where surgeons used prosthetic patches, uh, as in the picture up in the right quadrant, taking Dacron or or uh, pericardium to just patch enlarge the coarctation site. And as Ari pointed out, there was a high incidence of developing aneurysms, uh, pseudo aneurysms around those patches. There's the convention, the, the bucket handle graphs uh, down in the left lower quadrant of the uh, screen, um, where you take a graft, a bypass graft, and either bypass it from the ascending aorta, from the subclavian artery, like Dr. Lin's uh, picture early on, uh, to essentially allow blood flow to go around it. Uh, or uh, what has become my preferred appro approach uh, in adults is to go ahead and, uh, and to, to cut out the coarctation segment and put a graft uh, in the anatomic position to reconstruct it. All of these work very well in the short and intermediate term. And what we've found uh, is that uh, what should be a very simple surgical problem doesn't really have a good, simple surgical solution over the long term. And then many of these people who have surgeries on coarctations end up, like, like most patients with congenital heart disease, have to be followed and, and oftentimes um, have other procedures as they, get, uh, as they get older. This is an example of a drawing of that bucket handle graph that was nicely demonstrated on Dr. Lin's 3D uh, reconstruction. And, and this is a patient that I took care of who uh, developed pseudoaneurysms uh, at, the, at the suture line. And, you know, what didn't really make sense to me, and we used to commonly ask back uh, when we were in training, was if you put this bucket handle graft in a five-year-old, what happens when that five-year-old becomes a 25-year-old? And uh, we know what happens when they turn 60. And, and the answer was, well, they... Um, they um, they grow, but they don't really grow. And 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 what happens is there's stretch uh, and tension that's placed on those suture lines, and they they can cause disruption of the suture line, which results in a pseudo aneurysm or or a contained rupture, as uh, as Dr. Lin nicely uh, pointed out. Uh, going back in and operating a second time uh, or a third time uh, in, um, in patients who have had previous coarctation repair, uh, as one of my attendees used to say, there's a lot of stuff around there. There's a lot of important things. First of all, you have to interrupt the blood supply, uh, and so we worry about the risk of, of, uh, of spinal cord ischemia, which could cause uh, the patient to become paralyzed. We have ways. Uh, to, 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 to decrease or, uh, or, or try to prevent that. The phrenic nerve, which allows our diaphragm to move. The recurrent laryngeal nerve, which uh, goes to our vocal cords and allows us to speak without being hoarse. There's another uh, nerves that in that area, the sympathetic chain, that can cause people to get a Horner syndrome. It's a dilated uh, pupil and trouble with uh, dryness or sweating on parts of their face. And then things like the pulmonary artery and the esophagus or the thoracic duct, all of those are difficult to see when you have uh, a repeat uh, operation. Uh, Ari touched on a little bit about bicuspid aortic valve, and I'll, I'll touch on the surgical aspect of that. That, uh, as Ari pointed out, that if you have a two-leaflet valve as opposed to a three-leaflet valve, it can be narrower. Well, th that's true, but sometimes it can be bigger. Uh, and you can have a dilated um, aortic annulus, uh, and you can have these bicuspid valve cusps. Sometimes, and most of the time, they work just fine. But in addition to be getting narrowed, they can also become regurgitant or leak and have blood back up uh, into the left ventricle. And the traditional method surgically to deal with either a narrow or a regurgitant in aortic valve uh, in many times in these young people was to take the valve out. If the aorta around it, the aortic root was dilated, would take that out too. Uh, 
Or even if the valve was working normally uh, and you had an aneurysm around the root, uh, which people with bicuspid aortic valve are prone to have, you'd have to take all of it out and replace it all. We now have ways to, to reconstruct a leaky bicuspid valve. Uh, we have ways to preserve the bicuspid valve with valve sparing uh, root surgery, which, uh, which has been um, working out pretty well. We, of course, like everything in congenital heart disease, the time will be what determines how successful it will be over time. But, but, uh, but so far, that seems to be working out pretty well. And with that, I'll stop uh, talking about surgery. Uh, so so that, those are really great discussion points, um, Tom. Uh, so there's a couple questions that have come up um, through the chat. So the first one um, is, could you kindly discuss imaging bicuspid aortic valve on echocardiography? Um, and then I'll just mention the adjoining question to it, which is um, uh, along the same lines. Independent of aortic insufficiency and aortopathy, does Siever's class predict outcomes in pregnancy? I always report it as part of my imaging practice. So uh, Dr. Cedars, any thoughts on, um, first of all, how do you like to look at things on an echo when you're looking at a patient with bicuspid aortic valve? Um, well, I think that my, my, uh, my uh, bias is to just really do, not, uh, the imaging is not dissimilar to, to that which I get for, for any other aortic uh, valve disease. Um, you want to make certain that you get um, a good idea of, of, of the Doppler envelopes for during systole and diastole, make sure that um, you know if there's stenosis, how stenotic it, the valve is, um, and you want to, um, uh, and if it's leaking, to what degree it's leaking. You also want to look at the, make sure that you get a good view of the aortic root. Um, ideally, um, if you can get a supersternal notch view um, for the aortic root to, and see up to the level of the arch, um, given the fact that the um, the, the segment of the aorta that's um, the ace in the aorta above the sinotubular junction is most prone to enlargement in the case of bicuspid valve. Um, and then um, you, to view valve morphology itself, um, I think that we generally use the, the peristernal short axis at the level of the aortic valve or the level of the base of the heart. Um, in terms of the second question, the Sievers classification and, and the implications that may have for pregnancy, I. I have to say I, I'm complete. I have no idea. Um, I don't. If there is data available on that, um, I don't know what it is. Um, I know that there has been there have been some studies which have suggested that um, certain valve morphology has a greater um, probably uh, greater relationship with either the development of, of valve stenosis or valve regurgitation. But um, I don't know about about the implications for pregnancy, unfortunately. Clarify the Sievers classification is. Um, uh, I think Dr. Cedars showed in this slide earlier is how the um, the valve morphology is, or how how it's shaped um, as a result from how which leaflets are fused together to form a bicuspid aortic valve. For, um, in case we didn't make that clear, so um, I think the other major question um, that we have here is: What can, if a person does? Can, can I just can I just yeah, please. Inject? Yeah. So so there's been a clarion call to surgeons to to be very precise when they operate on patients with bicuspid valve mortho morphology, to very clearly and carefully describe what the Seavers class is so that we can get, a, get an answer to the question that was asked. And, and, and I think the same thing, uh, that same uh, clarion call should go out to imagers uh, to don't just say it's a bicuspid valve. Please, as best you can, define and describe what the morphology is so we can answer that question because as the data accumulates we are now starting to see that some certain like Seaver zeros do seem to be more associated with aortic root aneurysms and aortic insufficiency as opposed to Seavers 1 are more not, all, not, not exclusively but more likely to be associated with stenosis and, and not to have aortic root aneurysms but, I mean, there are some questions that are answered, but more questions that are being raised. So the, the, the more we can understand it, the better off we'll all be. Yeah, and, and to that point, I mean, I would say, I don't think any of us really feel all that comfortable just using echocardiography alone to predict right. um, what's going to happen with the pregnancy. So I think most of us, 
if we were to sit down with a patient who is planning pregnancy, I think we'd probably do cross-sectional imaging advanced to that. Um, so moving on to the next question. So what if a person does not know that they have this problem? Can a primary doctor find this and send them on to a specialist? So I think that's a great question. So, um, so Ashley, do you want to tackle this one? Sure. Um, I think we, we tend to see, um, you know, a handful of patients who have had an echocardiogram for some other reason um, and um, are found to have a bicuspid valve. Um, as far as coarctation, uh, if you, a patient that has persistent hypertension, um, but also if you do um, upper extremity blood pressure and lower extremity blood pressure, um, you will, if you, if there is a difference of about 20 uh, millimeters of mercury, then that's definitely something that's suggestive of um, potential coarctation. And, um, you know, would definitely need further, further workup. Uh, thank you, Ashley. That's really great. We're, we're getting lots of questions here, um, and we're going to run out of time pretty soon, so I want to try to keep moving. So the next question is, what is the pathogenesis of interrupted aortic arch, and is it similar to the development of bicuspid aortic, um, I'm sorry, bicuspid in um, coarctation? Dr. McGillivray, do you have any thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, so we, 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 we oftentimes lump them together in the same conversation, but the, uh, the pathogenesis is a little bit different. As I, going back to the, uh, the cure for insomnia and the creation of nausea, it, it all goes back to the embryology of the aortic arches. And what, uh, what gets... Uh, what uh, the, the, either the inability for convolution or appropriate involution, uh, and where in the arch that happens is what determines where you have an interrupted arch. And, and just like flow uh, during embryology determines development, oftentimes patients with interrupted arches are associated with other uh, congenital anomalies like ventricular septal defects and so forth. Yeah, so I, I think that's a, that's a long um, answer to we're still learning. We're still learning, yeah. <laughs> As with, unfortunately, much of uh, uh, what we do in congenital heart disease. And I think humility is really sort of the, yeah. the key element to approach. What, what did they used to say in medical school was, whenever anything is idiopathic, it means the doctors are idiots. <laughs> yeah. So, so to that, let's move on to the next question. So how do you, sur how do you monitor and do surveillance on adults with impaired coarctation who are asymptomatic? So uh, I think, Ashley, that's, that goes to sort of um, where we were going to go with you next. So um, generally, follow up with uh, an ACHD specialist yearly, at least. Um, we found that when we stretch that out to two years, um, patients tend to forget when that two-year mark is. So if we can give them a month that every year they come and see us, uh, they get uh, an EKG, they get an echo, and then every about two to four years, um, a cardiac MRI or a CT, um, then that, that's generally how we monitor our patients with um, repaired coarctation um, that are asymptomatic. But definitely in between, you know, I really encourage our patients to, um, you know, if they're having any, any kind of issues, particularly if they have a change in blood pressure, um, to definitely reach out to us um, and potentially then have more frequent follow-up. There was a second question um, along what you were talking about earlier, which is, uh, you know, would you recommend screening first-degree relatives of our patients? And obviously, I think it depends on the context, but um, let us know what you think. Um, definitely, uh, the guidelines really suggest that uh, first-degree relatives should be screened and uh, particularly, you know, again, if, um, if somebody is looking to become pregnant, because that's really a situation where you can get caught between a rock and a hard place and there can be some disastrous things happen. Yeah. So, and then um, there's a follow-on to the question about the Sievers, and that is um, about um, transcatheter aortic valve replacement and outcomes. And I think that that's something that's really exciting uh, in this area, and I think really probably at least my sort of um, bias is that I think it kind of depends on the context. So to sort of take a step back for a second and talk about what we're talking about, there's some really exciting data now that suggests that um, some of our patients who are low risk and even bicuspid aortic valves could potentially be 
um, well treated with bicuspid aortic valve. And I know, um, Ari, you've been very excited about that. Um, and I think a lot of that sort of depends on what is the context of the rest of their disease because some of our patients have, just strictly speaking, a bicuspid aortic valve without necessarily the evidence of aortopathy or without evidence of a coarctation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on the other hand, we also have patients who are very high risk, such as they have a bicuspid aortic valve, they have coarctation, they have an aortic aneurysm, and then they happen to have Turner syndrome, for example. So I, I think it's a very, very wide spectrum, and I think, unfortunately, it's a very complicated question to answer. Um, I don't know, Dr. McGillory, if you have any thoughts. I, I would say it's a definite maybe. <laughs> the, uh, you know, that, uh, even, you know it's, it's important to keep in mind that in the TAVR trials, even in the lowest TAVR trials, those patients were pretty old. I mean, the, the mean age was well into their 70s. Uh, some of the, the and, and many of the trials excluded bicuspid valve patients. So to immediately take that leap down to a much younger patient population with bicuspid valves who have a different morphology uh, in their root, I, I think that's a, quest, and a very important question that needs to be directly addressed and directly answered. So I think it's a little bit of a leap to just say because in the low-risk uh, trials, TAVR is a good treatment for bicuspid aortic valve patients. Yeah. Um, Dr. Cedars, I don't know if you want to jump in with any comments because I know you're very excited about this area. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that, that there have been, um, it, so I think it's, it's occurred um, in spite of the fact that bicuspid valve patients were excluded from the mm -hmm. trials, um, which have really led to the, the evolution of, of, of valve replacement technology and the advent of TAVR, mm -hmm. or transcatheter aortic valve um, but a lot of bi bi uh, bicuspid aortic valve patients ended up t getting um, mm -hmm. these, these percutaneous valves. Um, it, the existing data up until about, I think, last week or a couple weeks ago was that outcomes were not really dissimilar between tricuspid and bicuspid valve patients who had their valve replaced um, percutaneously. There was a manuscript that just came out, I want to say just this past week in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, um, which showed that, um, ironically, uh, the older patients and those who had a more calcified bicuspid valve were at greater risk for problems with percutaneous um, valve replacement. Um, and, and, you know, I, I say ironically because those are the kind of the older, higher risk patients in whom I think, or for whom TAVR was originally designed. It seems that it works better in individuals who, who, are, um, who don't have, have a calcified valve or haven't had extensive valvular deterioration at the time when, uh, when the new valve is placed. Anyway, I think yeah. as, as Dr. McGill McGillivray said, it's, a, it's an evolving field and honestly we're not going to know the answer until we have a, a trial is expressly focused on, on the, um, the percutaneous valve technology and bicuspid valve. So we have just about a minute left for one final question. That is, is subclavian flap repair still used in if infants? And if not, why not? Dr. McGillivray. So I think that the, uh, in, in most uh, neonatal surgeons' hands, it, the subclavian flap has been usurped by the extended end-to-end -end anastomosis. I, I think that uh, you can never say never, but uh, I would say almost never. It's, uh, usually you can, in, a, in an infant, you can mobilize both the arch in the proximal descending aorta and get a much better technical result with an extended end-to-end -end repair. Great. Well, these have been fantastic questions and it's been a fantastic discussion. Um, I want to thank our panel, Dr. Ari Cedars, Ashley Reef, and Dr. Tom McGillivray. Um, we will be discussing more about the details of valve replacement, valve repair, um, and endovascular stent grafts this afternoon doing our virtual hands-on session. So join us back at that time. And of course, um, Dr. Cedars, myself, Ashley, we are all on Twitter, so please continue the discussion and continue sending us questions. We're going to take a short break, and then we're going to get started with our next session on transposition of the great arteries and atrial switch. Thanks for joining us.
Hey, Jonathan, how are you? Can you be okay? Yes. Good morning, everyone. For those of you who are just joining us, we were having an excellent morning. We just finished our discussion on bicuspid aortic valve and coarctation of the aorta. We're going to move on to an even more complicated area that's detransposition of the great arteries, the atrial switch operation. Um, before we start, I just want to remind you that engagement has been hot and fantastic this morning. We've had some excellent questions. For those of you who are just joining us, the way to get engaged is the following. If you want to log on online, go to pollev, that's P-O-L-L-E-V dot com slash debakey, D-E-B-A-K-E-Y. Or if you want to use your phone, you can text debakey, that's D-E-B-A-K-E-Y, to the number 37607. That's debakey to the number 37607. So without further ado, with me here today in the studio is Dr. Valeria Duarte. She is my wonderful partner in delcongenital heart disease, and she is a specialist in pregnancy and cardiovascular disease, as well as advanced imaging. And most recently, she's become the medical co-director for the adult congenital heart transplant program, which is very important when we start talking about this particular topic, detransposition of the great arteries and patients who have undergone atrial switch operation. Dr. Duarte. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ling, for the kind introduction. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. We're now, as Dr. Lin said, we're going to discuss a key topic in adult congenital heart disease, patients with detransposition of the great arteries who have undergone the atrial switch operation. To discuss this very important topic, I, I have a very special panel today. First, Dr. Pankaj Madan, Dr. Jonathan Gins, Dr. Peter Ermes, and Dr. Edward Hickey. As an introduction, let's ask ourselves the first question. What does detransposition of the great arteries mean, and how is it different from, a no from normal anatomy? So in the normal heart, the red blood coming oxygenated, coming from the lungs, goes to the left atrium, and from there, it goes to the left ventricle from where it's pumped to the aorta, which distributes this oxygenated blood to all of our organs. After using the oxygen, the, the blue blood returns to the heart, to the right atrium. From there, it goes to the right ventricle, and from there, it gets pumped to the pulmonary arteries, which distributes this blue blood in the lung for it to get oxygenated. So what happens in the transposition of the great arteries? The atria are in the normal position, and they're connecting normally to their respective ventricles. But the problem comes here, in the connection between the left ventricle and the right ventricle to their respective great arteries. This connection is transposed. The LV, instead of connecting to the aorta, pumps oxygenated blood to the lungs through the pulmonary arteries. And the right ventricle, instead of being connected to the pulmonary arteries, is connected to the aorta. So the aorta receives blue blood and pumps it to the systemic circulation. As you can imagine, this is a far from ideal situation. 
So how do we fix this? The atrial switch operation was the first operation to be developed to help these patients survive. The pioneer surgeons were Dr. Mustard and Dr. Senem, and these are the other names for these operations. In the atrial switch or Mustard or Senem operation, the connections between the atria and the ventricles are rearranged so that the left atrium, which receives the blue, the red blood, connects to the right ventricle, which pumps that red blood to the aorta, fixing the pathway of the red blood. On the other hand, the right atrium, the, the blood coming back, the blue blood coming back to the right atrium is diverted to the left ventricle, which is connected to the pulmonary arteries. With this, we fix the pathway of the blue blood from the right atrium to the pulmonary arteries and the lungs. So how is this done? There is a diagram here with that depicts the, this diversion of the blood. As you know, the SVC and the IVC bring all the blue blood from all of our organs back to the heart, to the right atrium. In the atrial switch operation, the blue blood gets diverted to the left ventricle, which is connected to the PAs. The, this diversion of the blood is achieved by the creation of structures that we call baffles. You can see here the systemic venous baffle in blue. On the other hand, behind it, the red blood coming to the left atrium gets diverted to the right ventricle, which pumps to the aorta. This is called the pulmonary venous baffle. As you can imagine, these patients undergo extensive surgery in their atria and are left with significant scars from it, which can naturally not lead to arrhythmias. So I'm going to ask one of our panelists, Dr. Pankaj Madan, to discuss with us what arrhythmias we can find in patients with atrial switch operation, and how do we approach them? Dr. Madan? Okay. Uh, hey, Valeria. Can you? Can yes, you we can hear you. We can okay, hear I, you. I was echoing so much, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, so, um, you know, thank you for having me here. Um, Valeria, if I can go back to your slide of the atrial switch procedure. Yes. And I can start yes. up on that one. Can we get, get that image up again, my screen, please? Let us know when you can see it, Pankaj. Oh, I can't see it yet. Oh, here it is. Okay. Okay. So let's look at the atrial switch procedure again. Um, the atrial switch procedure involves redirecting the blood flow from the upper half of the body and the lower half of the body. Now, this is the blue blood. This is the deoxygenated blood over to the left side so that it can go to the lungs from there. I tend to think of this diversionary pathway as a pair of trousers, so to speak. One of the limb of the trousers is hooked up to the upper body venous pathway, and then the lower half is attached to the inferior vena cava, which is the blood returning from the lower half of the body. And then the waist of that trousers is attached to the mitral valve on the left side. So the blue blood then enters the uh, left ventricle and from there it goes to the lungs. Um, as Dr. Duarte rightly pointed out that this requires a lot of cardiac surgery to, um, to develop these pathways and therein lies the substrate for arrhythmias. Uh, 
Uh, now, when the surgeon uh, starts making these pathways, they open up the right side of the heart, the right upper chamber, which is the right atrium, and uh, right near the incision where they place the incision lies the SA node, which is sort of the natural pacemaker of the heart, from where the heartbeat originates and travels down to the rest of the heart. So one of the most common arrhythmias, one of the most common uh, uh, arrhythmias is basically the sinus node dysfunction. This artificial, uh, this natural pacemaker tends to fail over time. Uh, it can develop fibrosis, it can develop scarring. So it ceases to function over time. And uh, the incidence of uh, this sinus node failing or sinus node dysfunction is about 40% uh, 20 to 25 years after surgery. The second issue is that a lot of rhythm abnormalities can originate from all the scars uh, in the upper atrium. And uh, these scars uh, are from the result of uh, these baffles. So, uh, these pathways which we call as baffles. So a lot of uh, rhythm um, issues can originate from within the baffle. Sometimes they can originate out of this artificial baffle around the uh, tricuspid valve, which is a valve on the right side. Um, and uh, it, so this is, uh, uh, these are some of the arrhythmias that can originate from uh, the upper chamber, but then there is a, then the rhythm, the most troublesome arrhythmias which can cause sudden cardiac death can originate from the lower chamber of the heart, which are called the ventricles. So you have to remember that in this case, the ventricles, the right ventricle is still pumping blood to the rest of the body and it was not intended to do that uh, uh, by the natural scheme of things. So the right ventricle does get hypertrophied and dilated over time and uh, can also develop uh, failure which will certainly be discussed at a later point during this talk. And when this ventricle has low heart function, develops reduced function, it becomes a risk factor for ventricle arrhythmias and these are the rhythm problems originating from the lower chamber of the heart and, and can predispose uh, a patient to sudden cardiac death, uh, which is one of the leading causes of uh, mortality in such patients. Um, the management of rhythms develops it, it basically depends on uh, uh, what rhythm abnormality they have, whether it is coming from the upper chamber, the lower chamber, or does it involve the base, or does it involve the natural pacemaker? So uh, if it is coming from the upper chambers of the heart, we still try to, we, we still tend to take it seriously because even rhythms that originate from upper chamber of the heart can be a risk factor for sudden cardiac death if uh, left unchecked because they can cause the lower chambers to beat faster and, uh, and can eventually lead to ventricular arrhythmias. So there are several ways of uh, approaching the upper chamber rhythm disturbances. Um, it can either be a medical therapy in which we give a patient certain forms of medications, which we call as antiarrhythmic medications, and they can help suppress the rhythms uh, originating, uh, abnormal rhythms originating from upper chamber of the heart, or we can also do invasive procedures such as ablation and uh, go in with the catheter through the leg and burn an area of uh, uh, the heart where these rhythm disturbances can be coming from. Sometimes we also have to puncture the baffle 
and uh, enter into the uh, red blood side of things or the pulmonary venous uh, atrium and sometimes we have to ablate uh, rhythm disturbances over there also. Um, and then talking about the ventricular arrhythmias, as I discussed, these are the rhythm disturbances that originate from lower chambers of the heart. Sometimes you can do uh, an ablation over there also, but in our opinion that these are coming from multiple focus areas and sometimes uh, ablation is not the best idea. Um, and often if, if, if this is the case, then we, if there's a history of uh, ventricular arrhythmias, then often the best way is to uh, do a defibrillator um, and to prevent the occurrence of uh, a sudden cardiac arrest. I think that's it, Valeria. Uh, uh, do you have any questions? Now I'll be I'll be happy to answer any specific questions. For that, for this very clear explanation, um, we're going to open uh, for questions, and we will address them as they come. Um, moving on to another issue that we frequently encounter with the atrial switch of patients undergoing the atrial switch operation. As you can imagine, the surgery, this surgery is performed during childhood, and our patients live with this operation for several decades. So after 30, 40, 50 years, these baffles start to have issues. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Jonathan Gins from Aust joining us from Austin to help us understand better what issues can these baffles have, how do we look for them, and what symptoms do the patients present with? Dr. Gins? Thanks, Valeria. Um, just attempting to share the slides with you. I just wanted to confirm that you can see the, see the slides there. Yes, perfect. Great, okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, so you see my type now. So, uh, okay, you can see the slides well enough, I guess you're going to see my next slide, so give away the excitement. But anyway, so thanks very much for the invitation. So, um, I, I just talk uh, a name baffled by baffles. Uh, just because I guess when I started training in adult congenital heart disease, the concept of baffles was a little confusing. And uh, you know, there's different sorts of baffles that we see out there. But basically, the baffle, I know that we've kind of gone over this in, in um, detail already, but uh, the issue was these, the, the trouser pants, as Hank had, uh, was into, uh, that these, over time, can become narrowed, mostly due to you know, growth and inadequacy of the size of the baffles. Uh, but, you know, the ingrowth of scar tissue. And uh, so these limbs, the SVC limb and the IVC limb can become narrowed and cause obstruction. And also the limb coming from the pulmonary veins across to the right ventricle can become narrowed. But in general, the most narrowing occurs in this uh, part of the baffle up here, the SVC limb. And it's about three to one narrowing from the um, superior and inferior vena cava uh, baffles. Uh, also, these baffles, uh, because they're sutured on surgeons, and surgeons um, are humans like the rest of us, as difficult as that is to believe, occasionally there can be uh, little gaps in, in the suture lines uh, that can lead to uh, leaks. And so uh, blue blood uh, or pink blood can uh, cross to one side or the other, much like in an atrial septal defect. And so this is just a little picture showing you what a baffle stenosis might look like. Uh, you saw the normal picture, uh, and this is what a stenosis would look like. And a gap in the baffle might be a little uh, you know, a gap in the suture line here that might uh, cause a, a leak of blue blood across to the, uh, the, the oxygenated side or oxygenated blood across to the blue side, causing, uh, I'll show you, causing exercise intolerance, low oxygen saturation, occasionally blood clots. Across the baffle and cause a stroke, 
SVC syndrome, which is swelling of the upper half of the body, uh, because that uh, that half is uh, goes through that SVC baffle. Congestion in the abdomen or liver congestion and cirrhosis, and sometimes diff uh, difficulty with pacemaker placement. And it's actually very important for our trainees to realize that uh, before any of the patients go for a pacemaker or defibrillator insertion, that they very uh, clearly uh, determine if there's any baffle uh, stenosis uh, or leak. Um, how do we figure this out? Well, clinically, we can look for low oxygen saturations uh, in our patients uh, with uh, TGA postatural switch repair. Exercise testing may give a clue if someone has exercise intolerance that's out of keeping the degree of ventricular function. Uh, when we do a bubble study in these patients, we've got to remember to inject both the upper limbs and lower limbs because uh, a baffle leak will only be obvious in the um, SVC portion by injecting in the arm. But in the IVC portion, uh, you must inject uh, you know, into the inferior vena cava, so in the leg, uh, in order to demonstrate a leak in the lower heart if you're doing a bubble study. We also use MRI, CT scanning, and cardiac catheterization. And this is just a nice uh, picture showing you what a baffle stenosis would look like in the SVC limb and in the IVC limb. And the way this is treated is by stenting it open with a, a big stent. This is what a baffle leak would look like on an angiogram. So you can see uh, this is the SVC baffle here, but there's a little gap in the, uh, the baffle allowing some dye to go through into the, into the other side of the baffle, causing this patient to have low oxygen saturation. How do we treat this? So this it can be treated with stents and also with stents to open up narrowings and also to uh, close off uh, leaks in the baffle. And also, if there's a leak, you can use uh, any, you know, multiple of the different sorts of plugs that are available uh, to close the holes in the leaks. Now, I guess the other question is, um, you know, if we're thinking about treating these patients, sorry, I should go back, um, uh, treating these, uh, generally these days, about 90% of these can be treated percutaneously. But I'll be honest, in my own practice over the years, I've had patients that have had small leaks in their baffles or, or minor narrowings in their baffles, and we don't necessarily always have to treat them if they're asymptomatic. And of course, occasionally surgery is employed if we can't treat these percutaneously. And, uh, you know, it was helpful several years ago, uh, this large data set was published out of Ohio, showing that uh, treating these defects is actually functionally helpful. So if someone has a narrowing uh, or a stenosis of the baffle and we treat it, their exercise capacity we can demonstrate will objectively improve um, off of the O2 max study, like an exercise test. And also their oxygen levels, if they have a, a leak, uh, will improve. All right, that's it for that. So does anyone have any questions about that? All all right, thank you so much, Dr. Gins, for that very clear explanation and the beautiful pictures. Um, let's, let's move on with our discussion now. Um, as we discussed, uh, by, connecting, by performing an atrial switch, the right ventricle it becomes the systemic ventricle, meaning it's the ventricle that pumps to the aorta and the systemic circulation. And how is that a problem? The right ventricle is designed to pump at a lower pressure circulation, the pulmonary circulation. So when we commit it to pump to the aorta, we're exposing it chronically to higher pressures than what it is designed for. And is that an issue? Well, with time, this is a cardiac MRI of a patient that has undergone an atrial switch. And you can see here, this is anterior, this is the chest wall. And you can see here how this right ventricle with time shows signs that it's having trouble dealing with this higher pressure circulation. And it dilates, it enlarges. You can see here the difference between the right ventricle and the small left ventricle in the back and starts to weaken, so it, we, the patients develop right ventricular dysfunction. And in addition, that leads to malfunctioning of the tricuspid valve, the associated AV, AV valve, 
and leads to tricuspid regurgitation. So let's move to our next panelist, Dr. Peter Hermes. Dr. Hermes, how do we diagnose and treat patients with atrial switch with systemic RV dysfunction? And what options do we have for, for them? Sure, thank you, thank you. I'm just gonna share uh, my slides briefly. Can you guys all see this? <laughs> yes. Okay, so I always like to start with something you know like this, and especially um, in in it because it's it's applicable to I think many of our different disease populations for ACHD, um, and that oftentimes normal is an illusion. You have to have a high index of suspicion. Uh, in these patients to know exactly what you're looking for uh, because one, the patients may not experience significant symptoms. And two, as, as Dr. Lynn mentioned at the very, very beginning uh, of today, we want to be preemptive in being able to recognize what's going on and address it before we're ending up being reactive. And so I just, you know, I always like to say just if you're caring for this group of patients or uh, even if you are in this group of patients, uh, I think just this is a, a big point that, that close follow-up and follow-up by, by those who, who really know what they're looking for is important. When, when, when talking about the systemic right ventricle in those patients with uh, atrial switch, um, it, it kind of goes hand-in-hand hand oftentimes with the AV valve regurgitation or the tricuspid regurgitation. And sometimes the question is, so which makes which one worse? Um, does the you know tricuspid regurgitation make the systemic ventricle worse and, and predispose it to, to premature failure, failure? Or does the right ventricle being in a systemic uh, fashion not used to that is just set up for early, early failure um, and then makes the, the tricuspid regurgitation you know, worse in that regard? And I think, you know, as to harken back uh, to the answer regarding, you know, bicuspid valves and, and, and aorta uh, dilation, I think the answer is yes. Um, you know, in that I think they play hand in hand. You can't separate one with, from the other. I, I think you, you can definitely have early right ventricular failure uh, without tricuspid regurgitation, but I think so many of these patients have tricuspid regurgitation that often then worsens and hastens uh, early ventricular failure. We had uh, just recently uh, finished a look at, a, at about a little over 100 patients in our practice who are greater than 30 years out from their atrial switch uh, procedures um, and found that, you know, 80, 80 plus percent have decreased function uh, on their echoes. Um, and if you look through the literature, tricuspid regurgitation can occur in anywhere, reports show anywhere between, you know, 25 to 85 percent. And I think it depends on what is defined as significant regurgitation, um, because I think moderate or severe regurgitation is definitely significant in these patients where it can push that right ventricle uh, over the edge because it is already on the edge just because it's a systemic ventricle. And so here you can see uh, atrial switch patients along with single ventricles and, and tetralogy and flow have an increased risk of developing heart failure over the course of time compared to other, uh, patient, other patients uh, with congenital heart disease. And so we definitely see a high incidence uh, of, of early heart failure in these patients. And the difficulty is, is several fold. One is that we're dealing with a systemic right ventricle. And two, it goes back to what I had mentioned uh, from normal being illusion. This is just a graph. Uh, if you look along the x-axis, these are different levels of peak VO2 measurements. And so that's kind of a objective or how well people exercise. And what is their functional capability to perform exercise? Um, and then the y-axis is just the different numbers of patients at different levels. But the one thing that I, that I think you have to read is you actually have to read the caption of this graph. All of these patients in this graph are asymptomatic. They're all functional class one patients. Uh, and thus, sometimes patients, you know, you feel normal. You feel like you're doing well. You feel like you can do everything that you need to do. But when you get on a treadmill and we objectively measure that, we find that it's decreased below what you may have been able to do five years ago or 10 years ago. 
And then possibly we could address something and you could, you know, then feel better and you're, and can be like, well, I didn't know I could feel, um, you know, that because I just kind of got, got used to feeling, you know, how we're doing. So you have to have a high index of suspicion to look for this. And when you do kind of get patients who have heart failure, uh, for those patients who have an atrial switch, I think you, I think you have to take kind of a, a multi-tiered level. One, I think you have to have a comprehensive approach. And you have to start with kind of the first signs of heart failure. There's good studies that show at, this, at the first hospitalization uh, for uh, in one of these patients with a heart failure hospitalization, uh, there's about a 30% one year and, a, and almost a 50% five-year risk of mortality. Um, and so you have to plug them into a formalized pathway early on with frequent check-ins. Again, just as I mentioned earlier, preemptive, so proactive and not reactive. We want to be ahead of the curve and not wait for symptoms. Looking at serial predictors, whether that's, there's not many out there, unfortunately, but studies have shown you can look at beta, uh, you know, type, uh, B-type natriuretic peptide, BNP, look at renal function, and then look at objective exercise testing. And you have to do these serially because you sort of have to develop an own norm for each patient. And so you want to get frequent you want the patients to be their own norms. So you want to get frequent checks on, on those patients. You need to medically optimize. The unfortunate aspect in these systemic right ventricles is a lot of the medications don't do that well. Uh, they, do a lot more poor, they do a lot more poorly than compared to our counterparts uh, who have acquired heart disease and have left ventricles. Um, and so mainstays are, are a lot of times diuretic management. You definitely, as Dr. Madan talked about earlier, you definitely have to optimize them from an electrical standpoint. You have to be aggressive in treating their rhythm disturbances. And oftentimes they need a pacemaker because, you know, because of bradycardia, as he talked uh, about. And then as Dr. Gins talked about, you have to look for structural abnormalities, so baffle obstructions, baffle leaks, and be aggressive in addressing those. Oftentimes, if you're not looking for them, you may miss them. Uh, we've been fooled, you know, even having CT scans or MRIs and, and not really, and then taking a patient to the lab for a pacemaker and still finding that there's a significant baffle obstruction. So you really do have to have a high index of suspicion. And then, you know, once you get down that pathway and you, you're still struggling, uh, I think you have to have a very close connection with an advanced heart, advanced heart failure therapies, VAD transplant center um, that you can work with and plug them in early uh, into that pathway uh, prior to uh, waiting too long as we tend to often do uh, with many of our patients, especially those who, who tend to be saying that they're feeling well. Um, I don't think there's necessarily a, a problem with trying to plug people in early to, to formalize and get down that pathway. And obviously I won't, I won't talk more about VADs and transplants because I know Dr. Hickey um, is, is on tap coming up to talk about that. But I think you just have to be very much an investigator. You have to be very much on the lookout of trying to find things that are wrong because otherwise you're going to miss them. And it's a very difficult group of patients to treat. Um, and you really have to be, you know, have frequent check-ins uh, and frequent checkpoints um, to make sure that we're headed down the right direction. So I think I will just stop there, but thank you. Thank Happy you. Happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Hermes. Very clear as usual. Um, so, as Dr. Hermes explained, we should approach these patients in an organized fashion and rule out all the potential issues, treat them. But what happens if the, a patient with this ventricular function, uh, when we address everything, the rhythm, the structural issues of the baffle, and our patient keeps getting admitted to the hospital with heart failure in, in spite of our uh, efforts in the outpatient setting. So I'm going to ask Dr. Edward Hickey from Texas Children's to help us decide when do we refer these patients for advanced heart failure therapy evaluation? When do we refer them for transplant evaluation and what does that look like for a patient, for our patients? Dr. Hickey, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. I just want to check that you can hear me uh, appropriately. Yes, perfectly. Great. 
So the short answer to your question is early and not late. Um, we get into trouble when we are thinking about advanced therapies late down the line, and I'll explain in a minute why that's a big problem. I think the great paradigm shift in adult congenital heart disease uh, in general is that we need to be much more preemptive following tracking and intervening on patients uh, because they look so much better from the outside than their physiology and anatomy is on the inside, and we get into trouble when, when we're too late. Um, you mentioned some of the history of, of uh, mustard physiology, and I'm, I, I, I'd just like to share a few slides. Um, can you see my slides here? Yes, you just need to, to put it on, on presentation view. Um, the, the reason I wanted to elaborate is because of, I joined Texas Children's a year ago, but my previous 15 years uh, of my professional life was based at Sick Children's in, uh, in Toronto, where, of course, Bill Mustard was the head of the department in the, in the 50s and, uh, and 60s. And he was a remarkable character. The scary thing from my point of view is he was actually an orthopedic surgeon who switched to cardiac surgery when they needed a cardiac surgeon. And... Uh, uh, it, it, although it's a scary prospect, he uh, he, he obviously uh, flew with it and did extremely well. Was a very dynamic dynamic man. Um, many people don't know that he actually did the first reported arterial switch, uh, as well as the first mustard operation. He did the first arterial switch, which was reported in 1954. Of course, everyone associates it with Jeten and Yakub and Castaneda and others trying it in the late 1970s. But the first reported one was actually in 1954. It was unsuccessful, and that's why uh, no one knows about it. He transferred, uh, he did a, a standard arterial switch, except he transferred the left coronary artery and not the right, because he, um, he thought uh, incorrectly that the right coronary artery simply wasn't as important or as necessary. Um, the, uh, he did some other interesting things. He, this is in the early days of bike bus. There was a plethora of rhesus monkeys, apparently, in Toronto at the time, because he was using rhesus monkey lungs as a potential oxygenator in early bypass circuits, uh, which is a very bizarre approach, and I don't need to tell you that it wasn't successful. Uh, and then he did the first mustard operation in 1963. <clears throat> he actually did it. Um, the, his idea for doing it actually arose from a mistake that he made previously when he was repairing a secundum ASD. Uh, in placing the atrial septal patch, he actually incorporated the IVC by mistake to drain to the left atrium. And he, he suddenly realized to himself, well, if I can do this by mistake, I can probably do it on purpose. And uh, so he did. He, he tried doing it on purpose, baffling both the IPC and the SVC to the left atrium. And that, that was the first mustard operation. And the patient was called Maria, and she's still alive today. This is him literally whining and dining her on, his, on her 16th birthday. And... Um, at our, at our 50th celebration of his, um, of his operation, she was still alive and well and living in Toronto. It's very rare that the first patient of an eponymous operation survives and does so well, but she truly has done remarkably well. Um, we have the large, largest series uh, of mustard operations, not surprisingly, in Toronto because of his, his practice. Um, and uh, this is the overall survival curve when I last analyzed it. Um, the early mortality, yes, there was a blip there, earlier on, but towards the end of this series, the early mortality was 1%. It was absolutely superb, which actually introduced ethical problems when the arterial switch was, was first introduced because the mortality was closer to 25% for the very early arterial switch operation. So that was problematic. And, but there is this late, slow decrement in, in outcomes, and that's because of what you've all alluded to. This is repeated measures data based on thousands of echoes on the Toronto series of patients showing the progressive uh, um, uh, dysfunction of the subaortic systemic right ventricle, the progressive dilatation of this chamber uh, as patients age, and um, together with that, the pro progressive decline in VO2 max that these patients exhibit over time, and also the increased progression of tricuspid regurgitation. And as Peter Roma said, we never know whether it's the chicken or egg or the egg. Certainly in some patients, it precedes the ventricular dysfunction. In others, it's the opposite. And in the third group, you simply don't know. And these translate into progressively rising risk of 
decompensated heart failure as shown by these completed risks plots. Occasionally, we'll, we'll try to, when patients do start to fail, um, we're always looking for non-advanced therapy options that we can do to try to improve their physiology. So as you've heard, some will present with arrhythmias uh, that, uh, that lead to uh, uh, decompensation of the symptoms. So we're trying to improve that inefficiency. Some will present with AV valve problems and a small proportion, probably smaller than should undergo this, um, will undergo AV valve uh, replacements. And also a, few, a small proportion undergo transplantation. And certainly this, this proportion of patients should be much, much higher. And as I've said previously, my main professional gripe is the, uh, the disproportionate, disproportionately poor access that, that complex adult congenital heart patients have to advanced therapies, whether it be VADS or transplants. So this is the problem. And um, this is why everyone should be considered earlier rather than later for, for the next step. And that is because, yes, we know the RV uh, dysfunction is poor. We know the tricuspid valve is often, often regurgitant, and these lead to decompensated heart failure. But often when these patients present with symptoms and are investigated, their PA pressures are, are already so high that transplantation options are extremely unappealing or even precluded completely. That's the main problem. And a lot of these patients, I think, should be investigated much, much earlier. In fact, I think there's a strong case for screening um, atrial switch patients in their 30s for silent elevated pulmonary hypertension, because that really greatly affects the longer term decision making. The other silent thing that is worth tracking over time is people's PRAs, the panel reactive antibodies, because sensitization, especially in women who have been through pregnancies after atrial switch operations, can be a major deal breaker um, and factor into decision making later on. Um, once a patient presents, the first step, as you've heard, is medical optimization, looking for arrhythmia problems that can be mitigated. And then, as Dr. Hermes mentioned, other uh, things that can be uh, improved. And um, Dr. Gins mentioned baffle leaks, baffle obstructions, these sorts of things. Once those are addressed, and, and CRT is another upstream um, uh, uh, strategy that we would try to improve. But once those things are optimized and you're really looking at, okay, there's nothing else we can optimize. These are the main options that, that patients have available to them. Um, they're not highlighting any particular color for any reason. I'll just get whiz through them. One option that is often mentioned, but is um, uh, pursued not, not that often, is to take down from the mustard and do an arterial switch, a late switch. And in somebody who's got established pulmonary hypertension, that is potentially an option because your subpulmonary left ventricle by that stage may well be trained enough. And we have done three of these in the Toronto series over time, so not very many, but the outcomes are actually pretty good. Um, yes, two have subsequently died, but this is many, many years after their takedown and switch was undertaken, and one of them remains alive. Um, this is almost over 20 years now um, of, um, uh, after the fact. So it is something to consider, although most centers will, will see it as rather unappealing. Heart transplantation, if the PA pressures are, are excessive, is not, a good, is, is not um, uh, immediately on the table. The third option is conservative management. Um, the fourth is, very, is also unappealing. It's, these are high-risk heart and lung transplants. Or finally, what about ventricular assist devices? Well, we know that in other settings, just going to switch. We know that in other settings, we know that in other settings, um, VADs can be used as a bridge to candidacy in the left ventricle in normal anatomy. The PA pressures gradually reduce uh, with time. And so it's logical that you might try this in this uh, reversed uh, physiology with a sub aortic right ventricle. And we were in close collaboration with the Newcastle group at that time, Asifa San and David Crossland, who had already, this is some old data, but at that time they'd done six subaortic RVADs, specifically as a bridge to candidacy in these patients with pulmonary hypertension. And the, the, the significant majority of them exhibited declines in 
PA pressures and became transplant eligible. So we uh, in Toronto did five of these over the past uh, eight, nine years or so, um, and all five of them became transplant eligible. Um, one actually declined because she was doing so well with her VAD that she preferred not to undergo another big operation and instead live with her, with her VAD. And four of these did undergo transplantation. And at Texas Children's in the last uh, nine, ten months or so, uh, we've done three of these subaortic RVADs as a to candidacy or DT. Um, and one is currently being uh, discussed for possible transplantation. The other two are at home and rehabilitating and doing well. To be frank, it's more likely they will remain destination therapy due to comorbidities. But the point is, when you put this all together, these subaortic RVADs do offer a good strategy in these patients who have very uh, unappealing alternative options available, and the vast bulk of them will become transplant eligible um, with this strategy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hickey. That, that was a magnificent presentation. Um, we, it's, it's impressive how much uh, we have advanced in the last few years to offer our patients with more options. And as always, the care of these adult congenital heart disease patients calls for innovation all the time. Um, we have some questions from the audience. Uh, the first one for Dr. Gind. Um, what do, how do we diagnose baffle obstruction? Is, what imaging modality is preferred? That's not enough. Uh, you, know, you have a clinical suspicion that someone has evidence, I, you know, it's a bit rare, but if they have evidence of swelling in the upper body at all, raised jugular vein pressure. Um, low oxygen saturations would make you think of a, of a that, you know, a standard atrial switch patient shouldn't have low oxygen saturation. That would make you think of a baffle leak. Or if there was any little congestion, lower pulmonary spleen, then echocardiography. So that's tricky. You got to um, be there with the tech, show them how to get the views of the SVC and the IVC. You can see the IVC pretty easily on most patients. The SVC baffle is uh, a bit more difficult. And then MR, if they don't have a device, um, will show you stenosis. CT, if they can't get an MRI for some reason, can show the baffle baffles pretty well. But again, you need to kind of be there to uh, help the techs get the pictures. Then CT if necessary and CAT if necessary. There's no other way to do it. And then bubble studies for, for um, baffle leak. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gins. And um, as, as Dr. Gins mentioned, is a stepwise approach, clinical suspicion, echocardiography, and, and, and then we if there is high clinical suspicion, we, we continue with cross-sectional imaging and cath until we find that, like Dr. Hermes said, sometimes these issues are very hard to diagnose and we should look for them um, compulsively. Uh, we have another question from the audience. I think there is some confusion uh, regarding what's the difference between D-loop transposition of the great arteries and L-loop transposition. Um, Dr. Madan, can, would you mind help us, helping us clarify the difference between um, D-loop transposition and L-loop transposition for our audience? We, I think there is some confusion. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, my nurse actually developed this uh, algorithm for simplifying it in her own brain, so I'm going to use her algorithm. So, you know, the D we all know is dextro, you know, we probably learned in chemistry. So D is dextro, L is levo, D refer means right, and it, D refers to the position of the right ventricle. And L, D in D or L loop, they all refer to the position of the right ventricle. So in D transposition, the right ventricle is on the right side. In L transposition, again L, position of the right ventricle, the right ventricle is on the left side. Um, and uh, it, so you may remember in, in your initial slide, you showed that the 
Right atrium connects to right ventricle, left atrium connects to left ventricle in the transposition. But now since the okay. um, ventricles are switched in the L transposition or L loop, uh, the right atrium connects to the left ventricle and vice versa on the other side. Um, probably better to show with pictures. Um, I can uh, probably find something if uh, there is enough time um, just to clarify it. Tommy, do you think that will help you, Dr. Ma? The slide um, is up. I, the slide is up? Okay, hold on a second then. Where's the slide? Yeah, let me see the slide. So, um, so this is the deep transposition where the the connection between the atria and the ventricles is still the same as what you would expect from the normal heart, but in the L transposition, the ventricles are also switched. And that's that's basically the problem. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Madan. For Dr. Hiki, what does the evaluation for a bad ventricular assist device and transplant look like for a patient? Is it a lengthy process? Um, can, you, can you walk us through so our patients can get a, a broad idea about what it entails? Yes. So, so I think the first, um, the first sign that a patient is struggling or decompensated or the first suspicion of that um, would usually be, happen in a, an ACHD cardiologist clinic. So say Peter Ermis's clinic, he has the first suspicion that a patient's trajectory, so he knows this patient very well and he sees them every maybe three to six months and gets serial periodic BNPs and weights and what have you and just detects that something's not quite right with this patient for exercise tolerance or something is, is reduced. He would then start getting some objective data maybe to support that. So a cardiopulmonary exercise test, some serial blood data on things like BNPs and such like, and uh, might then uh, obviously getting routine echoes, but might then get a cath to, to look at things like uh, filling pressures inside the heart and pulmonary artery pressures, all objective data that things have changed and, um, and therefore we should be thinking about the next step. Usually at that juncture, Cardiologists and, and, and surgeons like myself work extremely closely together. So he would immediately flag up that he has a patient that he's slightly concerned about. And we haven't necessarily in, pulled the trigger for full-blown uh, assessments for transplant or what have you. But at that juncture, I would normally be seeing the patient as well. Um, really to, in my mind, detect or work out the risk stratification of these various options um, and how the patient might tolerate it. And uh, if, we, if I think um, that this is possible, that this is possibly a route that uh, we should go down with, with, with this patient in front of us, then at that juncture, we would normally trigger a multi-D assessment for either VAD or transplantation. And that is a, it's not a long drawn out process, but it involves lots of different COGS coming together, giving their assessment. So for example, yes, I would be assessing the patient. Yes, an ACHD cardiologist would be, but my ACHD intensivist would be seeing the patient because they're adjudicating and trying to predict the perioperative intensive care journey for that patient. I would have an ACHD anesthetist that I work very closely with see the patient. We would have our nutrition patients, uh, nutrition uh, experts see the patient because we want to precondition as best we can from a nutrition point of view. We would have OTPT assess the patient because they're thinking about early rehabilitation and obstacles that might uh, get in the way. Um, and so all these various specialties would be assessing the patient. If it was more likely for a VAD route, um, then my VAD coordinators would also be seeing the patient and, I, and, um, and we'd discuss uh, uh, with our, our full VAD team as well. Um, we would... Uh, one of our heart failure cardiologists would be involved seeing the patient um, and making sure we had up-to-date PRAs for sensitization and what have you. So lots of people would assess the patient, but it's not necessarily a long drawn out process. And then with all of those opinions and data, uh, we then 
hold a conference discussion, um, as we do with all our complex uh, ACHD patients, to then adjudicate, firstly, are there any non-advanced therapy strategies that we can offer upstream of this? And if not, what is the most appropriate next step? Is it continued medical management? Is it other, non uh, other non-cardiac therapies that can help the patient? Is it uh, VAD, VAD options or is it transplantation? So that's how the journey would look like. It doesn't need to be a long one, but it is a very thoughtful uh, process involving many, many individuals from many specialties. Thank you, Dr. Hickey, very clear. Um, I have another question for you from the audience. How frequently should we cast our patients to look for pulmonary hypertension? And another question is, have you, do you have experience using CarioMEMS for monitoring? Um, so, no, no, I don't is the answer to the second question. But in terms of CATH, um, no one knows is the answer how frequently. There's no, if you're looking for any sort of guidelines or data, you won't find any. It simply doesn't exist. Um, but I would say there's a strong case for patients um, in their, sometime in their 30s, having a diagnostic catheter to um, document, uh, get some objective documentation of filling pressures and PA uh, pressures, and also, as I said, PRAs, because it really does factor into the decision making in the long term. For example, if you're if you're pretty sensitized but not critically, then you really want to actively try to avoid any procedures or transfusions that might jeopardize that and increase your sensitization to very concerning levels, as an example. Um, in Toronto, we were giving serious thought. In fact, we were initiating uh, catheter screening uh, assessments of all atrial switch patients at around about the age of 35 um, for, the, for this very reason. I, 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 to be honest, I think there's a lot of credence for doing so. In terms of repeated cats, I don't think you can justify, you know, for example, annual cats or anything like that. I think we, we then rely on serial echo estimates of your um, subpulmonary ventricle pressure. Thank you so much, Dr. Hickey. And I think with that, we're running out of time. So I would like to thank our exceptional panelists, Dr. Gins, Dr. Madan, Dr. Hickey, Dr. Hermes. Thank you so much for joining us today and helping our patients and our providers learn more about the care of patients with adult congenital heart disease. Thank you. So this has been a fantastic day. Thank you for um, our wonderful speakers and panelists, and thank you for the wonderful questions from our audience. You guys have been fantastic in terms of your engagement. Um, for those of you who are interested, Dr. Hickey and Dr. Ermis gave an excellent Grand Rounds presentation just on Thursday. You can find it on our YouTube channel. You can learn a lot more about the details of, uh, of treatment of these uh, complicated patients. In addition um, to the patient's perspective, uh, just last week we also had a session with um, Ashley Reef and one of our uh, transposition patients who recently underwent transplant. Um, so that's also on our YouTube channel on CV Debakey Live. We're going to take a half an hour break now um, and we'll uh, restart at 1030 Central Time, at which point we're going to be talking about Fontan-associated liver disease. We'll see you soon. <laughs>
Oh, yes. Sorry. Um, you can open up, Tom, if you want. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're going to be spending the next session talking about uh, the Fontan operation and liver disease. Uh, and again, we want this to be, as it has been so far this morning, an engaging and interactive experience. So all of you watching uh, at home or at uh, the office or wherever, you can uh, uh, go to pollev.com and type in DeBakey, uh, or you can uh, text us your questions. Uh, please text DeBakey, D-E-B-A-K-E-Y, to 37607. So with that, uh, I'll ask Valeria to kick us off. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McGillivray. Um, as Dr. McGillivray mentioned, we're going to uh, we're going to hit a key topic in ACHD today. We're going to talk about patients with Fontan who have liver disease. For that, we have a magnificent group of panelists. So I would like to welcome Dr. David Victor from the Houston Methodist Hepatology Service, Dr. Lace al Shawabki from the University of California in San Diego, and Chris Donald from Louisiana. She is an ACHD nurse practitioner and she's also a patient who will give us her perspective. So as you may know, many different anatomies can lead to a single ventricle physiology. We have here a couple of examples in, in MRI pictures. This is a double inlet left ventricle where both atria drain into the left ventricle and the other ventricle, the right, is rudimentary. So this functions as a single ventricle. On the other hand, we have another example of single ventricle physiology with tricuspid atresia. As you can see here, we have a normal mitral valve, but the tricuspid valve is uh, atretic, and with that, the right ventricle is hypoblastic which leave us with a single left ventricle. So how do we approach this, these patients? Dr. McGillivray is going to discuss with us the different types of Fontan operations. But just briefly, if we have a single ventricle, we commit it to the, aor to the aorta. We commit it to pump to the systemic circulation. And with that, we bypass the heart in, in most of these operations with, when we divert the blue blood coming from the lower body up the IVC, the inferior vena cava, in the upper body down the SVC, the superior vena cava, we connect these two main veins to, directly to the pulmonary artery. With that, the circulation from the systemic veins to the PAs, the pulmonary arteries, is completely passive. This leads to an increase in pressure in the systemic veins. So the IVC pressure and the SVC pressure are higher than in a normal patient. As, as you know, the liver, the, the veins from the liver, drain to the IVC. So the chronically elevated high IVC pressures in patients with Fontan leads to, is transmitted to the liver vessels and leads to passive congestion. The passive congestion leads to edema and fibrosis. And the liver cells start to shrink. And this can, over time, leave, lead to bridging fibrosis and cirrhosis of the liver. So these patients are very, very complex. So I'm going to start by asking Dr. Victor, our transplant hepatology expert, to walk us through his, the signs or symptoms of these patients. What's the workup for, liver, uh, for the liver in patients with Fontan? And when do we start thinking about liver transplant as well? Dr. Victor? 
Oh, we're having issues hearing him. Thank you all very much for having Great. me. Perfect. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this very complicated uh, situation. First of all, one of the difficulties with Fontan or any kind of cirrhosis or con uh, complex hepatic disease is that it's largely virtual in that you don't see the evidence of the damage until it becomes uh, profound and the liver is uh, insufficient to handle the volume or pressures that it's developing. So one of the things that we have to do in this uh, situation is try to identify patients early. There currently is no consensus for Fontan associated liver disease uh, on timing to determine fibrosis. So in some recent articles, they've proposed that after 10 years with a Fontan, even if doing well, uh, there, you should have a liver biopsy to establish uh, if there is fibrosis. That's not uh, consistent across all programs. In ours, we try to look for patients early who have any kind of imaging uh, changes. So you may see that they have uh, heterogeneous uh, livers on ultrasound or that they begin to show signs that the spleen is enlarging from uh, increased back pressure. This does not mean that they have cirrhosis per se. It means that we need to begin to assess their liver disease. We can use non-invasive monitoring, even though these uh, measures aren't standardized to tell you what degree of fibrosis it has. We can begin to uh, establish a baseline for a patient and monitor them going forward with either MRI or ultrasound. If you do find someone with cirrhosis where you will have a large spleen, perhaps uh, they will have muscle wasting ascites of the abdomen, that's when we need to begin to consider do we need to start looking for potential uh, liver transplant or begin to screen them for cancers that can develop in cirrhosis? The one thing I do tell all of the patients I deal with is that cirrhosis is a manageable medical condition that does not mean their liver is going to fail immediately. And we can watch them for many uh, years in some cases uh, with the help of our cardiology colleagues to try to decrease their uh, afterload or right-sided pressures as able. One of the things I also uh, want to do in all patients with liver disease is do a formal evaluation of their pressures with a transjugular liver biopsy if we are going around for biops. Um, cirrhosis can, does not mean they need a liver transplant, but we do need to consider and begin a screening for uh, liver cancers in all patients who have advanced or near cirrhosis on biops. Does that help uh, answer kind of the question of what to do? Yes, yes. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Victor. And I think we'll come back to you because we are already receiving questions. Um, so Dr. Victor explained what liver disease means in the context of a Fontan circulation. So once, once our patients are developing certain le level of liver dysfunction, the question is, is there anything we can do from a medical or transcatheter or surgical perspective uh, to help them, to help slow down progression? So let's move to Dr. Leith al Shawaki from UCSD in San Diego and he will help us uh, learn more about the medical and transcatheter options for these patients. Dr. al Shawabki. Thank you, Dr. Duarte, and thank you uh, for the organizing committee. Um, this is a perfect time for me to present because it's raining outside in San Diego <laughs> and it's early in the morning, so I've got nothing better uh, to do for sure. Uh, this is very exciting and uh, we have fantastic uh, audience uh, with a lot of questions coming in. So we will be answering the questions after the uh, uh, short presentation. So please uh, keep the questions uh, coming. I'll share my uh, screen. All right, so what is, what is a Fontana? I'm gonna, Dr. Duarte explained very nicely um, 
but I will focus from the context of management in terms of interventions and medications. So we have um, someone who's born with a single ventricle. What does that mean? It means that unlike a normal heart, which has four fully developed chambers, a single ventricle is, is a whole host of different uh, diagnoses where um, basically there is a functioning single pumping chamber uh, in the bottom of the heart, but they do have often two upper chambers. So technically it's three chambers, but we are referring to the bottom or ventricular chambers when we say single ventricle instead of two uh, pumping chambers. So what's the solution for that? The solution is the Fontan circulation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So what the Fontan basically achieves is uh, diverting the blue blood, which otherwise was mixing and causing a purple color, as you saw in the previous diagram, or the patient saturation to be low. Um, the idea is to separate the blue blood from the red blood. Um, and the way to do that is by creating the Fontan baffle or the Fontan circulation, connecting it directly to the arteries that go directly to the lungs. Whereas the heart, think of it as, as basically a single pumping chamber that is pumping to the body. Um, I, I think we get hung up too much sometimes um, thinking about what's happening inside the heart. And that's a point of confusion uh, when people are trying to understand the Fontan physiology. It is relevant to what happens in the heart. But essentially, if you uh, leave this talk knowing that, okay, I have a single pumping chamber pumping to the aorta of the body, and the blue blood flows passively to the lungs, uh, then that should be good. And this is a, a diagram of what happens in an MRI showing basically the flow that I just explained to you, where the systemic veins are flowing to the lungs and the heart is pumping uh, to the aorta. But we're talking also today about the liver. Why is the liver important? Well, the liver sits here. In order for the Fontan circulation to work, um, you really have to have higher pressure in the systemic veins. Whereas normally the pressure is around one to three millimeters mercury in a normal heart, with a Fontan, it could be as high as 15 or 20 millimeters mercury. So that's a significant increase compared to our normal anatomy. And subsequent to that, the liver passively sees that pressure. So since the Fontan is created, the patient is under, or the liver is under constant pressure that is above um, what it's expected. And with time, fibrosis or scarring, micro scarring inside the liver happens. And this process is heterogeneous, as Dr. Victor said, which means that it's variable from person to person. And that's why you have to individualize care and when you're looking at imaging or biopsy or cath and so forth. So what are some of the issues that are available or the tools that are available at our disposal to manage the Fontan circulation? Well, we have catheter interventions. Uh, can think of them as minimally invasive, where somebody goes from the groin or the wrist or the neck with a catheter that is threaded to the heart, the Fontan circuit, and they deliver different devices and stents, uh, or sometimes just to sample the pressure or do a biopsy. There's also a hybrid approach where people do surgical or open surgery via small incision, and at the same time, a catheter intervention. And obviously, uh, an open heart operation uh, is, uh, everybody's familiar with that. Uh, but also, we also have to think about transplant. Dr. McGilvery talked uh, briefly and Dr. Hickey about how it's important to think about transplant in the background before venturing into any complex intervention or a surgical approach for people with Fontan circulation. And how would that affect that patient down the line should they require a transplant? Generally speaking, catheter interventions are restricted to the Fontan circulation or the pulmonary arteries that go to the lungs and also uh, the aorta, um, and, whereas the surgical interventions most of the time are required to repair stuff that is inside the heart chamber itself, although they can also work obviously on the Fontan circulation. So surgery can do pretty much, uh, can access anything 
uh, whereas catheter interventions historically have been restricted to the Fontan circuit, not inside the heart itself. But more recently, um, you know, people with normal anatomy have had substantial advancement in catheters and devices that are available to them uh, to do valve repairs, uh, to close holes, and so forth uh, via catheters. And recently, we've done some of these complex procedures in patients with complex congenital heart disease and single ventricle physiology. Um, and this is one of the examples where it's a clip that is placed um, in a leaky valve, um, and the idea is to approximate the leaflets to prevent regurgitation. I have to emphasize this is a, um, a procedure or device for patients with congenital heart disease. For, for us, it's um, experimental, hasn't been approved. Uh, however, we have used it uh, in palliative situations where surgery is not an option. You really have to do a lot of work before you take someone to uh, the cath lab uh, to do these kind of procedures in terms of do, doing 3D printing and, and modeling uh, to understand exactly whether this uh, procedure is feasible for that particular patient. So um, I would like to leave you with this flow diagram. I think most patients um, and even uh, non-congenital providers are not aware of what happens in the background uh, in the care for patients with Fontan circulation. And what happens in the background is, uh, before any patient, if you are being cared for at an adult congenital heart disease center um, of excellence, um, then before you undergo cath, surgery, uh, or transplant, uh, it's a very lengthy process. And what happens in the background is that um, your doctor or adult congenital cardiologist will see you and then we'll take that information to the committee. And the committee consists with se from several uh, physicians, including the liver doctor uh, for the Fontan specifically, interventional team, surgeons, electrophysiologists, heart failure, transplant cardiologists, um, coordinators, social workers. And um, in several institutions like ours, uh, we meet regularly every week and we discuss patients before they undergo any type of intervention. And the idea is that to bring everybody on board with that complex uh, endeavor. Uh, but also, if the patient is up to undergo that procedure, then everybody is aware of that patient in case a complication happens. And then we have, for example, the support from the, uh, our surgical colleagues or from our heart failure transplant uh, colleagues um, if any complications occur. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Ashawabki. Um, I already have a question for uh, Dr. Victor. Dr. Victor, what is an acceptable mean hepatic vein wedge pressure for a Fontan patient? And, and what are the implications for management? So if I could answer a acceptable range, uh, I can tell you that if we can get a gradient, which is the wedged hepatic pressure to the free uh, less than six, we're always happy. Over six is a sign that there is portal hypertension within the liver or in the sinusoidal damage. So in a Fontan procedure, the lower the better with maximized heart function. And that's really the challenge is that there is no standard guideline or gradation because of the variability in both surgery, surgeries the anatomy, uh, and uh, the patient itself. The more important question, largely, is the degree of fibrosis that the patient has uh, in the liver. In our practice, we have to individualize to each person as these uh, adult congenital patients uh, all have quite different anatomy, as uh, our last speaker uh, intimated. So I don't have a defined answer. But if you keep your pressure below six from the gradient, you uh, are less likely to develop fibrosis. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Victor. So after we discuss and, and pursue all the medical and percutaneous approaches that Dr. al uh, clearly um, outlined, if our patients are still having issues, then surgical considerations start to be discussed. So I'm going to ask uh, Dr.
Tom McGillivray to give us the surgeon's perspective on the Fontan circulation and hip liver disease associated to Fontan circulation, specifically when do we think about heart and liver transplant? Thanks very much, Valeria. And thanks to the speakers so far, they've been terrific. And I think like most of the issues that we deal with in adult congenital heart disease, our solutions to early problems, although they solve the early problems, oftentimes are part of the problem that we develop later on. And so it, it's a solution, problem, solution, problem, solution, problem. And that's, that's kind of the recurrent theme that we have. So when we talk about the, the uh, Fontan procedure, uh, it's interesting that there, there really isn't a true Fontan procedure. It's a set of different uh, operations that are actually a culmination of a series of procedures. Uh, we learned from uh, Dr. Duarte and from Leith uh, about why you would need to do a Fontan operation. I need to advance my, oh, there we go. Uh, so as one of my uh, wonderful uh, congenital heart disease teachers, Stella Van Prague once said, it's not how it looks, it how it it's how it works that really matters. And regardless of whether you have a single right ventricle, single left ventricle, what the cardiac anatomy is, the principle behind the Fontan procedures are that you, as Leith pointed out, the pump is used to pump blood around the systemic circulation. And we set up a series of connections for the blood returning uh, the, uh, from the body back to the lungs. And so the classic Fontan uh, is actually usually the third operation that gets done in the series of operations. First operation is usually either a shunt or a banding procedure. The second operation is usually a Glen operation that sews the uh, superior vena cava to the, uh, to the uh, pulmonary artery. And then the Fontan kinds of procedures describe any number of different operations that connect the inferior vena cava blood return to the pulmonary artery. So when Dr. Fontan, Francois Fontan, in the 70s did his classic Fontan operation, that's essentially, he, it was an atrial to pulmonary uh, communication. Uh, and with the increasing pressure uh, that's required to drive that blood forward, what we learned was that the right atrium would get uh, dilated, the blood flow through that atrium would become uh, uh, very sluggish, you'd get clots that would form, and you could uh, embolize those clots. Uh, with the distended atrium, uh, those patients uh, were and are prone to developing uh, irregular atrial rhythms, which made the blood flow uh, even that much more uh, impaired. Uh, the next iteration of that was what we refer to as the lateral tunnel, and that's the picture in the middle. Uh, and uh, what uh, that operation is, is rather than sewing just the atrium to the pulmonary artery, a tube is made inside the atrium with some kind of patch material. And anywhere between 180 degrees to 270 degrees, of the circumference of that intraatrial tube or lateral tunnel is made up from the, the patch material. It's better than a, uh, an atrial pulmonary classic Fontan, but still puts stretch on the, uh, the native heart uh, tissue and does make it prone to develop uh, atrial arrhythmias. The extracardiac Fontan essentially takes the atrium out of that circulation. A tube uh, of any number of different kinds of materials are sewn directly to the inferior vena cava, uh, which is disconnected from the, my magic wand isn't working as well, which is disconnected from the atrium and is, the other end of the tube is sewn directly uh, to the pulmonary artery. And that, at least in theory, should prevent the atrium from getting distended. Uh, it should uh, 
decrease the risk of the distended pressurized atrium from getting irregular heart rhythms, atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, and decrease the risk of uh, developing um, uh, clots that can form and can embolize. Uh, and so over the last uh, 40 years, patients who have had Fontan operations can have any one of these many configurations uh, in, um, uh, out there having had a Fontan operation. So the first question to ask is what kind of Fontan has the patient had in terms of how he moved forward? If the issue is a distended uh, uh, atrium that's decreased in the amount of flow uh, and, with the, and with the higher pressure, one of the things that you can do is you can do a Fontan conversion. And if that uh, patient had had a classic atrial pulmonary Fontan or had a lateral tunnel Fontan, um, even in the adult, you can go in and create an extra cardiac Fontan do arrhythmia surgery, a kind of ablation, uh, and in the absence of significant liver disease, uh, that's a pretty good operation for patients uh, with, uh, to convert them from a classic Fontan to an extra cardiac conduit. The problem is, is that, uh, and the topic of this session, is the impact of the liver disease. Heart surgery in patients who have significant liver disease the risk of surgery is very, very high. Uh, and so that has always been a concern. And for many patients, uh, it has been a, a, a prohibitive uh, risk for undergoing surgery, including uh, transplantation, which I'll get into in a minute. I mean, heart transplantation is a very good uh, solution for somebody who has end-stage heart disease congenital or from acquired heart disease. It makes kind of at least good surgical sense. Something's not working, take it out and replace it with one that is. And I think over the years, we have had very good success with heart transplants for end-stage liver disease. The problem with patients who have congenital heart disease is that many of these patients have had a number of different operations that make the scar tissue uh, and the anatomy uh, a more complicated operation. Depending upon what the underlying heart disease is, many of these patients have uh, increased pulmonary vascular resistance, which uh, is, a, uh, is a reason that you can't get a heart transplant. You might be able to get a heart-lung transplant. And this year, we've done five patients at our center with uh, congenital heart disease. We've treated them successfully with heart-lung transplants. Because of a lot of the operations that people have had, and Dr. Hickey had touched on this in the previous session, uh, patients can have a lot of immune response from the previous operations and uh, blood that they may have received or patches that have been put in that would make them not be able to receive from immunologic reasons uh, a heart transplant. What we've learned uh, over time in patients uh, who have heart transplants that patients with congenital heart disease, and specifically patients who have had Fontan-type operations, they, those patients are at increased risk for poor outcomes uh, with heart transplant. And, and, and those have been predominantly centered around the risk from the liver disease. And it's kind of a paradox, because this is data, this, uh, these graphs are from the uh, International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation. And these are the outcomes for patients who have received heart transplants over the years. And if you look in the yellow, that yellow line, those are patients with congenital heart disease. And as I mentioned, their risk in the early phases are much higher than many other kinds of patients who have heart transplants. That being said, if you can get those patients through the early phases of heart transplant, their long-term outcomes are better than any patient groups that have transplantation. And, and, uh, and again, if we, could, if we could solve the issue of the liver disease, the Fontan patients could uh, hopefully benefit from those long-term outcomes. And there has been increasing interest with the use of combined organ transplants. So 
transplanting not just the heart, but also the liver uh, in patients who have had Fontan operations or Fontan-like operations. Uh, in, at least in theory, you would think, wow, that's a very big operation. The risk of that must be very high, and the outcome of that uh, very uh, worrisome. Uh, the risk of rejection with one organ, let alone two organs, that would potentially double the risk of rejection. And what we've found is actually just the opposite. The risk of rejection is lower over time, and that the outcomes can be quite excellent if done at centers with the expertise. And this is a report uh, looking at the uh, ISHLT, uh, excuse me, the UNOS uh, database, looking at patients who have had combined heart-liver transplants, not from congenital heart disease, uh, and patients who have had combined heart-liver transplants with congenital heart disease, and comparing that with patients who have congenital heart disease who have just received uh, heart transplants. And at least in this small matched group of patients, the outcomes from combined heart-liver transplant, both with congenital heart disease and without congenital heart disease, are actually quite impressively good. Uh, and compared with those patients who have had heart transplants with congenital heart disease and not receiving liver transplants, uh, not as good. Uh, so so I, I would say that this isn't the answer. This is very compelling information that may provide the answer for us as we move forward, as we have uh, more experience with these very complicated patients. Wonderful, Tom. And let me ask you a question. Is there, this, this is a very complex endeavor, of course. And are there things we can do to optimize the outcomes in preparation for Fontan surgery or Fontan-related transplant? So, so those are very good questions. That's a very good question, Valeria. And I think that uh, uh, it is, as, as Dr. Hickey pointed out uh, earlier in the, in the day, uh, there re as much as we would like to think, from, a, from the surgeon's point of view, that our operation is going to be the final solution to the patient's problem. More likely than not, that is not going to be the case. So it is important to do the best operation you can for that problem at the time, but also think forward to how you can set the stage, if necessary, for further interventions in the cath lab, uh, further interventions either with other procedures or, or a transplant. So being very careful about how you reconstruct the anatomy, trying to be very, very conservative with blood, transplant, uh, blood transfusions, uh, getting people as optimized for the operation and, and after the operation. There, there is debate in the surgical community, even to this day, whether an extra cardiac conduit is better than a lateral tunnel. I, I don't think that answer, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we have that answer yet, uh, but, but, I, but I do think that we should be continuously trying to find those answers uh, and, and setting up not only when we, when we take care of individual patients, but using the information from individual patients as part of a registry so that we can answer the bigger question with a number of patients. Can I compliment uh, what uh, Dr. McGillivray said? Um, you know, from the patient side, I think of uh, one of the most critical risk factors for any uh, endeavor uh, is obesity. Uh, so being overweight uh, puts substantial risk uh, to the heart in general, especially if you have a single ventricle and have had the Fontan circulation. And it just makes any cath, surgery, transplant evaluation much, much, much harder. Um, anecdotally, we've had a couple of occurrences where some patients who had severe calcitrant heart failure improved after um, bariatric surgery. I'm not advocating for bariatric surgery as a solution. Uh, obviously, prevention or um, non-invasive means of weight loss uh, are going to be critical. And um, I, I would say I know we're cardiologists here, but this is something that we deal with every day in the clinic. 
and it just puts so much pressure and so many restrictions in what we can offer um, that I would urge every patient and their providers to um, address obesity head on because that if there, it is an intervention that you can do that will prolong this patient's life and potentially uh, reduce their complications and the need for these complex therapies and perhaps push them further down the line. Leith, I want to say that uh, that's maybe the nicest compliment anybody has called me, sort of confusing me with being a cardiologist and perhaps only secondary to being called a hepatologist. <laughs> and so, uh, Dr. Victor, you speak so eloquent, eloquently, <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, I, I would put you a little bit more towards the cardiology bucket, uh, Tom. Dr. Victor, we have a question. What kinds of therapies can be used in these patients to slow down the progression of liver disease? Are there, are there any? Yes, uh, there are growing literature that some of the uh, pulmonary hypertension uh, medicines and phosphodiesterase can happen. But uh, we'll echo what has already been said, that the most uh, effective way to slow down the progression of liver disease is modifiable risk factors, whether that's uh, obesity, alcohol use, uh, certain medications, making sure that everything is as good as it can be with the rest of the host yeah. is vitally important because if you have one punch from the Fontan causing the problem and you add another, it's doubling the uh, damage to the liver itself. So we try to really work on lifestyle, diet, preventing other modifiable risk factors to prevent slowdown. The Fontan is a, um, associated liver disease is a uh, uh, success uh, and uh, the fallout of that. So the successful operation, and the, the cardiologist will say that your Fontan is doing great, your liver is the problem, and it's all entwined. So what we try to do to prevent it is we make sure that the patients are doing nothing to harm their liver on the other end. So Dr. Victor, what kind of imaging uh, do you routinely do? And uh, I'll expand. That was a question from the audience. I'll expand on that and ask you, um, in some of the patients who cannot get an MRI due to the presence of a pacemaker, uh, what is your decision tree in terms of imaging? So number one is MRI because everyone, it gives a global picture of the liver and you can do both fat quantification, which I think is uh, underrepresented in the cardiac literature, but allows you to see if there's secondary fat and also allows you to do transient elastography, uh, which will give you a degree of fibrosis. That will probably be uh, too high. It, the, the standards we set are uh, impacted by congestion. So um, we typically like that. However, what I find most effective in my patients is longitudinal elastography measurement of whatever flavor they can get, whether that's MRI, I use uh, transient elastography in the office if they are not uh, obese, that seems to work well. But the standards that come spitting out on the uh, report, you have to prepare your patient that it's likely going to say more advanced fibrosis than their biopsy had because of the congestion that we see. So what I try to do is find a baseline after biopsy. If anyone has ever come to my office, they're willing to undergo biopsy and have had a Fontan longer than 10 years, which uh, most of them have, we offer biopsy. If they decline, then we have set a baseline and follow that on a yearly basis. If there's evidence of cirrhosis by uh, appearance of the liver, I put them in an HCC or hepatocellular carcinoma screening uh, because I'm concerned that we may see uh, a mass develop and without biopsy, or even with a biopsy, saying moderate fibrosis, if you have uh, signs that there could be a focus of advanced fibrosis, we try to ensure that we're screening them from that. My decision tree is it has to be individualized because I'm not dealing with one operation uh, a lot of the time. So we try to set a baseline and follow that over time with the patient. I think that temporal relationships with their elastography measurements uh, are good to see if it's progressing or if you need to uh, repeat biopsy. Biopsy is not a bad thing in the liver, even though it does have a complication rate of about bleeding at about one in 2,000.
Thank you so much, Dr. Victor. Uh, we're going to move on to ask our panelist, Chris Donald, to teach us and teach our patients and providers what does a patient with a single ventricle and fontan need to know about their liver? Good morning. Thank you all so much for inviting me today. Um, I'm Chris. I'm a, a pediatric cardiology nurse in West Monroe, Louisiana. I'm also a single ventricle with a fontan. And I think the hardest thing for us as patients is to think that you know, we've had all of our surgery, we've, we follow up with cardiologists all our lives, and we think that's all we need to do, and then we realize that it's not. And so I think that's the biggest struggle is knowing that there's a whole other specialty that we need to open our minds to and go to appointments with. And personally, I did my first liver evaluation a while ago. And um, I think as a patient is you need to talk to your doctor and make sure you choose the right cardiologist or the right nephro uh, liver doctor because not all of them are aware of the anatomy of the Fontan and the effects of the Fontan on the liver. And so if you go to someone who doesn't know what's going on, it, it may not be the best experience. And so that's my thing is not all, if your cardiologist says go to this guy, go there because they know what they're going to, you know, they know what they're looking at. And I think that's the biggest takeout for this is trust who your cardiologist refer you to. Um, that's my big one. Now, the other thing is a lot of us grew up knowing that we should not exercise. I mean, that was a whole huge thing that a lot of the older patients were told, and that's not true. We need to go out, we need to um, exercise, we need to do whatever we can to be able to enjoy our lives. And that means going to our doctor's appointments and, um, and going to see a liver doctor that, you know, is aware of the Fontan circulation. And so my question for some of the other cardiologists is how do you choose who to refer to because this isn't something that's um, been going on for, well, it's been going on for a while, but it's like now we're starting to look into the development of liver. There's no consensus. It's, you, you know, it's a, a new field almost. So how do you choose who to refer to? I can answer that. Um... Here and, and several other programs, people develop the Fontan Clinic. Uh, and the idea of the Fontan Clinic is a combined um, effort between cardiology and hepatology or liver disease. Um, and previous to uh, those liver doctors seeing the patient, I mean, there's a lot of talks about protocols and, and you know, we talk a lot amongst each other. Uh, and it has to be patient by patient. Um, and as you alluded to, we have a lot of patients who were told you have cirrhosis by uh, hepatologists or liver doctors who just don't see this quite often. Uh, and I see Dr. Victor shaking his head because I'm sure he gets a lot of uh, these referrals. And then there's a lot of finesse to it. And you have to look at each patient separately. Um, so I would say it's pretty well developed at most adult congenital heart disease centers of excellence what to do and the approach for the Fontan uh, liver disease. Um, but let me ask you, Chris, uh, a question about exercise. You know, I've, uh, I don't know about you, but um, in some of my patients, I struggled getting them to exercise mainly because they've been told all their lives, you cannot exercise, you shouldn't exercise, it's bad for you. Uh, and what I found effective was, uh, enrolling them in an exercise program or cardiac rehab uh, where they're being monitored and uh, it just takes time to change that mentality and what does exercise mean? Is it just walking or for every patient? So I think, do you think an, a regimented exercise program or prescription uh, would be more efficacious? So um, I grew up with the mindset that, you know, you could it and then I kind of got bored one day and I found the couch to 5k app and I 
um, got out of the house, started walking my dog, and within nine months, I ran a half marathon. Wow. So I kind of had that just really crazy story, but it, it's one of those, you grew up thinking I could never run, and then, I mean, I was slow, but I did it. And so it's that, that mindset that you can't do it. And it's hard to break because I was 20 before I broke that. Hmm. Um, now it's one of those, now I have a two-year-old, so it's hard, you know, when I'm running and chasing after him. But it's still, it, it has to become part of your life. And that's with everybody, not just with the, but even worse with the Fontan patients. It's, it's hard to take the time to stop and go, oh, I need to exercise. And if you have access to cardiac rehab, I think, or a prescription for that, I think that would be an excellent, excellent idea. Um, I'm in a rural community, so we don't really have that opportunity, but I think promoting it as much as you can and then changing that mindset so that everybody tells their patients, no, you, you really should exercise. It's, you know, it's good for you. It's, it's even if you're out going outside and walking the dog, that's still better than sitting on the couch. And it's, it is hard because I've been there. I've done that. And it was a hard, it's, it's kind of a, just a mindset that you have to break free of. Chris, I, I think the question you asked is probably the most important question maybe of the morning. And that is how do you find the best people? And I think that, I will take exception to what Laith said. Uh, I do think that even some of the best congenital heart programs don't necessarily have the biggest and the busiest transplant programs. Certainly some of the busiest transplant programs don't have uh, big congenital heart disease programs. And, and that, you know, we, knowledge changes fast. Uh, you know, there was a time when we thought that kids with Fontans couldn't exercise. Now we don't feel that way. As you know, I, I think as we all know with the world today, bad news travels in minutes. Good news takes years to get around the world. And, and I think that with the interconnected world that we have, if you're a patient with complex congenital heart disease, there are ways that you can contact and communicate with centers around the country and around the world just to ask questions uh, so that you can learn more about the issues in general and the issues that are specific to you. And, and I would encourage patients and families watching to take advantage of that uh, opportunity. Tom, can I expand on that and say, um, wouldn't you say that uh, it is beneficial for patients when their provider is advising them to do uh, undergo a procedure or you know continue active surveillance. Do you think they should ask them um, what other options are on the table that you think uh, I'll be candidate for here and elsewhere uh, as a starting point? Uh, absolutely, Leith. You know, I think that uh, it's a I think a misconception that many patients have is that they will insult their doctor if they ask about getting a second opinion. Uh, I, I don't, I, you know, myself, if somebody wants to get a second opinion, I think it's a great idea because maybe there's something that I'm not seeing or I'm missing or I don't know that not only the patient, but I can learn from by that patient getting a second opinion. And, and I think that by, by talking about what the alternatives are, it, it broadens the conversation for, for not just what the physician thinks is best for the patient, but importantly, having the patient help decide what's best for them. Uh, and so I, I, I think that the more information, the more knowledge, the more opinions you have, although it can make it a little bit more confusing, I think it can make for a better decision. Thank you. I definitely agree with the willingness to allow our, you know, to recommend that second opinion. Um, it's, it's something that we see as patients is we don't like what we, sometimes we don't like what we hear and then we just don't go to the doctor again. Yeah. And that's what you 
don't want to happen. You want them to, why don't you go talk to this other expert about it? Because then at least they're continuing to get care. Even if they still hear the exact same thing, then they go, oh, well, I really need to do that. Um, I remember when I was pregnant and I knew I couldn't have deliver in the tiny town that I live in. And the question was, where do I go? Do I go somewhere that's an hour and a half away or do I go all the way to New Orleans, which was 300 miles? And so that was a long, long talk. But, you know, we eventually traveled 300 miles and I delivered in a huge center and that was the right choice. And so I think the other thing is as patients is we have to remember you know, yeah, it's not fun to have to travel for care, but sometimes it's the best thing for you and your life is, you know, the most important thing. And so be willing to travel, be willing to um, go seek second opinions. And then, you know, also be willing to understand that they're going to, they may be the exact same as the doctor you have at home. And, you know, you're all working together. Exactly, Chris. I think the key is partnership, partnership amongst providers. Um, the distances sometimes are a strong limitation, but if a patient can follow up longitudinally at an ACHD specialty center and then also have a local provider who has open lines with communi of communications with the ACHD center, then that, that's a, the key for success. Not all our ACHD patients need to move to the nearby, the large centers, but collaboration and partnership is key. And, and like um, echo, I want to echo what you said, looking for a second opinion is always the right thing to do when we are confused and we're not sure about what's going on. And a third one can help too. The most important thing is to make informed decisions. And, and that's always going to be helpful, and patients shouldn't be afraid to discuss that with their providers, like Dr. McGillivray said. And, and as we learned yesterday, we had some great, uh, a great program yesterday. I, I think that patients and families can learn a lot from other patients and other families. That's a tremendous underutilized resource. Uh, I mean, Chris, you're, you're, you're the triple threat. Uh, <laughs> you know, you are a patient, you're a provider, you, know, you are a very knowledgeable expert who can uh, teach patients and their families about what's out there, what to expect. Uh, talking with the doctors, I mean, we, we uh, have a lot of knowledge, we have a lot of information. Your experience um, is, is invaluable and other patients' experiences are very, very valuable to allow patients and families to know what they're, what what the what's going to be like for them when they get a treatment. Yeah. Support groups and patients and families advisory councils are very important, and I think every ACHD program should have one and offer that support to their patients. Dr. Victor, question for you. So. Um, we know that uh, patients who have had Fontaine operations, their liver is never ever completely normal. But is it always so bad that it has to be transplanted? I mean, there is a difference in opinion among the experts about whether somebody should just get a heart transplant or a heart liver transplant. How do we, how do we sort through that? So, uh, it's a challenging question to answer because Two organs uh, require a center that is willing to do uh, combined transplant. And then you want to be a steward to the gift of life from the donor as well. Okay. So it's based around the degree of fibrosis and the degree of portal hypertension that uh, the person is manifesting. As uh, Dr. McGilvery, you mentioned, if the person can't undergo the surgery for a heart alone because their liver will fail, we have not accomplished our goal of right. extending life. Transplantation is only a vehicle for a longer and better life in certain patients. It is not our goal, in my opinion. So how do we decide? It's all based around biopsy and pressure measurements and evidence of portal hypertension 
because there are cases of reversal of uh, cardiac cirrhosis or cardiac fibrosis uh, after the cure of the uh, cardiac issues. And I tell all of the patients that I see because they all feel when they see me that they are, they're, they've done something wrong or their Fontan has failed or they have somehow not been a steward to their own body because they have this. This is a disease of success. Uh, the Fontan procedure has provided a phenomenal mm. quality of life for people. And when you get to see me, don't be scared. Accomplish, be your own advocate and come and ask me the scary questions. Please don't uh, try to be an uh, ostrich and stick your head in the ground and don't, don't think it'll happen. Just ask me. Talk to me about what your concerns and fears are with liver disease because it's a whole new organ that you've never really worried about until you become an adult. And you read about cirrhosis and uh, see it in the movies. It's not that. It's a pressure problem that leads to fibrosis that we can try to minimize the pressures. But largely, we have to deal with the success of a wonderful uh, pediatric life-saving operation that leads to problems down the line. Lathan Valerian, uh, questions for you. And then, Chris, uh, your, uh, your opinion. So we've encouraged people to seek out second opinions. What if patients get two opinions that are very different? Then what do they do? Lath? Uh, great question, Tom. <laughs> so, you know, um, Look, I, I try to approach it. Maybe I'm encroaching on Chris's uh, territory here. From what, what would a patient think and feel um, uh, asking for a second opinion? And I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but most of the fear evolves around, am I going to upset my long-term provider if I go seek a second opinion? Um, my personal view on this is there shouldn't be any egos involved here. You and your provider should have that type of relationship where you can just tell them, um, you know, would, would you feel comfortable if you help me, helping me get a second opinion? So we do help patients. Mm -hmm. um, if there's a particular uh, issue, um, we seek second opinion from other ACHC centers or a particular provider nationally or internationally who've done a lot of this. Um, and we send the data. Because that's part of the frustration sometimes is access to data. The healthcare industry still functions by faxes and you know mail. Um, so we we put the package together for the patient and send it to that uh, provider, and then um, we set up a meeting where the providers and the patient are equally on the line, and uh, we talk about the best approach. That 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 ideally, I think that should happen this way. Uh, other scenarios. Um, if you seek a second opinion, you get a vastly different answer. Um, I would say um, write up your questions and go back to the same providers or uh, even others and uh, ask more. Uh, so if there are significant differences, that's where the transparency uh, should resolve a lot of these issues is uh, kind of bringing these providers together and asking them um, why this, why not this. Uh, so writing down your questions and um, addressing them later, I think that, that would be the best approach in my opinion. I don't know, Chris, what do you think? That's a hard question. Um, as a nurse, when I've sent patients over for second opinions, you know, we send the whole packet. And typically it's people that we've known in the past. So we know they're good. And very rarely is it something that's remarkably different. Um, I think the, the best story I have from this is the cardiologist that I actually work with. He's a tetralogy of flow and in medical school, his, it was recommended that he get a pulmonary valve replacement and his cardiologist hadn't told him he needed one and a different one did. And, um, the cardiologist at the time said, you know, medicine is not necessary, is, is an art, you know, if people will look at two different things and they have slightly different opinions because, you know, it's based on experience, based on what you've seen in the past. And just because you have two slightly different opinions doesn't mean it's necessarily wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I think as patients, we have to understand that these are two 
experts giving us, you know, similar, um, similar, you know, they're both giving us their expert opinion. The other thing is to bring a family member with you, write things down. Um, I think the biggest mistake when I went and had my liver evaluation is I went alone. I drove four hours and I went alone. And if I would have had somebody else with me, you know, that probably would have helped. It's one of those that as a patient, it's talking about your life and it's hard to pull back from the emotion of that, the scariness. And so having a, you know, a family member, a friend there can help balance that because I kind of, um, I remember my mom telling me that when she and my dad were there and after I was born and they learned my diagnosis, she doesn't remember anything. My dad remembers things, but my mom, it just kind of, she was so overwhelmed by the diagnosis that she didn't even hear. And so that's the same thing as when you go as a patient, just bring somebody with you, take notes, um, think about it ahead of time write your questions down, actually show up with your appointment with a notebook of questions, leave spaces so you can write the answers. Um, I did, I've done that before and I promise you they won't be offended. I actually like to write the answers in the book myself for the patient huh. so that we're all answering it directly. It is not a secret. We're all here for you. Please be your own advocate and come with concerns or scared of the word cirrhosis is what we see. But I, I second that. Please uh, know that we're here and we've no devoted our life to try to make this better. I have no ego about patient care. I only care about the best outcomes we can have. I would like to echo what Dr. Victor just said. Um, we dedicate our lives to improve the quality of lives of our patients and sometimes the decisions are not straightforward. These, these patients represent a challenge to healthcare providers, and, and it's good to get together and think about the right approach. The most important thing is that the patient is comfortable with the decision that is being made. And if it takes for that patient to hear it from a second voice, then that's more than welcome because we are in an era where we share decision making with our patients and, and, and it's key for them to feel comfortable and to, for them to be well informed uh, about the decision and before going into a big operation or a transplant journey. Uh, with that, I would like to wrap up the morning. We're running out of time. Uh, we have an exceptional audience and very engaged with many questions uh, that we will try to answer as, as we move forward. I would like to thank our outstanding panel of experts, Chris Donald, Dr. Victor, Dr. Abchawawki. Thank you, Dr. McGillivray. It's been an amazing hour and I think very productive for us and our patients. And thank you, Dr. Duarte. Okay, we'll take a five minute break and then we'll see you for the next session. Thank you.
and we're back. Um, and this session, we're going to be talking about one of the most important topics, probably of our lifetime, um, whether you're a congenital heart patient or a patient with acquired heart disease. Um, with us on our panel today is Dr. Harsimran Singh from Cornell University, as well as Joe Valenti, board certified patient advocate um, with Team Uncle Joe. Um, to my left, of course, is Dr. McGillivray. And um, we also have Dr. Gary Montero, who is our ACHD cardiovascular anesthesiologist. So welcome, everybody. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about um, the coronavirus 19, and then we're going to talk a little bit about specifically how it's affected our practice <clears throat> and how it's affected our patients. Um, but to get us started, I'd like to have Dr. Singh tell us about a specific case to really get into the details. Should say importantly, Dr. Singh practices in New York City, which certainly in the United States was uh, really uh, a pivotal starting point for this terrible uh, virus in our country. Thank you, Dr. Lin and Dr. McGilvery. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been uh, here the whole morning, and it's been a great discussion uh, to this point. So, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to start by presenting a case and sharing my screen. Um, and I am going to call on my colleagues a bit uh, to help me in the discussion, because I think we have a great sub-panel here at the moment. You know, in the spring, uh, New York City, just to reiterate what Dr. McGilvery said, it was the most dramatic um, and difficult experience of our professional and personal lives. March, April, May, we had in our hospital upwards of 670 COVID-19 patients, of which about 240 at its peak were intubated on mechanical ventilation. Um, and I can tell you that it was a challenging time for all specialties, and cardiologists and other specialties alike joined our, our pulmonary and anesthesia colleagues and, and chipped in, did our service to, to city and country. And we, I spent about three and a half months in COVID ICUs during the spring which was, uh, I hope not to re recreate moving forward. Um, certainly, I, I put this disclosure slide only to state the obvious, which is I am a cardiologist. I'm an ACHD specialist and interventional cardiologist, but I am not a specialist on COVID-19, despite my real-world experience in the units. Uh, that luckily, I've got a panel of other uh, people who can help me with the discussion. But I want to start by hearkening back historically, because where we are today is very different than uh, where I'm going to go back to, which is a case from March 1st, 2020. And if you think back in March 1st, this is going to be, uh, it's, there's no surprise here, it's going to be a COVID case. It was my first congenital heart disease COVID case and potentially the first one in New York City, but that's arguable. Um, and if you think back in context, you know, when this came out, if you remember January 1st, which is when the reports from China first came out about this new type of pneumonia in Wuhan, um, China declared the first deaths from this virus in January 11th in ABC News. That was reported as kind of lower down in the session. Uh, in the 21st, uh, the CDC reported that Washington State had a first travel-related case of COVID-19. Um, at that time, the rest of the country thought we weren't sure what to make of it. There wasn't. Um, there were varying degrees of concern about this, and certainly. Uh, but in January 30th, the WHO declared uh, coronavirus and COVID-19 as a public health emergency of international concern. Again, despite that proclamation, I can say that as a country, we probably didn't do enough to prepare. Um, I think we all can remember back to early February when there were the cruise ships getting caught with coronavirus. They were being quarantined. Everybody thought this will be a cruise ship problem. They were not allowed to come to shores. Certainly uh, in February 11th, WHO named it COVID-19 because they realized that the first virus in Wuhan came in, in December of 2019. In end of February, we were reading reports in Milan in Northern Italy and how dramatic it was there. And even in New York at the time, we thought, well, our heart goes out to Milan. We had 
uh, several faculty members go there to help, but it's not going to happen here, and how naive that was. Uh, in February 25th, uh, it was right around Mardi Gras time in New Orleans, and, and you know, and business as usual was going on in large parts of the country, and uh, there were 400,000 people. There was a, I remember a story of a poor college student who became um, an emblem of the situation where he said, I'm here to party, and, and certainly didn't deserve the, the censure he got, but the, the culture wasn't one of prevention. And that brings me to the day before this case, February 29th, when uh, in the U.S. and Washington State, they, CDC confirmed the first death known at the time from COVID-19. Uh, since then, it's, it seems that there have been additional deaths that were not known, both in Washington State and in New York. But at that time, that was our, our news arrangement. So I wanted to put that in context of where I'm hearkening back to. So this is a 30-year-old female with a complex congenital heart disease. Uh, she presented to the emergency room of our affiliated NYP institution in Queens with lightheadedness and shortness of breath. And I will say uh, that she had moved to New York three years ago. She'd been all around the country. She'd been part of a military family and had multiple surgeries all over, but she hadn't established care yet in an ACHD center since she moved for three years. Um, and I actually want to, before I get to any further, I wanted to stop and ask Joe a little bit, if you don't mind. You know, in 2020, what are some of the patient barriers still that you feel from when you, you know, you have your ear to the ground on, with patients with establishing ACHD care? Joe, can you hear us? Yep, sorry, I was muted. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I think it's a, it's a huge, it's still a very regional uh, thing, and it's very hard to uh, get access to care, um, and finding a qualified center is still a difficult, a difficult thing, and knowing, knowing where to go. Um, of course, in New York City, that's a that's a different scenario. So, I feel like you know, there's sometimes there's um, not as not as many barriers in in some areas as if you're in the middle of country. There's there's huge barriers, um, but definitely uh, for a lot of people, I think it's a it's a comfort thing too. It's you're you're when you're with a pediatric cardiologist, you're there for your, a lot of us are there for their whole life into your mid twenties and then you leave and then you have to go reestablish care. And so it's an emotional thing. And so that you leave that bond. And so you're trying to reestablish this bond with a new doctor. And if you have to redo it multiple times, you never really find that new home. And so it's reestablishing your medical home and reestablishing your really, really trying to reestablish this family that you had before. And so if you never find it, you're always trying to replace what you had. And realistically, you're never going to replace that. And what you need to realize a lot of times is you're just needing to find good medical care and you're not going to replace that, that, that bond you had. You may, but you, but you need to, first and foremost, you need to find the medical Joe, I think you're right that it's such a complex issue. It's an emotional one, it's often a logistic one. I, I think it, it does remind me always, especially in this era where it's now easier for us to you know, see patients virtually, we still need to make sure when our patients move that the first thing they do, especially our complex congenital patients, to establish care and communicate and create lines of communication. And I think the onus is on providers and patients so that uh, all, it's, it's, a, it's a joint onus so that these types of things uh, don't happen. Yeah, it's critical. So going back to the story, um, everyone can see my slides, I hope. Uh, so the, the patients, you know, when, he came, when she came into the emergency room at, in Queens, her vitals were okay. Her blood pressure was in the 80s. Her pulse was in the 70s. 
she was sounding about 93%, but this was her EKG, mm. uh, which showed diffuse SD elevations uh, throughout the what we would call the front of the heart, the anterior precordium, but throughout the throughout the heart, it was incredibly abnormal. So, appropriately so, and and they did not know much about her congenital history. They took her to the cath lab, um, where she was found to have normal coronaries, because they were worried about this being a heart attack despite her young age. And but they she. Uh, they put in a balloon pump, and they knew that she had had multiple surgeries because she was telling them that. She was able to give this history, um, though she didn't particularly know her diagnosis, they, and they transferred her to Cornell. So I'm going to cut to the chase because this, this case was in, I think it was a Sunday 1 a.m. type of thing or Saturday 1 a.m. type of thing where when she got transferred, uh, I was on call for congenital heart disease, so I came into the hospital. Actually, my colleague was on call for the cath lab, so we both came in to look at her. Uh, we were able to gather history from, get a hold of her uh, husband, who helped us get a hold of her father, who was all the way in a different time zone to get some information. It sounds like she was born with tricuspid atresia. We just had a fantastic session on Fontan's. Um, but knowing that this is a, a lesion that can often lead to a Fontan pathway because you only really have one ventricle that can be used for systemic circulation. This was what I was able to gather. This is actually the drawing. I, I took a picture of it that I, whenever we have a complex patient that gets admitted to our hospital, we draw something and we leave it uh, signed up uh, in the room so that the doctors and nurses know what the anatomy is. And this was her um, situation. She had had a number of surgeries and interventions throughout um, her life. She had had initially a VT shunt, a bidirectional glen, which is that SVC to PA anastomosis. She had had a pulmonary artery stent in the left pulmonary artery, and then it had her lateral tunnel Fontan completion later at age 15. She had actually had a failed attempt first at age 3. Uh, later in the cath lab, they closed her fenestration, closed some collaterals, and wonderfully so, she had a successful pregnancy uh, albeit with some complications at age 24, requiring C-section. Um, and then later she moved to New York. So this is how her anatomic makeup. And then when she came here, within an hour while we're gathering this data, she became hemodynamically unstable. She went into sure. this rhythm, which uh, looks like ventricular tachycardia, though she was still perfusion. Uh, she was confused, but she still had a blood pressure in the 60s. Her saturations were going down. She was started on pressors. And endotracheal intubation was performed because we were worried she wouldn't protect her airway. And so I'm going to ask Dr. Montiero uh, to, if you can comment a little bit about what, how to deal with intubation for patients and safety for the providers in the era of COVID-19 and how, kind of how you approach that. Absolutely. Um, just like you described, we had a very steep uh, learning curve here at the beginning. Um, with, with our patients who are known COVID positive, when we're called to intubate them, particularly in unstable situations on the floor, um, outside of our operating room environment, um, what we've evolved is, um, you know, full barrier precaution PPE. Um, with our patients who are known COVID positives, we're either wearing pappers, full gowns, gloves, or uh, face shields, N95 masks. Now, uh, full gowns, you know, doing a full uh, disrobe at the entrance and exit of the room. Um, one of the things we've all of us have sort of noticed with uh, sort of the unstable uh, COVID patients that are requiring intubation is how fast they desaturate despite, you know, um, pre-oxygenation, they, they all desaturate and they stay desaturated for what feels like an uncomfortable extended period of time after we intubate them and put them on hundred percent oxygen. Um, at the beginning, as I'm sure everyone knows, we were intubating people very early. Um, you know, we were, we were intubating people early, um, 
this allowed us for, for some degree to have time to get our PPE on to do these in a more controlled setting. And at the present time, we're intubating less people. Um, and, and I'm sure there's been a lot of debate on, you know, at the beginning, we were, were we harming people by intubating them very early with ventilator times versus now where we're keeping them on non-invasive ventilation, using positional strategies, um, that kind of thing. Um, but one of the things that I, I've really noticed that stands out is the degree of desaturation, how fast they desaturate. Um, we're using a lot of video laryngoscopy so that we can keep some distance between, even though we're, we're masked or uh, in PAPRs, um, using video laryngoscopy to keep our heads farther away um, from the patient. Some centers are using isolation boxes. I'm, I'm sure some people have seen them in the news, it's sort of a plexiglass box like you used to have in the chemistry lab, you know, where you can place sort of a chemistry hood over the patient while you're intubating. Um, in the operating room, one of the things we're doing is kicking out non-essential personnel when we're intubating COVID positive patients. And then we're waiting a uh, prescribed period of time that differs institution to institution sort of to allow air turnover in the, in the room um, after intubation. So typically we'll only intubate with one or two people in the room. And then we'll secure the endotracheal tube. We'll set a timer for five, 10, 15, some places 20, 30 minutes before we allow the rest of the team in the room to allow the air to turn over. Um, but like I said, it's been quite a, quite a learning curve. Yeah, no, thank you, Dr. Montero. I think it's, um, we've also learned a lot about how to protect ourselves and protect our patients. And if you remember the context in March 1st, Nobody was thinking seriously about COVID. Well, we were, but not seriously enough. We knew that there was this big mask shortage that was being described, but we didn't even realize that going on. And certainly in this particular situation, N95s and PAPRs were not worn for this intubation. So uh, patient was in shock. So was brought back to the, was brought to the cath lab here at Cornell. Uh, we knew she was a Fontan because we gather that information. Her Fontan pressures were about 35. To put that in context, normal Fontan pressures are ideally as low as possible in the order of 10 to 16, if you will, and then 16 is getting on the high side. And her end diastolic pressure was 30. The decision was made at that time to perform ECMO. Um, she actually had another step as an impella, which I'm gonna skip. But I want to start off by uh, asking my colleague, Dr. McGilvery, to, who puts in ECMO cannulas, if you can tell us a little bit about what ECMO is for the audience and, and what that exactly means. So ECMO stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, and it's a kind of heart-lung or lung pump. Uh, ECMO comes in two different flavors or two different types. Uh, VA ECMO, which is similar to the heart-lung machine. It takes the blood from the venous circulation. Uh, it drains it uh, into um, the circuit that goes to an artificial lung and is pumped back into the arterial circulation. And so that functions like the heart and the lung. Uh, so it's very good at supporting people whose lungs aren't working. It's very good at supporting people whose hearts aren't working. Uh, and I would say that certainly in a patient like this that doesn't have tricuspid atresia, uh, uh, or even with tricuspid atresia, that would be probably the, the, the mainstay workhorse. Uh, VV ECMO is used to treat people uh, generally who have uh, problems primarily with their lungs. They're not oxygenating effectively. Uh, they're not, or they're not ventilating effectively. They're not able to get rid of the carbon dioxide that's in the blood. It takes blood out of the vein, goes through the circuit, through the artificial lung, and returns it back into a vein so that it still counts on the heart to pump the blood but it's uh, using the artificial membrane to provide gas exchange for the blood. So uh, in order to use VV ECMO, which maybe we'll talk about a little bit more later, 
which has become the mainstay for ECMO in patients who have COVID-19, given the hemodynamic instability that this patient has, not just with the need for uh, being on vasopressors, but actually the high left ventricular end diastolic pressure, the high Fontan pressures, that, uh, that the first choice to go to to support this particular patient uh, would be VA ECMO. And, and again, it's, this, is, this conversation has been had many times in many places over the last uh, nine months in that ECMO doesn't treat COVID, it supports patients with COVID until we can, uh, either it resolves or there's some other treatment that can be used to effectively get the patient better. Thank you, Dr. McGover. That's, um, that's perfect. I mean, I think in this particular case, just like you said, um, while in the majority of our COVID-19 patients who have gone down the route of ECMO, they've only required venovenous ECMO, in this particular case, it was a hemodynamic compromise. And so uh, this patient got veno arterial ECMO or VA ECMO to support both the heart and the lungs in the cath lab. So just to start off, so this is March 1st. Um, you know, she, troponins are very high. She gets transferred here. She's in ventricular tachycardia. She gets VA ECMO. There is the biopsy performed because at the moment, our thought was this is most likely even the coronaries were normal, consistent with myocarditis. Um, she uh, was chartered on CVVH because she wasn't making urine initially. Um, and we were trying to figure out how to get had some of the volume off. Uh, and she was started immediately on presumed treatment of myocarditis before we even had biopsy results. Her biopsy two days later did come back in lymphocytic myocarditis. Her viral panel was negative. And yes, at the time, we were learning about this disease called COVID-19. And the PCR was first available in the first week of March. That was sent off on the 3rd. It probably actually came back negative a few days later because all these tests were taking a couple of days to come back at the time. At Looking at ultrasound imaging of her heart, however, it was not pulsatile. And really, she was dependent on that ECMO circuit. She continued to have ventricular tachycardias, but the great thing was, despite all that, she was awake. Wow. She was... Hmm and able to be extubated, and she was following commands. And so then the discussion became with her family, given that she's getting better, what's the next step? And so we started by looking at her heart about a week or two later, because sometimes you can see recoverability. Unfortunately, in her, her muscle of her heart was not working at all. And despite the steroids and IVIG, it didn't seem like that she would be someone who would be able to be weaned off ECMO because, again, ECHO is a temporizing measure. Remember in the context that by March 7th, now our ICUs are filling up with COVID-19. And while she was believed to be negative at this time, times to us, we were trying to figure out what's the best thing for her. So we engaged her because she was awake. We engaged her family, and we decided after a lot of discussion to proceed with ventricular assist device. So let me stop there and ask Dr. Milgrove to talk to us a little bit about ventricular assist devices. Sure. So uh, uh, the ventricular assist device, uh, I mentioned earlier, the VV ECMO is used <laughs> to support primarily the lungs. VA ECMO supports primarily the heart and the lungs. It acts like a lung, but it also acts as a pump. A ventricular assist device is a pump. It can take the place of or work in addition to the left-sided ventricle or the right-sided ventricle uh, and, and, and pump the blood around. It doesn't do anything uh, with regard to adding oxygen or getting rid of carbon dioxide. And, and there are uh, left ventricular assist devices that are designed to be uh, temporary uh, and can be put in percutaneously. There are devices that are designed to be put in through open 
heart surgery uh, and meant to be in place for a long time and even uh, as destination therapy indefinitely. You may be muted, uh, Simran. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. McGovery. So she had had a percutaneous ventricular assist device at the same time as the ECMO. At this point, the decision was to go with a, a hybrid model, which we do here um, not infrequently, called a KVAD, which is where we left the ECMO circuit in, but went put in a LVAD so that we could slowly wean the ECMO over time. Um, but um, once the ECMO was weaned, this, you, this becomes just a traditional left surgical left ventricular assist device where patients live at home for years and years with. And that was our hope for her um, in this context, given that her myocarditis and the context of being in the hospital where everybody has, um, is there's a lot of lack of resources and where there was um, a lot of in COVID going on, we were we thought we would get her out of the hospital as soon as it was safely possible. At the time, again, we believed the COVID tests being negative, and this is a chest X-ray showing this hybrid model where you still have the ECMO in, but you now have a apical cannula that's acting like a KVAD that later became a VAD. Okay, so, if, so time, if I can just interject. Uh, and maybe everybody knows this, but it's an important point, and I can just add to it. Uh, a, a rookie move, if you will, for somebody who gets VA ECMO because their left ventricle isn't working well, uh, even though the VA ECMO circuit pumps blood around the body, it is not a good way to decompress the left ventricle. And in fact, uh, the left ventricle can continue to become more distended and add further injury to the insult that the primary problem already causes. So, so if you have someone who has a ventricular dysfunction and you're on VA ECMO, it is really very important to make sure that left ventricle gets decompressed, as you and your colleagues did very effectively with the KVAD. Perfect. Thank you. So the, the, so the KVAD was placed on the 9th. Her creatinine was about 2. She was starting to make urine. Um, it got better to 1.4. A third PCR test for COVID was negative. At this point, you know, our ID doctors were in the belief, which we saw time and time again, that a negative COVID test in the right clinical scenario doesn't necessarily mean they don't have COVID especially in patients where the predominant problem seems to be extra pulmonary. And, and so this, though, so we were starting to, you know, but, you know, three negative tests, and a lot of us were like, this is great, she's going to do well. And she did well. We were able to wean the ECMO portion. And on the 16th of March, she received a HeartMate 3 left ventricular assist device. Um, this was... We were all thrilled for her. She was following commands. Her urine output, though, was becoming a little bit less. Her creatinine was up to 2.5. Um, and then, lo and behold, a fourth COVID test came back positive, um, which as so did a fifth one. And this was confirmatory to what our infectious disease doctors were suggesting. Cardiac, you know, when we think of COVID-19, the majority of the complications are indeed in the lung, in COVID pneumonia, in COVID bronchitis, and the acute respiratory distress syndrome that can result is the primary manifestation, but certainly there's a large percentage of patients who also have cardiovascular complications. And in our patients with congenital heart disease, adding on a COVID cardiovascular complication or a, or a lung one can be dramatic. That can, the, the complications can range between a myocardial injury. They can range from myocarditis and arrhythmias, which both of which she had, and it can range to acute coronary syndromes. Luckily, she did not have those. So this is her, you know, her x-ray, how it looked 
her TEP at the time because we were trying to figure out what was going on. Why was she not making great urine? Oh, her good. ventricle looked much better on just an LVAD circuit alone. Right However, this story is not one that was positive, unfortunately. And I'm telling this to you because to know the realities of what we face with COVID-19. She became increasingly hypotensive a few days later. We maxed out on the RPMs, on the ability of the pump to pump blood of her heart made free. And she started developing bleeding, both gastrointestinal and oral, at the same time developing clots in liver, her peripheral liver, veins, suggestive of a, liver. what we call a DIC type of picture. On the 21st, she was progressively hypoxemic. Her chest x-ray looked bad, and her TE started showing clots forming within the front end condom. And on the 22nd, despite all this, she passed away from multi-system mm -hmm. failure. Um, her autopsy showed that she had, she indeed did have COVID-19 from the very get-go. So I tell you this dramatic case because from way back when in March, not to give a, a context of pessimism, but to give a context of realism, because clearly a lot has changed since then, and now we're in November 7, 2020. I think all of us have seen many ACHD patients have COVID and do well. They've all had, many have had, some have been asymptomatic, some have had symptoms and recovered, though there are a handful who have had more serious complications. But if I pull back to the news of today, other than the big news from this morning, which I had to put up, um, <laughs> where they, all the news articles have now called the election um, as far as electoral college goes. So no matter you, your political persuasion, looks like we have a new president of the United States coming in. At the same New York Times page, when you look further down, it shows from Friday, the number of new cases in the United States was 132,000, which is close to a daily record. The number of deaths reported on Friday was 1,223. And you can see the red and the hot spots throughout. And so I, I guess I leave, uh, I leave this part of the presentation and we'll pass the baton to my colleagues How much time do you have? Um, in the context of What's our next, you know, we have to still think of COVID-19 as a very serious prevalent illness, even in November of 2020. I know there's some um, articles coming out, some great multi-institutional trials, which have looked at the effect of COVID congenital heart disease, um, which show, which are still yet to be published, but the initial data suggests that our ACHD patients do have a slightly a slightly worse prognosis when it comes to having COVID-19 than if an age-matched control would suggest. However, age does seem to predominate as the biggest risk factor where older people do worse. And in addition, I think the it is the more complex patients, our hypoxemic patients, our fontans who have a tendency to take get hit harder with the complications of COVID-19. Let me yield the floor there. So um, Simran, I think that's a great, um, that's a great uh, conclusion to the case. I think one of the things that really comes out and is actually one of the questions that one of our audience asked was, why do you think that the patient tested negative three times and then finally tested positive on the fourth time? And I think that really highlights where we need to go next. Um, but l let me have you answer that question first. Yeah, I think we asked our laboratory medicine people that a lot, and I think there's a couple of reasons. We saw this in the patients who had primarily cardiovascular manifestations of COVID-19, and if you notice, she didn't have so many pulmonary manifestations. Mm -hmm. It is a less sensitive test because you're doing a PCR nasal swab. Even though that's the entrance point, her major problem was in the heart. Um, we, their test has gotten better over time. If you remember back in March, the sent, these tests were being made, um, were being produced by hospitals and by laboratories locally, 
and the testing has gotten better, though it's still not perfect. So you can see patients, even today in the last few months, we've seen patients who've had negative tests times one, but come back positive in the future, which is why we will, it is their clinical suspicion that predominates and you'll sometimes repeat testing. Yeah, I think that's a really, really excellent point. And I think if I remember correctly, I mean, part of the problem is you guys were right at the front wave of it. Mm -hmm. um, I remember actually, I just heard recently on NPR, they were talking about how um, New York State of Public Health, uh, uh, Department of Public Health actually had trouble with the first series of tests that came from the CDC um, that they actually are now finding with an internal investigation that there was a problem with the CDC test. So I think we are still learning a lot. And I think that that's probably the take home point is as we learn, we need to continue to have a very high index of suspicion, um, no matter what the situation is, especially if there's clinically uh, evidence that there may be a problem from a COVID standpoint. So I think when we were discussing this session before, um, before today, we had a lot of concerns about you know, having such a complicated case. But I think you know, we all think this, right? I think Dr. Montero, Dr. McGillivray, Joe, myself, Dr. Simron, we, this is sort of the case scenario that we've all been concerned about confronting. And I think even our patients are concerned about this type of a case. And so I think verbalizing it, talking about it, and analyzing it is really probably the best way to sort of confront that boogeyman. So I wanted to sort of take it to the other side of the spectrum now and, um, and have Joe tell us a little bit about when he counsels patients at this point um, from his position as a patient advocate, what, does he, what, what do you suggest, Joe, when you talk to patients about going out to eat, getting a haircut, going to see your doctor, getting an echocardiogram done? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, you know, first thing is it's all about prevention, right? Um, and that's, that's the one thing we can manage. And um, I think knowing the worst case scenario, I appreciate you sharing this case, Dr. Singh. It's really important to know those things. I think sometimes as patients, we feel like we're in the dark. What's really going on behind those closed doors? We don't, we don't get to see it. And so um, being, able to, being able to see that uh, worst case scenario and knowing that, uh, you know, this is a kind of the, like we talked about beforehand, you know, this was the first kind of case, you know, first time you guys saw it, and we haven't seen a ton of them, right? So that's, that's good to know, and there's a lot of interventions that you guys have and a lot more tools that you're ready. Um, so, yeah, prevention is key, but I think that what COVID has done for the ACHD and CHD patients and parents, it's just turned up the volume on everything for mm -hmm. us, and, um, you know, the challenges we face, uh, you know, a lot of us are a younger population, you don't look sick. You hear that all the time. You don't look sick. Well, so when you go out and, you know, you go get your hair cut or you go to the grocery store, you go anywhere, you don't look like the high-risk population. So people aren't treating you like that. Your friends don't see you like that. Um, you know, a lot of your family doesn't even see you like that. And so trying to communicate that you're a high-risk person in those situations is a very difficult thing. Um, you know, and I know a lot of the patients struggle even with their, within their own family and their own, uh, even with their parents, even though their parents were their, maybe their best advocates as, as children, that they, once they became adults and maybe their parents heard, as we did as kids, you know, that you're fixed, that they struggle as adults to communicate that they're, you know, what their illness is as an adult. And so now trying to communicate that they're high risk and what behaviors are appropriate now is really difficult. And so what it took is it took this, uh, you know, these things that were issues on occasion of needing to communicate, you know, these challenges that we faced as patients that, hey, I'm having some medical issues here and there, to now it's an everyday thing. No, you can't come over. No, we can't go do these things. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a once in a. You know, a once a every six months thing or a once a year conversation about what's going on after a, a checkup or I'm going to have a procedure or whatever. It's an everyday thing, and so like I said, it's just turned up the volume to a hundred. And you know, as patients, we struggle with just in general. What is 
what's our risk stratification? You know, every patient knows what their defect is and maybe knows what their surgical history is and those kinds of things to some extent, but then starting to get into the physiological state, their current physiological state and those types of things. Now, what is uh, your risk with COVID? And okay, well, you don't need to know. You just need to, you just need to, you know, be in a prevent, you know, defense. Well, that's all good, but you know, everybody wants to know, and that's what we're thinking. So, uh, you know, trying to trying to determine that is, you know, it's obviously it's difficult um, because you know it's a it, just in general. Again, going back to the, what we were just saying, it, in general, it's difficult to know that, much less in this environment. So it, it, it's just made everything more challenging. Yeah. And it's not a, it's not a, um, it's an all the time kind of thing. Yeah. And so I think it's important for the patients to manage it, to realize though too, going back to what Dr. Singh was, kind of his extreme of that case to realize it's not an all or nothing thing, you know. There's a, there's there's plenty of in between outcomes. If you get COVID, you're not going to die, you know. The chances of that are very slim. You know, we're seeing so many outcomes in between that. So we have to we have to put it in perspective that there's so much more to happen besides that. And so you know, as a management, as a patient myself, you know, I have to tell myself that all the time. You know, we 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 have to. We have to ground ourselves in reality and say, okay, you know, we have experts out there that have a ton of tools at the ready to help us to do all these things. You know, we could have an asymptomatic case. It could be a breeze. You know, if we get sick, there's, there's, there's a lot of things that could happen in between, you know, the very worst case scenario. So Absolutely. Uh, we, we just have to be able to take a deep breath as well. Yeah. Joe, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think I showed this case because it was our first. It was a complex congenital patient we threw the kitchen sink at this patient. We put our heart and soul into it. And unfortunately, this is the, an illness that can be devastating. But you're right. One, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, always. And certainly, even for physicians and nurses who are dealing with these patients, once mass rules in New York became consistent and all of us wore it, very few healthcare providers actually got COVID, dealing with COVID patients 24-7. It was before they were, had consistency in masks and before there were consistency in messaging about it. So masks work. That's the first step, and that's the best prevention strategy in addition to all the kind of CDC guidelines and what they recommend. But the second thing I'll say is that, you know, even if you do get it, I'm going to say the statement that 90-plus percent of my patients have done fine with COVID. They really have. They've some, some transposition patients who were desaturated for a week did recover. There are some patients who, um, who were in the hospital for a week or two and, and, and got home and are doing okay. There are some patients who are not doing okay, who have had chronic issues related to COVID. I guess what it comes to, it's a, it's a, it's a variable illness. Um, and certainly we should know and tell our patients who are the highest risk. I think we can think of it, the same patients we call severe complex congenital heart disease are probably the ones that were the highest risk for COVID-19 complications, though again, more data is coming forth for that answer. And we should advise them accordingly. Um, but um, at the same time, things are, we know this disease better. You should not avoid medical care just in the fear of exposure to COVID, because that itself, we have seen patients hurt and get harmed by avoiding coming in to get taken care of. And that's, that itself can be a problem. So make sure you are getting appropriate medical care, especially now. Yeah, great. great point. Um, so I think in the remaining minute or so, um, I, I wanted to give uh, Dr. Montero a chance to um, give us some practical suggestions. I think many people would consider you probably one of the people who took highest risk um, during our first surge, um, being the one to have to deal with aerosols on a regular basis. What can you give us for advice on making sure you don't bring it home? In other words, not contaminating 
um, things when you step into your house. Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, so, so I can say it sort of evolved. At the beginning, every single COVID patient that I took care of, you know, I took my gown off, I took my scrubs off, my shoes were off, I showered, um, changed into clean stuff, you know, left my shoes there. Um, and I'm still, I'm still doing all that when I have known COVID positive patients. The interesting thing is the patients who are negative, right? So like we talked about before, coming to the hospital or even emergency procedures, they're getting tested and the lab turnaround on this sort of emergency test is pretty rapid. And, and most of them, you know, you, you do an emergency case, you start off in full precautions and then they come back negative on their test. But we have seen some cases where the first test was negative and then, you know, a subsequent test is positive. One of the things that I think needs to be emphasized a lot is, um, and it was already emphasized, was wearing masks wash and hand washing. Um, and we've also seen, uh, you know, wearing face shields. Um, so when we're, when we're intubating patients in the, in the OR, even if they're negative, we're fully masked and we're wearing eye protection. Um, and and we, we've, we've done that pre-COVID anyway. Um, but we, we continue to wear, you know, face shields or eye protection, uh, wearing masks um, at a bare minimum if they're negative. You know, if they've had a negative test and they're asymptomatic, some people are comfortable with just a surgical mask. Some people are wearing N95s if they're negative um, also for all intubations and extubations. Um, I think hand washing is, has finally taken off. You know, it, when you look at compliance for hand washing everywhere, it's always not been the greatest. But uh, something I've just noticed is people are very aware of washing their hands. Coming home um, with my wife and my children, everyone washes their hands when we come home from anywhere that we've been. The, the kids are actually an in-person school. The first thing we do when we pick them up is everyone washes their hands. When I come home from the hospital, you know, even if I haven't been exposed to anybody, first thing I do is, you know, we, we change out of our, our clothes, shoes stay downstairs, that kind of stuff. So I think it's all common sense stuff. Um, the, if you're gonna be intubating patients or be doing aerosol producing procedures, which is sort of an evolving topic, whether for, for our cardiology friends, whether TEs are producing aerosols or not, um, you know, wear, wear a mask, wear face protection, wash your hands, you know, which is, which is all stuff that we should be doing anyway. But I think now we're just, super or hyper aware of hand washing and personal protection. You know, if you're going to go see somebody, see them outside and keep a distance, you know, we're still doing, um, you know, we're still talking with our neighbors, that kind of stuff, but you know, we're chatting outside from each other's porches, you know, it's not a time for social, I, physical, dis, physical distancing isn't the same as social distancing necessarily. You know, I, I would recommend reach out, reach out to your friends, reach out to your family. You can FaceTime, you can talk on the porches, you know, and, and these are all things that I think are gonna help us, you know, get, get through this. Um, but again, you know, hand washing and personal protection. Yeah. Well, great. Um, we've gone a little bit over time. I wanna thank our wonderful panel, Dr. Simran Singh, Dr. Jo uh, sorry, Dr. Uh, Gary Montero, um, Joe Valenti, and Dr. Tom McGillivray. This has been an excellent session. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to cover the lots and lots of questions that are still remaining. Um, we'll try to cover some of them this afternoon. So we're going to take a, about a 10-minute break and join us back in about 10 minutes at 1245 Central Time. When we go through our virtual hands-on session, we're going to have a patient and advocate panel with us to go through some of the questions that some of you already have for us about different uh, cardiovascular devices and interventions. We'll see you soon, thank you.
Welcome back. I'm Huey Lin. I'm the director of the Dell Congenital Heart Program. And this afternoon, we're going to be working on our virtual hands-on session. So to just finish up our conversation from the last session, what you may notice here is that there are three of us here in this studio. What you may not know is that we have very strict protocols for how we handle our precautions for COVID-19 here in the studio. So we're not actually allowed to have more than three participants in the studio here at this desk. And if we have to have more than three, we can have four at most and we actually have to observe strict physical distancing. So we do take this very seriously, and so should you. So moving forward, I would love to introduce our panelists today on our virtual hands-on session. And this is going to be an exciting time because we've actually never done it this way before. In the past, we brought people here to Methodist to actually show everybody our really exciting demonstration of cardiovascular devices. But today, we're going to do it virtually. So to my left. I have uh, the wonderful Tiffany Goray, who is both a heart mom and a patient advocate. Um, and then, of course, we have Dr. Tom McGillivray, Chief of Cardiac Surgery and Thoracic Transplant. Joining us via virtual, I ha we have uh, Joe Valenti of Team Uncle Joe. Joe, would you like to introduce the rest of the virtual panel for us? Sure, no problem. Uh, we have uh, Christina Barbera uh, with uh, Team uh, Wear Red. And then uh, Lindsay Alano, who was uh, also with Team Uncle Joe. And then uh, Heather McCullough, also with uh, Team Uncle Joe. And uh, Kayla Griffin with uh, American Heart Association. Wonderful. It's great having you guys all here. And so hopefully what we can do today is show some videos that we've recorded of these particular devices and then quickly move on to some of the, to the top questions that you and, um, and the folks that you work with have for us. So let's go ahead and start with our first video on cardiac rhythm devices. Hello, my name is Huey Lin. Welcome to our virtual hands-on session focusing on cardiac rhythm devices. So to start off with, we're gonna talk about implantable loop recorders. So say for example, I have a patient who comes into the office who has palpitations, and we haven't been able to figure out exactly what's going on. So first of all, in the office, we'll do an EKG, and we can't find any abnormalities on the EKG. Then we do say, for example, a 24-hour Holter monitor or a seven to 30-day event monitor, and we still don't find anything that causes the patient's symptoms of potential arrhythmias. So then the next step is to take a small device like this called an implantable loop recorder. And so this implantable loop recorder goes in under the skin after a small incision is made right underneath the skin in the chest. And what it can do then is because it has a three to five year battery life, it is able to continuously monitor the patient's heart rhythm during that three to five year lifespan. More importantly, it also comes with this small device, which is a little button that the patient is able to activate when they're actually having symptoms. So for example, if I go home and I have the implantable loop recorder placed under my skin, and a couple days later, I start to have symptoms that are really concerning to me and really replicate what brought me into the office to begin with, I'll go ahead and push this button. And what happens during that time is that a longer loop of more detailed information will be stored onto the implantable loop recorder so that when I come back to the doctor's office, I can actually give that information to my doctor and my doctor's able to use that data to make a diagnosis. In addition to that, these loop recorders come with home monitoring. So there are different types of home monitoring systems that allow us to continuously download the data from the implantable loop recorder for all the rhythms that are happening to the patient, especially the rhythms that happen when the patient depresses this patient activator button. In addition to that, when the patient comes into the office, we can also download the data through one of these programmers and get all that information during their patient office visit. That helps us to make the diagnosis of what the rhythm problem is in that patient. Once we've made the diagnosis, if the problem is where the patient's heart rate is too low to give enough blood flow to the rest of the body, then the patient will potentially need a pacemaker. And so what we have here is we have a pacemaker that allows to, us to do exactly that. So the way a pacemaker works is the following. It generates a signal, an electrical impulse that causes the heart to contract just like it would normally would if it had its own pacemaker. So by the time this has happened, the heart's own intrinsic pacemakers are no longer working adequately enough to give the patient enough blood flow to the rest of their body. 
And so what our partners use to do this is they hook it up to various different types of leads that get implanted into the heart muscle itself and get hooked up to the pacemaker itself. So the pacemaker in many ways is the brain that generates the pulse for the, um, for the electrical stimulus. And then the lead itself is what then transmits that pulse into the heart muscle and cause the heart muscle to contract in synchrony to the impulses from the pacemaker. Now, these pacemakers have become more and more um, sophisticated, allowing us to pace in many different ways. And so we can implant multiple different leads to really improve the function of the heart. I'll come back to that in just one second. What can be very helpful is sometimes our patients should not or cannot have any type of lead inside their body. And so what has been an amazing revolutionary invention is this, which is a leadless pacemaker. So it's exactly what it sounds like. So instead of actually having a lead that connects from the generator into the heart muscle tissue, it goes directly from this. So this is both the generator and the lead. So this gets implanted into the heart muscle tissue and creates that stimulus to create that beat to beat um, uh, contraction. And so because it sits inside the heart muscle, engaged into the heart muscle already, it can actually deliver that electrical impulse that is also generating at the same time. So it doesn't actually require a separate generator or a separate lead. And this is a leadless pacemaker. So moving on, if I have a patient who needs what's called defibrillation because they have an abnormal heart rhythm that is too fast and is potentially lethal in nature called ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, then they would require one of these two different types of devices, which is a defibrillator, okay? So we'll start with a basic defibrillator first. So this is an implantable cardiac defibrillator or ICD. And so with these devices, what it comes with is a specific type of lead that actually can generate a shock. So in addition to doing the normal type of pacing that we just talked about, which is an electrical stimulus, what it can do is a much higher potency stimulus that can potentially shock the patient out of these life-threatening arrhythmias when necessary. And again, um, there are multiple levels of sophistication from these different types of devices, but specifically what I wanna focus on is that this type of generator can generate the amount of electricity that's required to shock the patient out of the life-threatening arrhythmia called ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation and get them back into normal rhythm. Sometimes the patients need something a little bit more sophisticated than that, and that is called not only defibrillator, but resynchronization therapy. And what that means is sometimes we have a problem where the two halves of the heart do not contract together, and that can put the patient into further and further heart failure. And so in order to get around that, what we can do is we can use this type of a defibrillator resynchronization therapy device, put one lead into one side of the heart, and then put another lead into the left side of the heart. And what that allows for then is when this impulse comes from this generator, it allows for both sides of the heart to contract at the same time. And it does what we call re resynchronization therapy. And what that then does is to help some of our patients who are in heart failure to get into better quality of life and less heart failure. So importantly, each of these devices can be monitored at home. And so the information can be sent to your doctor at any given point in time, as long as it's downloaded on a regular basis. Or when they come into the office, they can have the device interrogated via one of these two different devices. Um, and we can download all the information during a visit inside in, in our office. So this really allows us the maximum flexibility. So if for some reason the patient can't come to the office, they can do the monitoring at home. Likewise, if they're having trouble doing the monitoring at home, we can download all the information when they come into the office. Thanks for joining us for this session. As with all of our other sessions, if you have interest in learning more about this area, please see the adjoining uh, video where we go into more detail about this. Thank you. over to our panel and see if you guys have any thoughts or questions or comments about what we just looked at. Go ahead, Christina. Can you guys hear me? We can. Hi. Dr. Lin and thank you so much for having
I did have a little bit of a question about the pacemakers and the loop recorder. Um, I was wondering, as a lot of us end up needing to be paced a little bit younger, I know that the settings are sometimes changing and you're taking the max heart rate that you have on the pacemaker and some people, some providers are increasing the max amount to give everybody a little bit more flexibility in what we can do in terms of activity. So what I'm wondering is, at what point with a loop recorder would you consider for patients um, that are having tachyarrhythmias that might not be being picked up by the pacemaker, would you move, um, at what point would you move to potentially discussing a loop recorder with them to catch those tachyarrhythmias? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I think a lot of it has to do with the type of device that you have implanted. I think many times the device that you have implanted may actually be able to read many of those tachyarrhythmias. And it sort of depends on how many leads the device has. So sometimes if the device has enough leads and has the right kind of programming, you can actually get a really good interrogation and get a really good interpretation with your electrophysiologist for what that tachyarrhythmia is. Of course, and I should explain what a tachyarrhythmia is. So a tachyarrhythmia is a fast abnormal heart rhythm. So when we think about things like quote unquote SVT, a supraventricular tachyarrhythmia, um, or a VT, ventricular tachyarrhythmia, which is obviously dangerous and concerning, or say for example, fast atrial fibrillation. So those are the sorts of things that sometimes, depending on the device that you have and depending on the leads that you have, you may actually be able to get that information without the added use of a loop recorder. Sometimes you still need a loop recorder because you just may not have the hardware needed to actually make that diagnosis. Ultimately, I would say most electrophysiologists are probably going to want to take the patient to the electrophysiology lab to do a study and then an ablation if it really comes down to it, if it can't be managed with medical therapy, for example, or number one, or number two is dangerous to the patient. Um, and so I guess that also asks the question, what's dangerous to the patient? Um, I think it depends on what your anatomy is. I think, um, as we talked about earlier today, transposition with the atrial switch doesn't really tolerate even atrial arrhythmia, so atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, things like that. And so those patients we have to be much more aggressive with when we start to see those types of arrhythmias and we have to be very aggressive about considering early um, uh, electrophysiology studies in the cath lab and early ablations. I have a question, a sort of similar question for patients that are needing continuous pacing um, and are younger um, as a lot of uh, CHD patients are. Um, What's the viability for his bundle pacing and or um, going to a, a, a CRT earlier in, the, in their treatment as opposed to going late once they've developed a heart failure from uh, you know, single chambered uh, pacing from being chronically paced their uh, whole life? So that's a, that's a very challenging and very controversial topic at this point in congenital heart disease. I think for acquired heart disease, we're having a better sense that if you have right ventricular pacing. So to explain, the right ventricle is the default chamber in which we put a pacemaker lead into. And so typically what ends up happening is that we pace the right ventricle. And what we do know now is that when we pace the right ventricle, it causes a desynchrony of the two ventricles. So the right ventricle um, paces and then contracts, and then the left ventricle paces and contracts. And so what that causes, we think, over time, is something that creates a milieu to create heart failure, where the left ventricle starts to fail. Um, I think it's still complicated, and I don't know that we definitely know the answer to that. We definitely think it's both electrical as well as biochemical in nature. Um, but I think the real question, what you're coming to, is are there ways of getting around that? Um, we now know that that's, um, that additional ventricular leak can potentially get us around that. But in addition to that, if we put the pacemaker lead in a different position, like in the His bundle, like you mentioned, can we avoid it altogether? And I think that that's still somewhat controversial. I think we've seen a lot of really exciting data that suggests, at least anecdotally, if not in small case series, that His bundle pacing can get us around that. So the His bundle is one of the parts of the conduction system. And if you put the pacemaker lead very close to the His bundle and you can pace that instead, you can potentially avoid the um, the, the deleterious effects of actually having chronic right ventricular pacing, or at least that's the theory. Um, I do know of at least a handful of people in the congenital heart um, arena that really feel that the data is not quite there yet. Although I definitely think that here in our institution, we've seen some pretty great effects with his bundle pacing. Uh, 
Um, I will give you the disclosure that I am not an electrophysiologist, so I don't know that I can answer that question to the utmost or be abreast of the latest literature. All right, let's go ahead and, I'm sorry. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, um, I, I guess oh. it's a, uh, an important point about what a pacemaker does. Uh, uh, as Dr. Lin mentioned in his video, the pacemaker gives an electrical signal to a, 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 just one part of the heart muscle. And then that electrical signal gets transmitted from each heart cell to each heart cell. So it, it takes time for that electrical signal to get through the heart. And then that signal gets a coordinated contraction of the muscle. And so, so how best to generate that signal and where best to generate that signal in patients with congenital heart disease, I, I think is somewhat patient dependent. And, and even in a patient dependent situation, we still don't have all the answers. I, I think that's a great that's a great statement. Was there another question? I think yeah, I had I had a question. Um, I've had a pacemaker pretty much like for thirty plus years, and so I've always had leads. Would there ever be an advantage to get a leadless pacemaker, or is it just like I've had leads all my life, and so I would always have a pacemaker with leads? So that's a really exciting area at this point. Um, so what, what is a leadless pacemaker? So a leadless pacemaker goes into the ventricle. So right now, typically the leadless pacemaker will actually go into the right ventricle. What that means though is that in the current generation that there's no communication with the atria or the top chambers of the heart. And what that means then is that there's going to be really no synchrony between the atria and the ventricles. And so you might think then, well, who's going to benefit from that if there's no synchronization between the atria and the ventricles? Because then you're sort of potentially fighting the atria. And the answer to that is typically that the patient that we think is most benefited from that is a patient who's chronically in atrial fibrillation, where there is no real sort of defined atrial contraction anymore. Um, and so those patients, you know, it may not matter whether or not their atrial ventricular is synchronized because the atria are not having definitive contractions. So, I do think that when I think about single ventricles, I get a little bit concerned when I think about leadless pacing alone um, in its current generation. Now, I think that there's a lot of talk about um, the next generation potentially having two leadless pacemakers, but again, um, I think I'll believe it when I see it, and I'll believe it when it's FDA approved and on the market. Um, and then I think, you know, likewise for a lot of things that we deal with in congenital heart disease, it's probably worthwhile letting um, acquired um, heart disease patients go through it first to really get a sense of what it does and whether or not there are any problems with it before we start to deploy it in our patient population, especially single ventricle patients. Huey, what's the, uh, what's the battery life of a leadless pacemaker? I was afraid you were going to ask me that. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, don't think I wanted I to ask you before you asked me. <laughs> so, um, so actually, I believe, um, I believe our, um, our uh, partner um, uh, answered all those questions on the vendor video. Um, that you may have caught during the um, during the break. Um, so I think if, if you're interested in finding out about that, you can certainly check out that video. The reason why we're not showing it now is because um, it's not actually uh, continuing education certified, so we can't actually show it during this segment. So, so I apologize, Tom. I, I can't answer that question. Apologize to our audience. <laughs> keep the suspense. Yep. All right. Let's go ahead and go to our next video. Hello, I'm Huey Lin. Welcome to our virtual hands-on session on cardiac occlusion devices. Today we're going to talk about multiple different cardiac occlusion devices. What you see here is versions of different cardiac occlusion devices, and specifically you'll notice that they're made out of a nickel titanium shape memory metal called nitinol. The reason why they're made out of this metal is because they have what's called memory. What this means is that when they're at cold, less than body temperature, they can be very soft and malleable and be stretched and shaped into very small devices. Then when they reach the body temperature, they'll spring back to their original shape and configuration, allowing them to work nicely to occlude defects inside the heart. Different shapes are made out of this nickel titanium alloy to serve different purposes in different types of cardiac defects. 
So specifically, I'll show you how this actually works. Because we're currently at room temperature where it's cold, what can happen is we can actually bring it into a very small catheter like this one. And so what that allows us to do is to take this device that you can see once it's inside the body and goes back to its original shape, it's actually relatively large. However, when it's cool, it can be pulled into a small catheter like this and be deployed via a small incision in one of the artery or veins of the body, such as like in the leg. So we have a nice little model of the heart and that will allow us to actually go through the process of actually showing how this actually happens. So we can start with a small incision in the femoral vein, a vein in the leg, and then we can insert the catheter through. And that catheter can then be taken through the defect. So this is our model of the heart. What you see here is the defect inside the heart, this hole. And then what this allows us to do is then first deploy the device such that the left disc sits on the left side and then deploy the right disc so the right disc sits on the right side. What this then allows us to do is to deploy a device that's going to close this hole inside the heart that really previously required open heart surgery to do. We look at the device, make sure it's in good position, and once it's in good position, then we can go ahead and release it. And the way it's released is via screw mechanism just like this. And now you can see the device is in excellent stable position inside the defect of the heart, occluding the defect of the heart. Once we're done, we can remove the catheter from the heart outside of the body. And then oftentimes we'll put a little stitch in the small incision that we've made in the vein in the leg. And we're done with the procedure. In this typical situation, what we'd normally do is we would then wake up the patient have them go to a hospital bed, observe them overnight, repeat the chest x-ray and the echocardiogram to make sure the device still looks good the next day, and then send them home the next day. As you can imagine, that's a huge and revolutionary change from what used to happen where all of these patients required open heart surgery and would typically have to stay in the hospital for about a week after the surgery in order for this to be done. That said, it's not a perfect solution. We can't do this in every single patient, and some patients still need open heart surgery, but for many patients now, this is a fantastic solution. So if we go back to our table here to look at the different types of devices, you can kind of see how we can actually start to branch out and cover other types of holes. So for example, in this situation, we were looking at an atrial septal defect. And here in the model, what you see is the right atrium and the left atrium. And there was a hole between the two chambers connecting within the wall of the chamber. So in other words, a defect in the atrial septum or an atrial septal defect. Here, down here, what you can see is these are the model's ventricles, so the left and the right ventricles. Here you can actually see holes that have been created within the ventricular septum or ventricular septal defects to give us a model. And so for because the ventricular septum is thicker, the, uh, the device to close the ventricular septal defect is broader and wider and would sit just in here just like the way this device does. There are other devices for other types of congenital heart defects like this one which is for the patent ductus arteriosus. So these devices have been developed now specifically shaped for specific applications. However, over time device developers have developed additional modifications to this type of device to be used in other types of patients. So for example, some of the patients that we have who have a patent ductus arteriosus are actually much smaller. So for example, premature neonates often have a patent ductus arteriosus, which can be very problematic for them. And so to treat those patients without the use of open heart surgery requires a much finer and much smaller device such as this one. As you can see here, this is a much softer new device um, compared to this original device that's a little stiffer and a little larger. And this device now is perfectly suited for these premature uh, neonatal patent ductus arteriosus closure. And so again, this has been a pretty revolutionary change where many of these patients would have to go through some sort of open surgical repair, which can be fraught with some challenges post-operatively. Whereas in this scenario with a transcatheter closure, that can really change the game and make their recovery a little bit simpler and, um, and less challenging.
Next one I'm going to show you. In order to visualize these procedures while we're doing them, we use a combination of something called fluoroscopy, which is video x-ray. At the same time, however, in order to really see the heart structures and the devices specifically, we want to use echocardiography. And so specifically what we use is this, what's called ICE, which stands for intracardiac echocardiography. And so this small catheter, as you can see, um, is designed to go within the vein and sit inside the heart because it has at its tip an ultrasound. And what that allows us to do is to put the catheter inside the heart and look very specifically at the heart, the defect, and the device itself, and we can visualize all of this happening. In addition, just like routine echocardiography, what it does is it actually allows us to see flow inside the heart and ensure that when we've placed this device, there's no further flow that we can see by echocardiography. And just like with our device deployment, this catheter also is inserted via a small incision in the femoral vein and then advanced up inside the heart and allows us to have very high resolution pictures of the entire procedure from within the heart itself. These catheters have become very advanced in the sense that you can actually direct the catheter and change the position of the catheter. So for example, you can see here that I can bend the catheter one direction or the other and allows me to really turn the catheter and bend it um, in an anterior posterior and left right configuration. And with this, I can actually see most structures of the heart with very high resolution and very high accuracy. So finally, I just want to summarize by saying that cardiac occlusion devices have taken us to a much higher level as far as the minimally invasive types of procedures that we can do. With all the different shapes and sizes and configurations of these devices, we can actually now close many congenital heart defects that we encounter with a transcatheter method instead of requiring open heart surgery. In addition, on a daily basis, interventional cardiologists all over the world are finding new ways to use these devices in other situations that would otherwise require open heart surgery. What that means is that many times these devices are used to close fistulas, used to close abnormal connections that have developed inside congenital heart patients, used to close openings around valves that are also known as paravalvular leaks, used to close disruptions in the heart tissue that have occurred as a result of a heart attack, used to close leaks that have occurred around previous patches that were done surgically, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we hope is that as these devices continue to improve and as engineers continue to improve the way these devices work and make new devices, that this will continue to extend the ability for us to treat patients and continue optimizing their quality of life without the need for open heart surgery. Thank you for joining us for this virtual hands-on session on cardiac occlusion devices. And as always, if you're interested in finding out more, please check out our adjoining video where you can learn more details about these amazing devices. So we'll come back to our panel at this point in time. Does anybody have any specific questions about what we just talked about in terms of cardiac occlusion devices? And certainly, we have additional other uh, videos that we can talk about as well. So uh, I have a I have a question. Sure. I have a question. What's a what's the risk of the uh, occlusion devices, um, especially in the uh, the ASD and VSD placement, to uh, um, rubbing on other structures inside the heart once they're placed? Yeah, that's very much the sort of um, million dollar question, if you will. So I think probably the one where we're most concerned is the atrial septal defect closure. Um, and that is, um, it's still a very, very low um, uh, erosion risk. We think it's less than 0.1% um, or thereabouts. One of the real challenges that we have with that is, um, and this is unfortunately the way it's turned out in our uh, field, is that we never really got a handle for how many devices are actually implanted in the atrial septum. And so what that means is we know how many erosions have been reported, 
but what we don't know is how many devices have been implanted. So we don't know what the precise percentage is. And so people report anywhere from 0.04% to 0.2% as far as that erosion risk rate. And so it's a little bit of a challenge because that's a nearly tenfold difference between the two reported risks. So I think the message to all of us is going forward that we have to have a much better way of recording and, and, and keeping a registry of these implantations. Um, and as you know, now there's the, um, the National Cardiovascular Device Registry um, for congenital heart devices where that's actually being done now. So, we, um, so thankfully, we're actually nationally registering those device implants and so we can get a better handle of that answer. But to get back to your question, yeah, it's a very low risk rate. It's terrifying when it happens. I think maybe Dr. McGillivray can comment on what it looks like when it happens. Yeah. So, so I was going to ask you, Huey, so uh, I think that although that's the cited risk, I think that the majority of patients are at even a lower risk and that, that there are some people who we think may be at higher risk. The bigger the defect, the bigger the device, per perhaps the larger the risk. And, and that's where the clinician judgment comes in to whether, whether that would be, whether it's, it's advisable to proceed with a bigger device or to, to try other options. I, I think that's an excellent point. Um, I think, there, and of course, um, if, if we have time later, there's a second um, video and a second device that is now uh, on the market that's actually less likely to cause an erosion um, and is a little bit softer um, that can also be used for the atrial septum. So now we have options. That's the really great news. Um, so, um, but of course, obviously, as with everything that we do in medicine, there's probably going to be risk from that standpoint once we have a little bit more data. So just as with cardiac surgery or with catheterization, there are going to be risks with these procedures. From a VSD or ventricular septal defect standpoint, one of the great concerns that we always have, and this is unfortunately probably the more common VSD, is that um, we don't have a device that works well for the membranous VSD position. Um, and the reason for that is the first generation that came out caused heart block in our kids. And so after that ended up happening, there was no real further development, at least in the United States. Um, now in Europe and the rest of the world, they actually have available these devices now. Um, and they are implanting them with some degree of frequency, especially in Asia, because it's extremely common in Asia. Um, and I think that they're coming out with a low risk of heart block. So, it, there's some hope that perhaps we'll get it back again in the United States, but currently we don't have a way of treating the most common VSDs in the United States. Finally, the muscular VSD device, which you saw in, in the video, that's been great. Unfortunately, um, we don't have that many of those types of VSDs um, that present, and not all of them get sent for transcatheter closure. Um, so that's still kind of a smaller minority of patients that get treated with that device. Great questions. I have a question. Sure. Hi. So my daughter just got one of these occluders um, in May, and we were told that the device doesn't cause any issues with MRIs or anything like that. So the materials that these things are being made out of, they're pretty safe across the board with things like that. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, they're absolutely uh, MRI safe. Um, typically, they don't really contain any iron or what we call ferromagnetic metals. Um, so it shouldn't vibrate or heat up. Now, probably it does heat up a little bit, just like many things do in the MRI scanner, but not enough to actually cause any kind of damage. Um, one thing that is true, though, is that just because it's MRI safe doesn't mean that it's not creates some sort of distortion on the picture. So on the MRI image. So that is a typical problem. It will cause some distortion. You will lose the ability to image that specific area precisely with some of these devices. Some of them come out better. Some of them come out worse. Good to know. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and go on to the next section. During this segment, I'm going to show you two additional devices for cardiac occlusion, and these are for, again, atrial septal defects and patent frame and a valet. Specifically, what you'll see here is we have devices that are consisting of a nitinol wire core. Again, this is that nickel titanium alloy that creates a wire that has shape memory. That means that when it comes to body temperature, it goes back to this original shape. You can see here there's a larger device um, that also has that nickel titanium wire, nitinol wire core. And then on the outside, it has this EPTFE fabric covering. 
And what that allows then for the device to do is once it's put into the defect, it closes the defect immediately and stops the flow from going through the defect. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you how the device actually looks and show you the two different segments of the device. So as with many of our devices, it has both a left side and a right side. And both these devices come with the same type of style. So this first half of the device is the left side of the device here. And then this is the right side of the device. And I'll show you exactly what that looks like in just a minute when we actually put it into the body. And the way this works then is the left disc sits on the left side of the heart and the right disc sits on the right side of the heart. And what that then does is it allows us to close the atrial septal defect or patent foramen valley by putting this device into position. So let me show you what that actually looks like now. So this is how we actually prepare the device. So using this slider on the back of the handle, we'll be able to bring the device into the delivery system. And again, because it's made out of this nickel titanium alloy, night and all, what it allows us to do is when the device is cold and in cold water is very malleable and can be constrained down to this small catheter here, which we can insert from a small incision in the femoral vein. Then once we have it inside the catheter, we can advance it from the femoral vein into the heart and across the heart defect. And when we get ready to deploy the device, this is what it looks like. So again, I'm going to move the slider along the handle. And what this allows us to do is once we're on the left side of the heart across the defect, we will advance the left disc into position. And this is the left disc as it comes out. And it will start to form just like this. So once we have the left disc out, then we can bring it right up against the defect itself. And then we can start to form the right disc. And that's what this is here. You can see the right disc forming just like that. And once we've done this, we can re-evaluate the device inside the heart using our intracardic echo and under video x-ray, ensure that we like the way it looks and ensure that there's no further flow going across it. And so what we're going to do is we're gonna go ahead and lock it and show you what that looks like. I'm going to slide this lever across the handle and you'll see here what happens when we go ahead and lock the device. So I've just locked the device, okay? And the reason why that becomes important is because now you can see it's very flexible against the delivery system. And the reason for that is because it's just slightly attached. It's attached by a very small suture, which allows us to really assess how the heart tissue is going to look once we release the device without actually releasing the device. So that's very important because as you can imagine, the way it is right here before we've actually locked the device is actually still fairly stiff and this can actually bend the heart tissue and make it so it's hard for us to tell whether or not the heart tissue is going to accept the device the way it is or whether or not there may be other issues. Here, once we've locked the device, So that was the video that we were talking about. That's the other device, the basically second and even third generation for atrial septal defect devices. Um, and that one, though it doesn't have an erosion risk um, uh, um, and is a little bit softer, um, of course, I think as with all things, we need to be um, cognizant that of course there will be other risks um, coming down the line as with any kind of invasive procedure. And I want to give a quick shout out to our chief cardiology fellow who is tweeting alongside us. He actually looked up the answer for our leadless pacemaker, the Micra, um, which has 8 to 13 years reported lifespan. So really great um, from that standpoint. Um, and it, um, if you follow him, um, he can, uh, he's keeping us abreast on a lot of the really important details. His ha Twitter handle is at ice. TMD. Uh, mm -hmm. So follow him now for a lot of the details that I can't necessarily answer for you. So let's move on to our next topic. Um, let's go ahead and go to our next video. Hi, I'm Huey Lin. Welcome to our virtual hands-on session on cardiac occlusion devices. During this session, we're going to talk about a small plug that goes into vessels anywhere size from one and a half millimeters to nine millimeters. This consists of, like many of our other devices, a nitinol or nickel titanium shape memory metal core covered with PTFE fabric. So one of the really huge advantages of this is that it's very small and can be placed through a very slender tube. As you can see here, this is how small the tube can be when we collapse the device because of the nickel titanium alloy.
but then once it reaches the body temperature, it jumps back to its original shape and creates the stability that it needs to occlude the vessel or the part of the heart that is required. So I'm going to show you now how it works. It's attached to a very long cable that allows us to deploy it from outside the body. And what we do is we push it out of the catheter, in this particular situation, a microcatheter, and it comes out just like this. So as you can see, the front half of the device is the bare nickel titanium alloy cage. And then the back part of the device is covered with the PTFE fabric. And that allows us to occlude the part of the heart or the part of the vessel that needs to be completely occluded. Then when we're ready to release the device, what we do is we screw the cable backwards in a counterclockwise fashion, and that releases the device from the cable. And then the device is then stable within the heart or the vessel that we're attempting to occlude. Again, as with all of our sections, if you want to learn more about this or any of the other devices we've talked about, please see the adjoining video. Thanks for joining us. Hello, my name is Huey Lin. Welcome to the virtual hands-on session on embolization. During this section, we're gonna actually focus on vascular coils. And the reason why we use vascular coils is to get rid of unwanted vascular connections. So for example, many of our patients will develop over the course of their lifetime, unwanted vascular communications. These are unnecessary and unwanted vessels that can potentially create problems for our patients. So in some situations, these can cause our patients to have right to left shunting, which causes them to have cyanosis or have blue tinged skin as a result of low oxygen levels. In some of our patients, these can cause what are called arterial pulmonary collaterals, which are abnormal vessels that go from the systemic arteries to the pulmonary arteries. And what this can cause is either an overload through left to right shunting or potentially even bleeding in the form of hemoptysis or coughing up of blood. And so in these situations, we want to use a soft and easy to deploy piece of device that can close off the vessel without creating too much trauma around the vessel. In other scenarios, we can potentially e even use these for other unwanted communications such as coronary artery fistulas or even a patent ductus arteriosus when small enough. So the first thing that we're going to do is I'm going to actually show you what the coil looks like outside of the body. So what we can see here is that it's very soft it's very malleable, but it's also very narrow in diameter. And what this allows us to do is it allows us very atraumatically to put it into very small vessels and to form a mass. So I'm going to show you what it looks like like this. So this is when it's not compressed. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what it looks like when we actually deploy it into this vessel. So what we have here is a mock-up of a vessel. And what I'm going to have you do is look very carefully here where you already have a catheter and the coil getting ready to be implanted. And so as we push the coil into position, you'll see why we call it a coil. Because what it does is it starts to form these coil loops. And what these coil loops allow us to do is to really create a nice compact mass of very soft metal inside that vessel. And then once we've done this, you can see it's forming a very nice tight mass of coils here. And once it's in position, what we can do is when we're doing the catheterization, we'll take a picture by injecting dye into the artery and see if it stopped the flow there. If it stopped the flow, then what we can do is we can release the coil, take the system out, and then we're done with the procedure. If it hasn't stopped the flow, what we can do is we can deploy this coil, which means to release the coil in its current position, and then put another coil right behind it until it completely closes off the blood flow. But you can see with this nice tight mass of um, very soft metal wire, what it does is it can potentially create an occlusion right at that site, a very precise occlusion um, based upon this coil. And so what this can allow us to do is to close off each of these individual vessels atraumatically and stop the blood flow to those vessels. This is a very important part of our armamentarium of devices to close off these type of vessels. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in the future. If you're interested in hearing more about this, please see our adjoining video where we'll talk about a little bit more of the details about how these coils work and what are the different types of coils that we can use. Well, and uh, Dr. Isaac T has come back with us for another piece of information that's very useful. There's actually an AV synchronization way, uh, method for the leadless pacemaker. So um, 
another really great advancement um, that's really exciting in our field. Um, anyway, so there's a question from the audience. Um, what are your thoughts in implanting these devices in patients with documented nickel allergies? So that's interesting. I think the, the typical answer that most of us give is that we probably wouldn't implant one of these devices because it's almost impossible to get around um, using some sort of nickel um, and exposing the patient to some sort of nickel. So they have a severe allergy. It's kind of typically something we try to avoid. Now that said, in our an anecdotal experience, I think we have had patients who have had nickel allergies and you know, a, a topical nickel allergy is probably different from having a reaction from within your heart. But that said, is that something that you really want to um, take a chance with? Um, I think that it's still controversial, and I think it's an important area that needs further research. So um, I think um, the, the field of uh, collateral embolization is always a very, very hot topic in our, um, in our area um, and very, very important. Um, any thoughts or concerns from that standpoint or questions? I actually have a question. Is there a point in time where, let's say, like a venous collateral, it becomes contraindicated, it's too large, or anything like that to use this device with? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I think, you know, for us, <laughs> most of the time, size is not really an issue. We just put another device in, uh, put a different size device in. Um, and I think really it becomes a question of, of shape um, and what's sort of the best device to put into it to, to optimize the likelihood of closing it. Um, but I do think that there are certainly very important um, questions around that, and that is, is it safe to actually close the venous collateral in that particular patient? Um, so specifically, um, what we're talking about is a lot of our patients have the development of collaterals, in other words, abnormal blood vessels that form from the systemic veins, so for example, the superior vena cava or the inferior vena cava and its branches, and go back to the um, common atrium or the pulmonary veins. And so what that causes is that the blue blood then shunts into the red blood side and causes the patient to be potentially cyanotic in nature. The problem is why do these actually form? And that's the real meat of the question. So a lot of times that's because the Fontan pressures are elevated, for example, or the systemic venous pressures are elevated and the body's trying to find a way to unload that pressure. And it does that by creating the, those collaterals and allows then for that blood flow to go from the systemic venous circulation to the pulmonary venous circulation. So sometimes we can palliate the patient by closing these collaterals, whether it's by coils or microvascular plugs or by these other um, uh, nickel titanium alloy um, occlusion devices. Um, the real question is if the body has formed those collaterals, is it because it needs those collaterals and is it safe for us to actually close those collaterals? And sometimes we can actually do a test occlusion. We can actually put in the device temporarily and reassess the patient, say after five minutes of occlusion, and see whether or not that actually is safe. The real question is, is that really relevant? So if it's safe for five minutes under anesthesia, is that relevant to when the kid or the adult starts walking around or starts doing exercise? And I think that that is one of those sort of multi-million dollar questions that we don't really have an answer for. Um, and I think a lot of times really relies, unfortunately, on the judgment of the physician and shared decision making. And, and an important point for, for patients and families is even though you successfully occlude a collateral, doesn't prevent another one from forming or one from coming back. And so it's a, it can sometimes be an iterative process. That, that's exactly right. Yeah, I, I think unfortunately we often tell people that, you know, this is not a one-time thing. Unfortunately, it, there's a good chance that we're going to have to come back and do this again at some other point in time. Symptomatic treatment, not treating right. the issue. That's right. So th th that's why you may have heard me use the word palliation. Um, I think that that's probably the best way to think of it. Well, then adding to that, are you, are you treating the collaterals while you're also treating some other underlying uh, cause that is contributing to the formation of the collaterals? That's a great question. And it actually comes to one of the questions we didn't get a chance to answer earlier today. And that is, one of the other um, audience members asked the question, when do you use pulmonary vasodilator medications in a Fontan patient? And again, I think unfortunately, this is something that we still have very limited data for, especially when we're talking about, can you actually palliate a patient with pulmonary vasodilators to reduce their formation of you know, venous collaterals. I think in theory, th this, it makes sense. Um, I think, do we have data for it? I'm not really sure that we're there yet. Um, I think, um, unfortunately, what that means then is we're sort of left to a, um, a, an N of one type of 
situation for most situations. So for example, I, I definitely know in our practice here, we have a couple patients who have benefited from pulmonary vasodilators, single ventricle patients who have these venovenous collaterals. And we've definitely seen their saturations go up um, when, uh, when we put them on pulmonary vasodilators, suggesting that um, we've unloaded their Fontan pressure by opening up the pulmonary, vas uh, um, pulmonary um, vasculature. Is that really happening in real life? We're not sure, but their saturations are improving, their exercise tolerance improves, and their quality of life improves. So, um, so I, I think hopefully that sort of answers your question, Joe. I think, again, um, I like to think of myself as a very humble adult congenital heart physician. And I think that what I mean by that is I have very limited understanding for sure of what's going on. I think we, we see anecdotal evidence and we hope that um, when the patient feels better and feels palliated that that's an answer in the right direction. But I think the science and the data is still uh, out there. Sure. You know, one other thing I noticed is the, uh, the size of the uh, catheters that you're using in a lot of these uh, procedures are quite small. And for a lot of adults, I know um, we have vascular access issues, even though we've, maybe we only had a few procedures when we were kids because, you know, the, uh, the procedures we had, the catheters they were using were huge. What, what's in your toolbox to uh, get access to? To those of us that have vascular access issues. Wow, that's a very <laughs> timely topic because we, we, just, we, we were talking about vascular access issues not more than an hour and a half ago on one of our patients um, that Dr. McGill Hervé and Dr. Duarte and I share. Um, so today I think we're much more careful um, about how we get vascular access. I think it's become a very dominant topic in the interventional cardiology field for adult and acquired heart disease. Um, so vascular access complications are now reported, um, and I think it's a very important part of our quality measurements. So, um, so typically for us, especially in the adult congenital heart world, we're very careful to use micropuncture. So typically that's a 20 or 21 gauge needle as opposed to the very large 18 gauge needle that used to be used in adults. Um, we typically use ultrasound because it's better to know whether or not there's a vascular access problem up front. So for example, as many of you probably know, um, our patients, when they reach adulthood, they may be missing a femoral vein. They may be missing a femoral artery. They may be missing a radial artery. Um, we typically use radial access whenever feasible. We typically use IJ access, uh, sorry, internal jugular venous access whenever feasible. And the reasons for that are that oftentimes when we work from the groin, um, our vascular access complications are higher. So bleeding complications are higher. Compromise of the vasculature is higher. Um, so we typically do try to, if we can't avoid it, we, um, we will use the groin, we will use mitigation strategies. But um, when we can, we do avoid trying to use the groin whenever feasible. Now, obviously the problem is a lot of our kids have had, or sorry, a lot of our patients have had um, radial access done as a child, and then they no longer have radial access available as adults. Yeah, and, and um, for the providers that the, the the physicians and nurses and advanced practice providers that are watching still, if you don't need a line, get it out. Yes, uh, you know, absolutely. The, the idea of, well, we can keep the central line in while you're here. And, I mean, I think that certainly for, for patients with, with uh, uh, any kind of congenital heart disease, the sooner and the faster you get it out, the better you, you have uh, in terms of the plan for the future. Absolutely. Yeah, especially for when, when possible. Right. Especially for our single ventricle patients who have a glen and fontan. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, um, there are these very heroic methods of getting access, um, like uh, transhepatic access, um, when we really have no more venous access mm -hmm. sites. Um, so obviously, we reserve that for urgent situations right. where sort of extenuating circumstances. Great. Thanks. Let's go ahead and go to our next video. Hi, this is Hi. Huey Lin. Welcome to our virtual hands-on session on perforation devices. You might ask yourself, why on earth would I ever want to create a hole? Well, it actually turns out in congenital heart disease, it becomes a very important part of our armamentarium for how we treat patients when we want to try to treat them with endovascular procedures. So let's start off with one of the more common types of ways that we actually create a hole and why we create a hole.
So very commonly, um, our electrophysiology colleagues will need to try to create an ablation, or in other words, treat an arrhythmia in the left side of the heart. Very frequently for me in the congenital heart interventional space, we'll need to fix something in the left side of the heart. Sometimes it's a lot easier to come from the right side of the heart in order to actually fix the problem in the left side of the heart. So let's look at what that actually looks like. So what we're actually looking at here on this diagram is a diagram of the right atrium, abbreviated RA, and the left atrium, abbreviated LA. And what we're going to be doing is because we're working from the leg, um, we're going to come up through the inferior vena cava, abbreviated IVC. So typically what we would use um, if we want to work in the left atrial space is we would use this type of a catheter called a sheath. And this catheter has a very specific angle on it through this stiffer tip that allows us to point right at the atrial septum, which is the wall that separates the right atrium from the left atrium. Then from here, what we used to do is we would use a sharp needle to puncture through, as you see here. However, as you can imagine, in the heart space, that can potentially be uh, somewhat dangerous. And so the technology has now evolved where instead of actually using a sharp needle, we use this blunt so-called needle that actually can be electrically charged and burn a hole very accurately through. And what that means then is we can control exactly how much we actually cross through the tissue so that it gets just right where we want it to be. Once we actually perforate through the atrial septum, then we can actually advance the sheath through the atrial septum and get it into the left atrium. So I'm gonna shift really quickly to another one of my devices and show how that actually works. So once I get into the left atrium, what I wanna do is I wanna go ahead and get the rest of my catheter across so I can actually start doing the work. So say for example, I need to stent some structures in the left atrium. What I wanna do is I wanna go ahead and get my catheter all the way through. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to advance this wire that you see right here into the left atrium, which is gonna make a really nice curve in the left atrium. And the reason why I wanna do this is you can imagine as it hits the wall of the left atrium, it's going to be very soft and atraumatic and allow me to put as much tension here as, as I need to without creating any damage to the left atrium. Then from here, once the wire is in position, I can push the catheter through the hole into the left atrium and then I can actually start working. The other technological advantage that we now see is the following. So once I get my catheter or my sheath through into the left atrium, what I can actually start to do there is the following. This is a specialty sheath that can actually be curved exactly the way I want it to, just like this. So say, for example, I want to work within the valve here, the, um, what's called the mitral valve. I can cross into the mitral valve. Say, for example, I want to get into one of the veins that drains back in the left atrium. This can point me right up to it. Say, for example, I want to get somewhere else um, that I haven't talked about yet. I can use this catheter with the deflectible nature of it to point any direction that I want to. So this is one of the other great technological advancements that, um, that we have now that allows us to be more precise and more um, and safer about how we approach things. One of the other really great technological advancements that we now see is the following. So um, similar again is this sheath where we can put it right up against the atrial septum. But this time, instead of actually having that blunt needle that is electrified, what we have is we have a wire that can be electrified. And what that then allows us to do is actually use the wire that again is blunt, okay? So again, it's not gonna hurt anything once it gets across. It's gonna, electric, it's gonna be electrically charged, perforate through, and then once it perforates through, we can actually advance the wire. And what's remarkable about the way this wire is designed is it forms exactly that coil that we just saw a second ago that can allow atraumatic advancement to everything into the left atrium. So what that means then is we can deliver a very short charge through the wire to perforate through safely exactly how far and exactly how much we want to go. And then once we put the wire across, it forms a nice um, loop like this that atraumatically can be advanced into the left atrium, even touch the wall of the left atrium without causing any damage. And then this will allow us now to go ahead and advance the catheter across and get into the left atrium and do the work that we need to do. So finally, what I wanna talk a little bit about is one of the really amazing technologies that, um, that was developed by one of the senior interventional cardiologists in congenital heart disease, 
called the, uh, the Nikonen wire. And again, um, I don't have a nice diagram to, to describe how this works, but similarly what it is, it's a very soft wire. I'll show you how soft. Um, it's so soft that when I push my hand against it, it just bends. And what this allows us to do is to actually treat newborn uh, infants who have a severe congenital heart lesion um, that doesn't allow blood flow to the lungs. And the way it works is the following. Um, once we get the catheter into the position um, at where the obstruction is, we can electrify the wire again. Again, again, it's very soft. So when we electrify the wire, it allows perforation through the tissue, which is usually very short. Um, it's usually just a couple millimeters in thickness. And once the wire gets across, um, the, the electrical charge is off. Um, we can program exactly how long we want the electrical charge to be. And then the wire is atraumatic at that point in time and can no longer do any further damage or perforate any further. And what that allows us to do is to create a hole that will be life-saving for that infant. Um, and then we can open up that hole to exactly the right size that we want it to after we've put this wire through the hole and gotten our equipment through. So those are just a couple of different examples of how we use perforation to open up um, channels to allow us to work in different chambers of the heart or even open up channels that don't exist in patients with congenital heart disease to allow them to have blood flow that's inadequate before the intervention. As always, if you have interest in learning more about the details of these devices, please see our joining video where you can learn a little bit more about these specific devices and what they can do. Thanks for joining us. All right, well, welcome back. So kind of an interesting area, the idea of making holes in patients. Um, so one of the things I didn't get a chance to talk about during the video is that this is a very effective way for making a hole um, or perforating in a lateral tunnel fontan, so sort of recreating fenestration, or potentially even an extra cardiac fontan um, and reconnecting back to the common atrium. So um, it's nice because it doesn't require using a, um, a sharp tip needle like we traditionally had to do. Are there any questions? No. In that last example of the Nickman wire, what, what was the defect and what vessel were you opening up there? Yeah, so that's, um, that's opening up in pulmonary atresia with a plate-like um, um, valve or uh, absence of valve. Um, so it's a pretty remarkable, mm -hmm. remarkable procedure um, that, you know, typically what we would do is we would use that wire, perforate through that plate-like um, absence of the pulmonary valve, get from the right ventricle outflow tract to the pulmonary artery, and then we can actually stent it. So uh, basically avoids a trip to the operating room um, and really lets these kids grow um, before they can get their definitive repair. So quite, quite remarkable and pretty ingenious device um, that I would say probably really launched um, a lot of really amazing uh, innovations in this sort of creating a whole yeah. perforation type technology. Do you ever feel guilty about making uh, Dr. McGillivray's jobs obsolete? <laughs> Dr. McGillivray's job is not going to be obsolete anytime soon. So we're, we're about to get into um, some videos that Dr. McGillivray and I did together where I just look dumb. So, <laughs> so we'll get to that in a second. But let, let, let's, uh, there's a question from the audience here. So what would be the smallest size patient you can do with intracardiac echo for these occlusion device procedures? And I think that's, um, that's a variable question. A lot of that depends on the, um, the size of the femoral vein of the particular patients. Um, it used to be that you know, we would have sort of an artificial cutoff of you know, three to four years of age. But I think now, since a lot of our kids are getting bigger <laughs> um, at that age, I think um, that that makes it a little bit more feasible. But I think more importantly, the question is, when would you want to do it? I think the problem is once you start reaching um, smaller kids, um, even if they are larger physically, they probably can't um, undergo a procedure with, uh, with procedural sedation alone, and they're gonna need general anesthesia anyway. So it may be more appropriate to do transesophageal echo for those patients mm -hmm. if they're gonna be under general anesthesia anyway, and then you can minimize the amount of vascular access that you need. So to be specific, so if I'm gonna do an ASD closure with intracardiac echo, I have to put in two vascular access sites, which is one additional vascular access site that I would need if we use transesophageal echo in a kid who is under general anesthesia. Now, that said, I haven't done kids since I did my fellowship um, back at, uh, when I finished in 2012, so, um, so, um, so that's my experience. 
my limited experience, and I'm uh, specifically an adult provider at this point. I don't know, Tom, do you have any thoughts from that standpoint? No, I, I think that's a great, explana great explanation. Yeah. So let's go ahead and go to the next video. Hi, I'm Huey Lin. Welcome to our virtual hands-on session on valves. Hi, everybody out there. I'm Tom McGilvery. I'm a cardiac surgeon. And uh, I'm happy to be here with Dr. Lin, and we're going to talk about some of the kind of valve replacement options that are available to our patients. There are a number of different kinds of valves uh, that can, we can use in any of the four valve positions. And, and the valves we're going to focus on today are those for open surgery as opposed to transcatheter uh, surgery. So um, uh, generally speaking, we at least I think about what valve options we can use, valve replacement options, as whether they're mechanical or bioprosthetic. Uh, and there's a whole uh, inventory of different kinds of bioprosthetic valves, different inventory of mechanical heart valves. There's advantages and disadvantages to both. Uh, uh, to, to overly simplify it, um, What's uh, the mechanical valves generally are very durable. That's the benefit. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, sh the, the downside is they do require lifelong anticoagulation. And currently, the only uh, anticoagulation that's available is warfarin, Coumadin, uh, and all of the issues associated with that. On the other side, biologic valves. Uh, they generally don't require lifelong anticoagulation, at least for the valve, uh, and that's good. The downside is, is they can and uh, do degenerate over time, and their durability is not as good as a mechanical valve. In that, uh, there are different um, uh, things that, about specific patients that we use to help make us uh, uh, help the patient and the providers help decide which valve type to use, uh, whether it's mechanical or, or tissue. And so we have, we have sizers, uh, whether they're for the mitral or the uh, tricuspid or the aortic or the pulmonic valve. And it's kind of like going in and buying a pair of shoes. And essentially, they're all graduated uh, in terms of the size uh, from small, medium, to large. And so you would look at the, once the, the aortic valve or mitral valve is prepared after you've either removed the cusps or um, uh, getting ready to put the valve in, you take one of these uh, sizers and make sure that it fits appropriately into the aortic annulus or the mitral annulus. Uh, in, a in addition to just the size, uh, most of the manufacturers have uh, a reconstruction of the profile of the valve. The valve itself is uh, made up of different parts. So when we talk about the actual guts of the valve, if you will, um, that has the leaflets that are inside a cylinder so that the hinges or the, uh, uh, of the leaflets can move freely with uh, an open and close without any kind of resistance or very little resistance. But how it stays in place is through a sewing ring and that all of these valves, uh, all of the sutured valves have this sewing ring and that's a cloth, that's the white part of this valve uh, and it's made of either Dacron or PTFE. There are a number of different fabrics that you can uh, put stitches through. So it's a, a, one part of the stitch would go through the tissue and then up through the sewing ring of the valve. And, um, uh, and then you would tie those sutures down so that they were, to, so the valve would sit and be uh, have no leaks in it. Uh, and then the, the sewing ring component of it is designed so that uh, 
the tissue will actually grow into it. There's ingrowth so that that uh, will over time even make the, the, the valve itself be less likely to have any leaks in between it. So then, uh, and so this is a valve uh, for designed for the aortic or the pulmonic position. Uh, this is a valve that's uh, more designed for the uh, for the mitral or the tricuspid position. You, you could use them in, in either way based on the size, but the sewing rings are a little are a little bit different. This is a a bulkier sewing ring. Uh, if you look at the sizes of the fabric, this for the mitral and the tricuspid, there's more fabric to it, uh, and there's advantages to that for the specifics of the anatomy. So there are different kinds of tissue valves. Um, there are valves that are made out of uh, uh, porcine or pig valve aortic cusps uh, that are sewn into a scaffolding uh, and have a sewing ring similar to this. Uh, and we also have homograft. So what homograft is, uh, it is actually a human valve uh, that uh, is either uh, most commonly from either the uh, the pulmonary valve or the aortic valve uh, from another human being. And so these are actually, rather than harvesting a whole heart for a heart transplant, um, the companies can actually harvest uh, these valves uh, from a person after they have died. And um, they come out of the they're frozen, uh, and, and I, when I say frozen, I mean frozen. They're, the, the preservation of them is such that they're, they're, they go through a rapid cooling process down to below, actually minus 135 degrees. That's pretty frozen. And, um, uh, and, and, and if you don't preserve it the right way with, uh, as we know, as, as you freeze water, the water expands and the cells can get destroyed. So it's placed in a preservation solution so that that doesn't destroy the cells. So as, as sturdy and robust as those mechanical valves look, the, the actual valve tissue itself normally is very thin and supple uh, and, and strong. It's like wet silk. That's actually valve tissue right there. Wow. Uh, that's what a normal valve would look like. You would, if you were sewing this in, you would cut it to fit where you were going to sew it. So to, to reconstruct um, the pulmonary, to replace the pulmonary valve, we'd use, we would use a pulmonary homograph. To replace the aortic valve or aortic root, we'd use an aortic homograph. We didn't used to think that that was important, uh, but we're kind of, and the durability is better if you, if you do that. The, the, advantages, the other advantage is that, that, that oftentimes these are great um, uh, homographs are, uh, I, I find them very helpful if you have bad endocarditis with abscesses. Um, you can debride the heart very aggressively and this, uh, we used to think that these homographs were less resistant to infection than synthetic grafts uh, and synthetic valves. I think the data would, you could argue that both ways. Uh, what I like about it is that when you do a lot of debridement, this tissue will get into the nooks and the crannies of the patient's tissues that are, uh, have been debrided or uh, are compromised and it'll heal in and it, it's much easier to handle. The bleeding is less and the function is better. And then, and then of course the gradient relief, you don't really have any resistance to flow across a normal homograph. So it's, uh, that's a, a great advantage to homographs as well. And something I also noticed here is that you actually have a length of the pulmonary arteries on both sides. So if you have a problem with the pulmonary arteries, can you use that to reconstruct the pulmonary arteries? You can, yeah. Uh, so so uh, oftentimes,
So in the interest of time, we're actually going to move on to the next video that's going to talk about bioprosthetic valves as well, because that's such an important area for our patients. We're going to focus uh, this segment on uh, bioprostheses or biologic prostheses. We, we have a number of different biologic valves that we can use. The, one of the oldest uh, and still in use uh, bioprostheses is a porcine valve. A porcine valve is a valve where the guts of the valve, or the actual functioning component of the valve, is made up of leaflets, cusps of the aortic valve from a pig. Uh, and these aortic valve cusps are individually sewn into a scaffolding or a stent. It's individually sewn by a person at the factory uh, into this three-dimensional stent or scaffolding. And that three-dimensional kind of looks like a crown. That scaffolding is what maintains the geometry and therefore the function of these valve cusps. Uh, around or at the base of that stent uh, is the sewing ring. That's cloth, and different manufacturers have different cloth. Uh, and, and then and that's where the sutures that are placed uh, into the patient's heart, whether it's the aortic valve or the mitral valve, the tricuspid valve, or the pulmonic valve, those sutures go into the annulus and then up through this sewing ring. Uh, inside this cloth, sometimes there's more cloth Sometimes there's some silastic or some other kind of uh, polymer that allows it to be tied very tightly into the annulus and create a watertight or blood tight seal with the patient so to avoid any kind of leaks. Uh, in addition to these porcine valves, uh, there are uh, bovine pericardial valves. Uh, bovine pericardial valves look very similar to porcine valves. Uh, they have the, the scaffolding or the strut uh, or the stent in addition to the sewing ring. But the actual functioning component are valve leaflets or cusps that are made from bovine pericardium. So it's not a cow valve like the porcine valve is pig valve cusps. These are actually from cow pericardium that are cut to a preset size and shape and again individually sewn onto this scaffolding. And there's advantages and disadvantages uh, to bovine pericardium and uh, 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 porcine cusps that uh, essentially we, we, we generally use them for similar indications. The, the benefit of a stented valve is you can take it out of the jar and sew it in. So I'm actually going to turn over the uh, quick question to Dr. McGillivray because we didn't get a chance to talk about the, um, the last valve there, which is the unstented valve. So that's actually taking the aortic root from a pig. Um, and can you just briefly tell us what the difference is and why it's sometimes better in certain types of patients? Yeah, so we, we talked about uh, the other valves, the stented valves, and uh, the benefit of those are you can take them out of the jar and sew them right in and they'll function. But that the stent is, a, is somewhat rigid and so the flow across it, particularly the smaller the size, the more resistance across that uh, more rigid stent, as the, opposed to the stentless valves, they don't have any rigid component. It's just all tissue uh, that is augmented with a little bit of fabric so that even at smaller sizes, the flow through it is much less, there's much less resistance, uh, less of a drop of pressure across it. Uh, but it's a little bit more technically challenging to sew it in uh, because you have to get the geometry exactly right or it will uh, potentially leak. And now Tiffany, I know you had a question while we were offline. I do actually. Okay, so with any kind of tissue product, tissue valve, anything like that, you're constantly in the back of your mind worried about antibody exposure. Is there that same risk with something that is swine or bovine? 
So I, I think the, the answer, the, the traditional answer to that is no, but I think the actual answer to that is we don't know. Uh, because there are patients who get heart surgery that have tissue valves or patches put in uh, that don't get any blood products but do develop a higher level of panel reactive antigen. So, so I, I, I think that it's lower than um, you know, getting a transplant or getting a blood transfusion, but I don't think, I don't think the answer to that is no or, or a categorical no. Any questions from our panel before we move on to transcatheter valve technology? Yeah, what's the, what's the longevity of the homograph versus the bioprosthetic valve? That's a really good question. And uh, I think it depends on the individual patient, it particularly the age of the patient. Uh, for some reason, the uh, biologic valves don't seem to last as long in younger patients as they do in older patients. And there's a number of kind of theories, a number of different theories to try to explain that. But the fact remains is that uh, if, you, if you take a bioprosthetic valve and put it in somebody who's 20, by and large, or on average, it won't last as long as if you put it in somebody who's 60 or 70. Uh, and that the, the, the homograft, uh, there have been a number of different studies to show that the homograft seems to be, in most people, not all people, not even as durable as a, um, as a bioprosthetic valve. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's the, again, in the, in the videos I mentioned a number of times, there are advantages and disadvantages to both. And durability for a bioprosthetic valve is certainly one of the disadvantages to it. Christina, did you have a question? Um, I did, actually. I'm actually going to piggyback from what Joe had said, because I was going to comment on the bioprosthetics maybe not lasting as long in a younger population. Um, and I know with older patients, not congenital heart patients, but in the adult cardiac population, the push to do a mitral repair is usually when you've got really good preserved ejection fraction, you know, just like you can kind of save that. And in the congenital heart population, I can't speak personally from data, but in the congenital heart population, it seems like sometimes it's more of a watchful observation thing where you will let your EF kind of come down a little bit. And I'm just wondering if that's because of any of the longevity issues with the valves. Well, that's a great question and great observation. I, I think, by and large, uh, the conventional wisdom is your own valve and your own valve tissue is probably better than anything we can get off the shelf if we can get it to work effectively. Uh, and we, we have, certainly over the last 20 years, all kinds of techniques that have evolved surgically to allow us to repair valves. Uh, and to take a valve that's either very leaky, and, and, and usually if a valve is regurgitant, there's more degrees of freedom for us to be able to reconstruct it than if a valve is narrow uh, or stenotic, particularly if there's a lot of calcium that develops on that narrow or stenotic valve. But, but, but if we can repair a valve, uh, we will generally do that if we think it can be as durable as a tissue valve. Uh, and and in, the, in the old days, the big issue with a, using a tissue valve was, well, if you put a tissue valve in somebody, particularly if they're young, you're going to essentially commit them to another open heart operation. Now that transcatheter valve techniques have become so effective and so uh, dependable, that's not really the case. So we could put a tissue valve in somebody with the idea that maybe we could use a transcatheter valve option down the road when that tissue valve uh, degenerates. Great, Thank you. great questions. So let's go ahead and move on to transcatheter valve technology because I think that follows on sort of what we just talked about. And then I think there's some interesting questions along those lines about endocarditis. So we'll come to that. So let's go and do transcatheter valves. Hi, I'm Huey Lin. Welcome to our virtual hands-on session on transcatheter valve technology. 
Today we're going to focus specifically on a valve that's designed for patients with congenital heart disease. This is a valve that was designed specifically to be implanted in the pulmonic position, which many of our patients actually require. So for example, some of our patients underwent a childhood heart surgery in which they had their valve opened up, and then they had a second heart surgery in which they had a valve implanted, a prosthetic valve. In adulthood, that valve may have actually failed, either with narrowing or leakage, so either stenosis or regurgitation. In that scenario, instead of taking them back to the operating room for a third open heart surgery, our preference is to try to use a transcatheter technology. And in this particular situation, transcatheter valve has really revolutionized how we take care of those patients who, like I said, would otherwise be facing a third time or fourth time or fifth time to the operating room for heart surgery. So what you can see here in this view is the three leaflets of the valve. You can see they're extremely thin as you would expect in this type of a valve. Now what we'll do is we'll turn it to the side. You can actually look at the stent. A stent is basically a wire mesh tube. And within this, we have an internal jugular vein from a cow, so a bovine jugular vein. It's a platinum iridium stent with gold covering so that it appears very dense when we look at it on x-ray. The other important thing that you'll see here is that they've color coded the suture here. So on this side, there's a green slash bluish suture and on this side, it's a whitish suture. And that allows us to ensure that we put the valve in the right direction, which you can imagine is a critical part of putting the valve in. So now what I'm gonna do is show you how the valve works as far as its competence is concerned. So I have a bucket of water here and I'm gonna fill the valve with water. And so you can see here that this direction, the valve is competent. And you can see how very carefully I'm gonna dip it over so you can actually see leaflets and how they're holding the water inside the valve. So then if I flip it over, the other direction, you can see how the leaflets open. So if I fill it with water this way, the leaflets are open and you can see the cusps very nicely there. So this all creates a very nice situation where it can implant a valve on a stent inside the pulmonic position. So how do we get it into the body? So what we need to do is take this stent and prepare it on this balloon. So typically what we do is we line up the markers. So as you can see here, there's blue, which lines up with blue in this direction, and white, which lines up with white in this direction. And that ensures the valve is oriented correctly when we implant it into the heart. Then what we do is we begin to crimp the valve into position onto this balloon. And what I'm doing is I'm just making it as narrow as possible so that I can implant it correctly and as a smallest profile I can, so that way we can make the smallest incision possible in the vein, in the leg of the patient. So now that it's crimped, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sleeve it so that it can go in as low profile as possible into the patient. And what I'm doing here is to ensure that the sleeve, as it goes over the valve, slides on without impacting the valve. And then typically what we would do is we'd ensure that there are no more bubbles in this catheter. So what you can see here is we have a very nice low profile and smooth catheter to bring the valve in through the small incision in the groin and take it all the way up to the heart valve position. So typically then what we would do is we'd make a small incision in the groin and then we'd actually bring up the valve into the heart and into position. Typically the pulmonic valve sits like this. And so once it's in position, then what we would do is, I'll show it down here, we would unsheath the valve just like the way um, the reverse of what I did earlier when I sheathed the valve. 
So once I've unsheathed the valve in position, I'll check its position on X-ray. So the first thing that I'll do is I'll inflate the inner balloon. So what you can see is that it partially deploys the valve. This allows us to do a double check of the position of the valve. And then we inflate the outer balloon. And you can see that fully deploys the valve. Then when we deflate both balloons, the valve is engaged into the wall of the heart and the previously placed failed valve. And now this allows us to restore competency to that valve. At this point, we can remove the balloon catheter from the body. And you can imagine if this is sitting in the heart at this point in time, that the valve is fully functioning, just like I showed you. So that's transcatheter valve technology. And I think that that goes back to this question from our audience. So in terms of infective endocarditis, which valve has shown less evidence of infection? Well, so I think, um, you know, we can't talk about transcatheter valve, especially in the pulmonic position, without talking about endocarditis. And I think what we've been concerned about is that there is probably a higher rate of endocarditis with certain types of transcatheter valves in the pulmonic position. Although I think that there's also probably some concern that perhaps the pulmonic position is also just um, at risk of endocarditis as well. But I'm going to bring in Dr. McGillivray and see what his thoughts are. I think in any kind of foreign material you put inside somebody, particularly inside their bloodstream, is at risk of getting infected. And so uh, it's critical for people to understand if they have a prosthesis, a valve or a patch or anything, to understand what the specific risk for each of those things are. So if you, if you have an ASD that's closed or, or a, either with surgery or with, uh, with a transcatheter therapy, after you get better from the procedure, the risk of infection is pretty low. If you have a prosthetic valve placed, the risk for, of infection in that valve will always be there. So you have to be very careful if you get an infection someplace. You have to be very careful uh, if you're going to have another procedure that can, that can introduce bacteria into your bloodstream, especially going to the dentist or having dental work. So what I, what I recommend is that if you have some kind of device that's implanted in your heart, speak to your heart doctors about what is my specific risk and what do I need to do to try and minimize that risk moving forward. On the other side of that, if you're going to have a procedure by someone, ask them as well. I have this device inside my heart, do I have risk of infection? And if they don't know, you both should ask somebody who does. Great questions and great answers. So um, the, the next question that we have on here is, would you add antiplatelet therapy post bioprosthesis in the long term? I think that's an important question. I think that that sort of gets back to some concerns about endocarditis and the transcatheter valve. So, um, and again, I, I, I think, um, being humble about what we know and what we don't really know in the field. What I would say is I think for transcatheter valves, especially in the pulmonic position, I think it's absolutely critical that we do at least dual antiplatelet therapy for one month. So that's aspirin and clopidogrel for one month and then, and then aspirin indefinitely thereafter. Um, I know um, with Dr. McGillivray, when we use bovine pericardial valves, we use uh, three months of warfarin um, uh, after the surgical implantation. Um, and then aspirin thereafter. Um, I don't know, Tom, do you have any other thoughts from that standpoint? Yeah, it's funny, you know, the, uh, the, the more we learn, the more we realize that maybe we didn't know as much as we thought we did. Uh, so, so years ago, we used to give everybody that had a bioprosthetic valve warfarin for three months. Uh, and that was to prevent the risk of blood clots forming on the valve and breaking off and embolizing someplace. Uh, and what we learned was that the risk of that was actually pretty low, and that the benefit of being on warfarin was the, the risk was actually even higher than the risk of those blood clots breaking off. So then we went through a period where we didn't do that anymore, uh, and we just gave people uh, aspirin. Uh, 
with the introduction of some of the transcatheter valve therapies uh, in the very uh, focused look on seeing how these valves functioned early on, we saw that some of those patients developed very small clots on the leaflets or the cusps of those valves that increased the gradient across it. And that if you gave blood thinners, that got better. And so the surgical valve people said, aha, that's a problem with the transcatheter valves. And when we looked at the surgical valves, we learned the same problem exists. So now the pendulum has swung back the other way and that in people who don't have increased risk of uh, bleeding, uh, we have a much lower threshold to recommend being on blood thinners with Coumadin, Warfarin for three months. So you've got, to balance, you've got to balance, as always, the benefits and the risks with each decision, including anticoagulation. Yeah, and very, very important questions. And obviously, each one is patient-specific and really requires shared decision-making um, when we approach it. There's another question here that we can answer pretty quickly, and that is, um, what is the experience of the speakers in using mitroclips to treat AV valve regurgitation in the univitricular heart? And so I will personally say I have zero experience with that whatsoever. I think in looking at the literature, there's probably a couple of different case reports that exist out there. Um, I, I don't know what the larger data looks like at this point in time. I think it'd be useful to look at a case series, um, but I'm not personally aware of it. Dr. Lone, I have a quick question if we have time. Mm -hmm. um, as a mom to a single ventricle kiddo who just had a spontane a few weeks ago and a surprise valve replacement, can you kind of tell me on a high level um, what's the best way to externally take care of these valves, especially when we're in the middle of the balancing act of valve regurgitation to, you know, severe and needing a complete replacement, how do you manage that to where it's not a surprise when you do get in to an open heart surgery or you're in a very emergent type of situation? Uh, I'm sorry, can you explain what you mean in terms of external care? Like externally from the outside looking in, like when we're at cardiac checkups or when you're just doing your maintenance, your maintenance care, to be able to take care of these valves and stay on top of them to make sure they're still functioning properly, mm -hmm. what's the best way for parents like myself or even patients to um, just manage the functionality of these valves? So, so some of the early biologic valves had the problem of they could fail in two ways. One is they could get calcified and narrowed and gradually become stenotic. And some of the earlier tissue valves could suddenly tear and become suddenly regurgitant. The, most of the valve manufacturers have, have solved the latter problem. It's very, very unusual for those valves to suddenly fail. But they, the way that they do break down is they gradually get narrower. So I think that um, the recommendation is for anyone that has a bioprosthetic valve, on a regular basis, and that varies, but, but on a regular basis, to have it surveyed by some kind of imaging, whether it's echo or MRI, just to keep an eye on it. And then you can, you could, you can graph out or map out when you think that that valve may potentially cause problems based on that, and be proactive about uh, intervention, at least planning for intervention. Does, does that answer the question? Or? Yes, it does. Thank you. I think it goes back to your previous point too, Dr. McGilvery, of, of being proactive about avoiding infection, protecting that valve and endocarditis yeah. and those types of things. Yeah. And I think there were some earlier question about um, talking about tetralogy fallow patients, and I think that this is really the important part, and that is, you know, tetralogy fallow patients are the ones that we have been concerned about requiring multiple valves over the course of their lifetime. And so that's where I think, honestly, from my standpoint, the transcatheter valve technology has been such a boon for us. Um, so, uh, you know, traditionally the tetralogy fallow patients, at least in the current era, would receive an initial repair in childhood, and that would be, quote unquote, the complete repair. And then the second surgery would require um, a replacing the pulmonic valve completely because of a lifetime of pulmonic regurgitation. And then, of course, the third surgery would be to replace that bioprosthetic valve when it failed. So our hope now is that um, this, after the second heart surgery, that, um, that the third one would be avoided with transcatheter valve technology. 
there is hopefully um, uh, products coming out soon um, that will allow us to avoid the second surgery completely and implant um, a self-expanding valve into the pulmonic valve position without requiring that second heart surgery. So um, we'll be looking forward to that pretty soon. Um, now there's a, another question really quickly about what do we think about the Ross procedure. And I'm not sure we have enough time to answer that because that's, <laughs> there's a lot to it. But I'll, I'll let Dr. McGillard quickly answer that and then we'll move on to um, aortic repair. So what a Ross operation is, is, is uh, refers to replacing the aortic valve with the patient's own pulmonary valve. Uh, you remove the pulmonary valve sewed in the aortic position and then replace the uh, pulmonary valve with usually a homograph. And the theoretical advantage of that is you give the person, the patient, their own valve replacement with the pulmonary valve. And particularly if they're a child, uh, the hope is that that valve will grow and stay, uh, you know, stay alive. Um, and and there, what we've learned is that um, in, in, in some patients, it's a great treatment, but, but not in all patients. And that uh, sometimes it, it's a very fine line between growing and dilating. Uh, and so that uh, in some patients, the, uh, the valve can um, uh, become very leaky. In some patients, they can get uh, uh, aneurysms around it. Uh, some of the critics say you take single valve disease and make two valve disease. Uh, if, if you're a child or if you're a teenager, uh, I think that the upsides of a Ross procedure can certainly outweigh the risks of the Ross procedure. Uh, in, in, uh, in my own personal practice, uh, I, I tend to stay away from the Ross operation, not because it's bad or good. I just, I think there are other alternative treatments that accomplish the same thing. Um, and, and I think that there are, there are uh, a group of uh, heart doctors around the country and around the world who very uh, strongly advocate for the Ross operation and others who, who don't. Yeah, and I think it depends on the scenario, obviously. Yeah, it depends on the scenario. So, great. All right, let's go ahead and move on to aortic repair and replacement. Hi, I'm Huey Lin. Welcome to our virtual hands-on session on vascular grafts. Hi, Huey. Hi, everybody. I'm Tom McGilvery. I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon, and I am happy to talk with you about uh, aortic grafts. Um, it's incredible how much, the again, the field and the technology has changed. We've got, uh, earlier we talked about how to fix blood vessels from the inside out. Uh, and now we're going to talk about how we can replace or reconstruct blood vessels uh, with open surgery and what we use to replace blood vessels with open surgery. This is a, a model, a, a rubber cast, of the aorta, which is the main artery that comes off the heart. The heart would be right here. And this is the part of the aorta, the aortic root that has the aortic valve in it. The coronary arteries come out. Uh, you can't see them on this, but that's where they would come out. The ascending aorta uh, that goes up towards the brain takes a hairpin turn in the aortic arch and branches that come off up to the, uh, the brain, the, the right carotid artery and the right subclavian artery off of the innominate artery. This is the left carotid artery, the left subclavian artery, and off of both subclavian arteries there are uh, branches that go up to the brain in the back, the, the vertebral arteries, and then the descending aorta. This has the aorta set up like it's a two-dimensional structure, but in fact the aorta doesn't sit like this, it sits like that. And so this part of the aorta is in the front. This goes towards the back, and the descending aorta goes along the spine. And so part of the challenge of uh, proximal aortic surgery is being able to get 
two different parts of the aorta and reconstruct it uh, without, uh, uh, you, there's, besides the aorta, you have the heart and the lungs and the airway and the rib cage and everything in the way that makes it hard to get to. And so oftentimes we have to rebuild the aorta uh, in, in, different, in different stages with different components. The, uh, the, the graft that we use as an aortic substitute is, uh, has been for, actually Dr. DeBakey was the first one to develop the Dacron graft. He actually made one with his own sewing machine, kind of interestingly, back in the 19, uh, 1950s, maybe even earlier than that. And, and there have been a number of modifications to that um, cloth. It's a woven cloth. This is Dacron. Um, uh, and that to, added to it to, to keep it from leaking. Uh, there are different ways you can do that. And this is a, a gel impregnated graft. So the amazing thing is you can, uh, you can have blood flow and blood pressure inside this. It will get pressurized and it won't leak, uh, which is very different from the original graphs in Dr. DeBakey's days. But this kind of basic component of a tube graft uh, is basically like a blood vessel. And so if you were going to replace one portion of the aorta that didn't have any branches in it, this would be the graft you'd use. And you could cut out the part of the ascending aorta or part of the descending aorta that didn't have any branches, get a appropriate diameter and appropriate length graft and sew it in, one end and then the other. But there are all kinds of branches, all different sizes uh, of branches and different sizes of the aorta that exist and so it follows that there are different kinds of grafts that uh, now come pre-assembled, pre-configured, pre-constructed of different shapes, sizes, and configurations that make it easier for us in the operating room to rebuild the aorta. Uh, and, and so in addition to open surgery, we oftentimes can do a combination of open surgical and endovascular surgery, a so-called hybrid approach. And so that several of these graphs allow you to do that, that you can sew part of the graft in, and then use uh, a different limb of the graft through which you can place an endovascular delivery system. So it's, it's, it's really kind of fascinating. Uh, so if you, um, as, a, as an example, that this graft is a, would be a graft that we would use to reconstruct the aortic arch, and it uh, looks very much like the aorta that we're trying to replace. Um, each one of these individual arch vessels can be rebuilt with these individual arch grafts. This extra one isn't, uh, it's not if you, you know, buy three, get one free. <laughs> that this, um, this we use to connect to the heart-lung machine that allows us uh, all of these uh, open operations of the arch are done with the use of the heart-lung machine. And this allows us to keep the patient safe to, uh, with the bypass machine uh, while we're rebuilding, uh, rebuilding them. So um, uh, some of these graphs, um, uh, just like uh, down here in the root, this is a this is what we, uh, this is a DePaulis graft or a Valsalva graft. Um, these, this uh, sort of pantaloon shape of the aortic root uh, is recreated in this graft. So if you were to pressurize this graft, you get the same shape. And the valve, uh, you, can, you can save. So in the interest of time, we're actually going to keep moving along. Um, 
there's a lot to learn about um, aortic repair and aortic replacement um, from the great Dr. McGillivray from this standpoint. These videos, as all of our videos, are actually going to be posted on our YouTube page. So if you want to watch them in more detail um, and learn more about the specifications and details about these really interesting and complicated procedures, that's a great way to learn. And so uh, let's just stop for a second to see if the panel has any specific questions about vascular repair. And in the meantime, there's a question from the audience um, about this specifically. Um, so one of our audience members asked a very interesting question about can you use the entire root and valve for coarctation valve and re uh, repair? Sorry, I said bio for valve root and arch for coarctation repair. Um, so I think what they're asking is um, can you replace the root and valve simultaneously and then can you also do a coarctation repair? So uh, yes, you can. Uh, it depends on the size of the patient. Uh, person because sometimes the coarctation can be pretty far away. In, in a child, it's it's easier to do just because the distances are closer. Uh, we very commonly uh, will repair the aortic valve or replace the aortic valve and the root and the ascending aorta and the arch. Uh, and uh, in some patients, you can even get to the beginning part of the descending aorta. Uh, with open surgery. Uh, one of the things I'd mentioned about a hybrid procedure, we can do a frozen elephant trunk where we can put an endovascular stent in the descending aorta during the open surgery and then sew some of those kinds of grafts that we used to the frozen elephant trunk, which is a stent graft inside the aorta uh, and replacing the, the arch with the graft. Yeah, and that's actually a perfect segue to our next um, our next video where we actually just, we're, again, in the interest of time, we're going to just show briefly an endovascular stent graft. Oh, moving fast. No fast <laughs> moving. Okay. So what we're going to be looking at here is an endovascular stent graft. Um, and so what that is, so what that is is that's um, a self-expanding stent that has a fabric covering on it. And so it serves a lot of the function of some of the repair techniques that Dr. McGillivray mentioned. And what we're going to look at here is actually how it gets deployed. Um, so specifically, um, it's a uh, small incision is made in the femoral artery, for example, and um, what you see here is Dr. McGillivray deploying the stent graft. And so there are multiple different types of mechanisms for deploying the stent graft. In this particular situation, you can see it's a screw type mechanism that allows unsheathing of, again, this nickel titanium alloy wire frame, which allows it to sort of spring back to its original shape. And of course, you can see the fabric covering in it that resembles very much the grass that Dr. McGillivray just showed you. This in particular actually has anchors on it um, that allow the stent graft to be fixed in place against the um, vascular wall so that it doesn't embolize from its position. And of course, what's really fantastic about this technology is it now comes in various different shapes and sizes. It can come in two different types of diameters. So the top diameter may be different from the lower diameter. It can be really customized to the patient's specific anatomy um, and really has opened up the doors to a lot of innovation in our field. So for example, we've previously published on treating sinus venosis ASD with an endovascular stent graft. But I think to Dr. McGillivray's point earlier, I think um, what really makes this spectacular is it allows um, surgeons like him to do a hybrid approach where he can approach from an open surgical technique and then come back with an endovascular technique for follow-up repair, um, especially if you're treating both the ascending, so the first part of the aorta, and the descending part of the aorta. So a lot of really complicated things we talked about in this last uh, part of the session. Do you have any questions from the panel specifically about this area? Did those uh, Dacron gap grafts become endothelialized after they've been placed? Great question, Joe. Uh, the answer is that we, they, they, they do not. I mean, right around where the suture line is, the, 
the, the cells from the blood vessels will grow in a few millimeters, but not along the main body of the graft. Uh, and although that may sound concerning, it doesn't seem to be a problem. It, you do get some lining, but we call it a pseudointima because under the microscope, it looks different from that of a regular blood vessel. It doesn't seem to be a problem with the bigger grafts. If you're using those grafts to replace the aorta or a big artery like the femoral artery in the, in the groin, uh, the, the artificial grafts become more problematic when you get to the smaller arteries, like the coronary arteries, uh, or some of the arteries uh, that go up into the brain. And uh, the stent gra the, the, the stents that Dr. Lin uses on a daily basis uh, have a much better profile with that. Gotcha. Thank you. And that's actually, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, was saying, I actually have a question. Yeah. Um, especially when it comes to those with congenital heart defects and getting ready for transplant. Um, that's something, you know, with arteries and connection, they have a very hard time with. So how do these two products help with that? That's a great question. <laughs> so I'm going to turn that over to Dr. McGillary. That's often a concern that I have when we have mismatch and things yeah. like that. So, so one of the, uh, as we talked about, I think, in the earlier segment about transplantation, one of the challenges with heart transplantation for congenital heart disease is um, you, you, you take a heart from somebody who doesn't have congenital heart disease and you put it into somebody who does have congenital heart disease. So, so in addition to doing the transplant, uh, you, you want to have that transplant done by somebody who's familiar with congenital heart disease to make some of the connections that may not exist in the donor heart. And so that's a big part of congenital heart transplant uh, is rebuilding and making the appropriate connections from the donor heart to the person who's getting the heart. And so is it possible, to Tiffany's point, if somebody has actually had extensive aortic arch replacement to actually hook in a donor heart into that and sure. have enough material to make that work? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it, it's, it, it requires uh, planning and you need to understand what the underlying anatomy uh, was, is, and will be in order to make uh, the appropriate connections. Yeah. And I think, you know, that actually... Sorry, was there a question? So I was, was going to say, do you use, do you ever use those off-the-shelf graphs to accomplish that connection? So, sometimes, Joe. Sometimes, what we'll do is, uh, uh, when one of my colleagues goes to uh, uh, to bring the heart back, uh, we'll oftentimes bring, uh, if, if we'll ask them to bring back more of the aortic arch, so the descending aorta. Uh, that we'll be able to use to reconstruct some of the vessels or, or more of the pulmonary uh, artery or pulmonary veins in order to be able to use that tissue itself to make those reconstructions. And, and if not, if that's not possible, we can use some of these graphs uh, in order to do that. And, and I think, so, so what I was actually going to say to lead on to that, um, so in sp some certain types of lesions like hypoplastic left heart that we know are potentially associated with aortic issues and aortic diseases and potentially even aortopathies, um, unfortunately what that then means is just because you replace the heart doesn't mean you've gotten rid of the disease. So that's something that we are trying to sort of teach our adult transplant patients who came from congenital heart background is that unfortunately we continue needing to monitor them. We need to monitor her if they did have an interrupted aortic arch. We need to monitor them for aortopathies and you know when they come in for their caths, for their annual biopsies and coronary angiographies that sometimes we should actually look for those issues and determine whether or not there's problems with their interrupted aortic arch. So, so um, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, you're still, um, you're still a part of our team and we still love you and we still want to take care of you even after your transplant. Um, so we have one quick question, then we'll move on to our um, final video. So what is your experience about ascending to descending repair graft in terms of operative risk and long-term outcome? So uh, I think referring to what we talked about with coart, I, mean, I think yeah. that uh, there's a long experience with ascending to de 
sending bypass grafts. And it, it's, a, it's a terrific operation. Um, I think that we don't use it as much as we used to, just because with endografts and some of the other open techniques, we, we, we don't need to. Uh, but, but in those patients who have had it, 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 it's a great operation and it works very well for, for a very long period of time. All right, great. Let's go ahead and move on to our final video. They may actually need surgery um, because it may not get large enough. Um, but I do think it's something that many of the pediatric interventional community are actually thinking about yeah. because it's such a great option when it's such a low profile. So let's go ahead and deflate that, and then we can see what the, uh, what the stent looks like. So this is what you do in actual, as we say in fancy doctor talk, in vivo, right? Yeah, that's right. Deflate it, and the stent would stay up. That's right. And then so you would... now you can see what the stent looks like. So it looks very much like the stent grafts, a smaller version of the stent grafts that we saw in the previous segment. And what's really nice about this is you can see that each of these is a separate stent ring. So it has a little bit of flexibility to it. Um, so it allows us to actually put it in um, at least somewhat tortuous vessels or cur um, vessels that have a curve in it. So what, what kind of lesion would you use this particular covered stent? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, as we talked about, in some rare situations, it may be very useful for our coarctation, yeah. okay? Um, because I think it's a great low profile uh, stent. Um, it can be taken up to about 16 millimeters, which is almost but not quite adult size, unless you're a small adult yeah. or an adult with small vessels. Um, the places that we have found it very useful are in pulmonary arteries that are nearly atretic. Yeah. Um, because again, um, it has really precise deployment. And again, it's covered, as you can see here with this fabric. So any kind of small tears or micro tears in the vessel are going to be covered by the fabric mm -hmm. um, and protected from creating a catastrophic bleeding event. And then of course, the main uh, utility of this, what it's designed for is in the arteries in the leg, yeah. so the femoral arteries, the um, pelvic arteries, et cetera. Mm. Great, so and again, in the interest of time, we cut quite a bit of that video so we can get right to the meat of the matter, which was um, what the stent looked like. So what we wanted to show there was what the stents look like that we can use these days and sort of the um, technological advancement. So what that is is a miniature version of the stent crafts that we showed you earlier, which are these very large 25 to 30 millimeter, 35 millimeter stent crafts. That one there can get down to about six to eight millimeters um, and really can potentially even be uh, deployed within children and then expanded to a nearly adult size depending on where we're putting it. And as you can see there, instead of just being a bare metal stent, which is usually what we use, it has this fabric covering that can make it a little bit safer. So. Um, and, and protect against tears or potentially even exclude aneurysms if the case may be. So really kind of a neat um, innovation in our field. I'd say that uh, you know, what this last uh, hour or so has done is uh, hopefully given everybody a view into our ever-expanding toolbox. We have a number of different ways now that we can approach specific problems for specific patients. And in one way isn't going to be the right way for every patient. Uh, and you know, we, can, we can tailor make uh, the right therapy for each individual patient more and more now with the different techniques that we have. So any final comments or questions from our panel? I, this is always my favorite part of this conference. I appreciate you guys uh, opening up behind the scenes for the patients and the families and stuff. I know they, that's always the, the show favorite. You know, this year being virtual is a little different environment, but it's, uh, you know, it's always, uh, it's always appreciated to see what you guys do when we're usually uh, knocked out or sitting in the waiting room waiting on the, you know, pins and needles. So thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting us in. Well, thanks for being here, and thank you to our audience that's online. We still have actually a, a huge number of questions that we're not going to get a chance to get to. 
Um, I, I would love to invite all of you to um, send your questions in to us as well as our panel here. Um, who are almost all available on social media and almost all, I believe all of you are interested in helping to answer some of these questions as well and can help to guide our, not only our patients but also our providers. And again, as I mentioned at the very beginning of our session today, um, this is really about building a community together because at the end of the day, doctors like Dr. McGillivray and myself and Dr. Duarte, we can't do it without all of you, including the folks that are on our panel, which also include moms and dads, um, most importantly. Um, it really requires building a community and really getting that community to come together to help to take care of these patients. And we hope that during this education session today that we've built up a lot of education as well as awareness and that you will go out and become our ambassadors and help to take care of our congenital heart patients as well. So I want to thank our panel, um, and I want to thank Dr. McGillivray, and I want to definitely thank our um, video production team who has been working hard, um, really, really hard. I think you will never know how much work it takes to convert a conference that's normally in person into 100% virtual, which is what we've done in over the, le the last six months. Um, they've been working very, very hard a day and night to get this here. Just so, like, the, uh, I was going to say, just like the Wizard of Oz, the men and women behind the curtain are the ones that have made it all happen. And as we've been telling you, um, everything that we make is uh, recorded and is available on our YouTube playlist. So if you want to go back and watch any parts of this again and get some more details out of it, as well as some of the videos that we weren't able to show in entirety, as well as some of the very detailed videos that some of our vendors have created that shows the specifications and the details that we didn't get a chance to talk about, they're all on our YouTube playlist. And, um, and you're welcome to check them out at any time and send us questions as you watch them. So I want to thank you all for joining us for another great Adult Congenital Heart Symposium for 2020. You guys have been a fantastic audience, and we look forward to seeing you again next year.